टाइम मे आई प्लीज रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर रमन सरदाना सर सर यू हैव सर यू हैव कॉन्सेप्चुअलाइज दिस वेरी यूनिक थीम ऑफ ओ टी टी अदर देन दैट सेप्सिस विच एक्चुअली गॉट ऑल ऑफ अस थिंकिंग आउट ऑफ द बॉक्स Uh, sir, request you to kindly welcome our August gathering and introduce the academic session, please. Doctor T S Jain, please, sir. Sir, thank you, Doctor Raman Sadana. I I must appreciate uh, the unique initiative because for ages we have been talking about uh, you know the bacterial infections, uh, the rational use of antibiotics in uh, uh, the bacterial infections, the antimicrobial resistance and all. i mean not that much of uh, stress has been uh, uh, paid on uh, the uh, parasitic viral i mean though we have been talking about fungal but to less extent compared to uh, the uh, bacterial infections and all so uh, i i would uh, definitely sort of uh, congratulate the organizers for uh, organizing such a unique uh, uh, meeting today and uh, i would uh, request you to continue and thanks uh, for making me as a part of uh, the meeting uh, i'm i'm uh, i'm honored uh, for that so uh, without uh, standing between the audience and uh, this thing i would uh, request you to please continue with this thing and uh, uh, i'm sure we all are going to benefit tremendously thank you thank you sir uh, everything happens with the pleasure of the president so <laughs> now uh, uh namaste uh, dear teachers colleagues friends i see so many and i am really grateful that all of you could take uh, time out of your busy schedules and also your family time because uh, these are festive seasons uh, so uh welcome to this other than that sepsis webinar uh, the name came from ott in fact over the top uh so i thought maybe something out of the conventional would would be more uh, interesting to talk about and learn in fact uh, we all have been discussing for decades as sir has said on bacterial sepsis and uh, uh we daily encounter um usually from gram negative and gram positive cocci gram negative bacilli and how we do come across perplexing and very challenging uh, microorganism host interactions uh, are from other than um Uh, the, the bacteria, and that was perhaps the reason which stimulated um, this webinar. Uh, all throughout in past one decade, they have been um, one decade and a half. They have been more uh, such cases, and they are increasing in number. Uh, they do not require uh, majority of the time. They do not require uh, non-specific um, antimicrobial. especially antibiotics uh, and uh, this is one way of you know um, and as a diagnostic uh, field this helping out uh, in determining uh, as soon as possible uh, so i think uh, this is a time when we should start on only specific uh, and we look at only specific antimicrobials uh, and uh, it is not only candidemia in fungus uh, molds and also we have seen uh, some cases of pneumococcus carinii uh, or jerovisiae which which are uh, uh, which have led to a sepsis like situation only with a single organism uh, and it is now the literature also is beaming up in, in certain things molds need to be kept in mind however can it take a cake in in fungal infections though in fungal sepsis and again uh, one has to look at closely when not to use um, broad spectrum antibiotics uh, uh, you know just thinking that sepsis is because of that uh, because of that yes so similarly the pandemic and outbreaks uh, uh, of viral infections earlier especially dengue and this particular pandemic i'm very sure uh, all the learned colleagues who are present today would be uh, and otherwise were listening uh, would have encountered uh, plenty of viral sepsis uh, like uh, situations um especially in the pandemic covid and also uh, uh, earlier with dss and uh, um with dengue shock syndrome uh, you know uh, so uh, uh, influenza also we did see quite a few cases of sepsis like um situation and uh, which we partly didn't give uh, only you know 
credit to the virus, but also uh, to an accompanying bacterial infections, and that may worsen at times. Uh, so, uh, uh, parasitic infections per se, by the various indirect involvement or direct involvement, they have to be precariously handled as we have seen in our day-to-day -day clinical microbiology and infection prevention control uh, uh, base. Um, we, have all, we are also coming across NTM and, um, and tuberculosis yeah. as um, uh, single uh, organisms away from the norms, uh, which, are, uh, um, which are now being, um, you know, getting more and more uh, into line with because of the diagnostics uh, and uh, also the clinical acumen uh, which comes into fold. So uh, also we have seen that uh, uh, biomarkers, the use of biomarkers, appropriate biomarkers, new and old. So this needs to be looked at in these challenging uh, uh, microbes uh, specifically. So I won't take much time in between you and, and the learned faculty and um, uh, the chairs. Um, again, thanking all of you uh, from uh, different uh, places all over India. You're very, very, very revered uh, faculty and uh, really grateful that uh, you people could take time out. So I'm not naming anyone uh, in particular, uh, but uh, definitely, it's, it's uh, really, really grateful that people are going to learn uh, something, something more than the norms uh, which have been uh, doing the rounds up till now. Thanks a lot, sir, uh, and madam, and everyone. So, uh, I would request Dr. Uh, Sumi Nandwani. Uh, she's 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 a professor. Uh, Dr. Sumi Nandwani, yes. So, Professor Sumin Anwani is. Um, uh, can I have her? Um, uh, Roiji, can you please put her uh, introductory slide, please? Yeah, so she is a professor in head microbiology at Postgraduate Institute of Child Health, Noida. And um, she has got more than 22 years of PG teaching experience. Um, and then uh, uh, she has been variously awarded uh, by the government of India and also uh, in different uh, uh, research. Uh, she has got a lot of research in place and um, over to Dr. Sumi. And she has been very, very helpful, very knowledgeable whenever we ask her or request her to take a, a lecture for, uh, for uh, our... So... Um, Dr. Sumi Nandwani, please. She will be the person who will be taking over the proceedings and um, will be introducing the chairs uh, as well. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it is my proud privilege to be a part of this important uh, webinar. And I'm thankful to HC, Dr. Jain, Dr. Raman for having included me in this. So before wasting much time, I would like, uh, we should go on for the keynote sessions. Session one is on fungal sepsis and area of under or over diagnosis. And I will be introducing the chairs for the session. Can we request uh, for this idea? So again, it is my honor to introduce uh, Sir, Professor Dr. Arunalok Chakravarti. Sir needs no introduction. And uh, Sir has in fact uh, brought Mycology to an international forum, Indian Mycology to international forum. Sir is uh, currently director, Dudha Dharani Burfani Hospital and Research Institute, Haridwar. He is also past president of International Society of Human and Animal Mycology, uh, ISHAM, which is uh, uh, India uh, mycologist, Indian mycologists were brought to this platform uh, due regards to Sir. Sir has been president of this society uh, and also president of IMM earlier. Uh, so his main interest, everyone knows on mycology. And uh, he's also international coordinator for antifungal resistance surveillance network under WHO. 
we have been sending our strains to sir for uh, typing and they have been uh, very very uh, cooperative and supportive in all this so his major contribution has been in field of epidemiology of fungal sinusitis porotrichosis mucormycosis and hospital acquired yeah. fungal infections he has published uh, innumerable papers more than 400 papers on medical mycology he has an uh, enormous h index of 82 scholar index and 61 scopus index so multiple awards for sir duly accredited he is from national society is academies of india he was awarded the fellow of national academy of medical sciences fellow of the national academy of sciences india fnasc fellow of european confederation of medical mycology and fellow infectious disease society of america fitsa so uh, sir will be one chair uh, can i request uh, the coordinators for uh, the introductory slide for the second chair again uh, we have another chair for the session dr avdesh pansal sir is a senior consultant in department of respiratory critical care and sleep medicine ip apollo hospitals new delhi india he has had innumerable presentations and lot of publications to his credit he is also member of national college of chest physicians india life member of ia uh, bronchiology fellow of royal college of physicians and surgeons of glasgow fellow of indian college of critical care medicine india fellow of royal college of physicians of london fellow of american college of chest physicians usa so uh, i would further uh, request the chairs to take over the session please Thank Professor you. Arunalok, please. Thank you, Dr. Nandini. If I can, uh, also thanks to Dr. Ramon and Dr. Jain and the whole team for inviting me. Uh, really, I am participating in a uh, conference here in Calcutta, and Ramon really snatched me from that conference even uh, to uh, chair this particular session. And I am very pleased that uh, I have to introduce my colleague. Dr. Shiva Prakash, can I get the slide of Dr. Shiva Prakash? Do I need not have this slide because I know him uh, since he joined in the field of mycology. Uh, he is uh, the uh, life member and ex-president of Indian Society of Medical Mycology. And most important, he was the vice president of the International Society and fellow of the European College of Medical Mycology. And uh, Dr. Shiva Prakash is really going to be the leader in case of fungal world, in case of India. I really find in him that particular bigger challenge and really uh, his intention to work in the field of fungal infection is tremendous. Uh, without spending much time, let's start uh, what he wants to speak about fungal sepsis. Dr. Shiva Prakash, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk in this uh, wonderful conference. And uh, really, I am being honored to talk, especially in this session, chaired by my boss, uh, Professor Arnolok Chakravarti. So I am using many of his slides uh, for my presentation. And uh, I have been asked to talk on uh, fungal sepsis, uh, epidemiology, pathogenesis, and diagnostic uh, stewardship. Just to start with the fungal sepsis, we all know that the bacterial infection still remains a main cause of the sepsis. But now virus and animals are also becoming an important uh, agent. Approximately 50% of healthcare associated infections are caused by the fungi. So in a uh, survey that is done in an USA, it has been said that 17% of the sepsis is attributable exclusively to the candida species. And the estimates are really very, very high. For example, can invasive candidiasis, it's expected that more than 2,50,000 occurs every year worldwide, and of which 50,000 death occurs. So most of this uh, uh, sepsis, uh, candidal sepsis or fungal sepsis occurs in an ICU setting. So more than 50% is at least. In other, other than uh, candida, 
other yeast such as trichosporon as well as mold such as aspergillus kidosporium lamentospora pneumocystis are all causing an uh, fungal sepsis but today most of this uh, diagnostic strategies and pathogenesis we know more about and uh, candida so most probably i invite talk uh, i'll be covering mainly on the candida so fungal sepsis is completely different from that of uh, bacterial and viral sepsis some exclusive factors are they are almost seen exclusively contracted in an hospital settings and they have a severe cns sequence which is well documented and it carries a very high mortality and some of the features it uh, shares with viral sepsis and bacterial sepsis for example antibiotic treatment uh, uh, is important uh, and important uh, risk factor for causing a fungal sepsis so this is one of the slides uh, again this is from professor chakravarty slide so it has been clearly life leading international fungal education they have highlighted that india has got one of the highest rate of candida bacterium infection in the world so you can see the estimations here for lakh people per year so if it incidence is about 5 then 60000 candidemia occurs per, per year and death will be 24 hours as the incidence increases you may see the rate will of uh, incidence as well as death increases so this is a beautiful slide compiled by professor chakravarty again and uh, he has compared the incidence of uh, candidemia from developed as well as to that of in developing countries so you can see in the developed countries so the candida rate are in single figures when it come to in developing nations again so there are almost uh, similar type of features are there and in some countries like indonesia you can see very high but uh, this is specifically in india and brazil you can see the rates are really very very high so in india we have about 540 uh, cases uh, per lakh per year and in brazil about 249 cases per lakh per year populations and many other studies are there from india so for example from sjpa study long back they said that it is of eight most common incidence is about 1.6 per 1000 admission and prevalence of uh, in uh, delhi some places 68% prevalence have been seen and uh, the even in neonatal septicemia it has been seen in 8.1% and in chandigarh from uh, medical college dr jaydesh chandra has seen that 5.7% of the blood sample they received is an uh, fungal sepsis or candidemia so this is a unique study about a uh, fungal uh, sepsis or candidemia especially so here this was the study were done under the shiham but uh, coordinated by professor chakravarty and you can see here that uh, uh, the centers participated is uh, or derived from all over the all over the country and it was mainly the icu study done in F, uh, for one end of year april 2011 to september 2012 27 centers participated both private and uh, government sectors were there and a large number that is 1400 candidemia cases were enrolled in this the main finding is we could exactly kind of find out the denominators here so here you can see that 6.51 candidemia cases occur per 1000 icu admissions have been uh, reported and uh, this was the this is the paper that has been cited more than 300 times in the literature now so another important findings of this paper is in indian icus we acquire an a patient acquire candidemia much much earlier compared to the developing countries so the mu days is about 10.8 days compared to 23 days in an usa and surgery is found to be one of the most common uh, uh, risk factors especially the gi surgery is said to be most common followed by vascular surgery general surgery and neurosurgery so prior antibiotic use is also one of an uh, major factors you could see that majority of the patients in an icu receives antibody so 93.5% received an uh, antibiotics uh, of which uh, ir um, antibiotics also were there viropinam piperacin tazobactam and other antibiotics has been received so most of the patient received more than two antibiotics uh, uh, before acquiring an infection even the patients were exposed to an azoles and aconitines and other antifungal exposure was very very less at that particular time when the study was performed the most important thing of this particular study is another important thing is a spectrum of an agents causing candidemia 
Here we could see that a total of uh, 32 species caused in fungal candidemia. So, though in the majority of the cases, five most important agents are there like Candida tropicalis, albicans, parapsilosis, Cruzi, Labetta, and Candida auris. So, here you can see that uh, in uh, developing countries, we are noticing Candida tropicalis as the most common, which is agents. Uh, uh, compared to developed countries where Candida albicans still remains a major positive agent. And Candida auris at the time, initially when it started, so we could see that it was almost uh, in the fifth place uh, along with the Candida glabrata. So susceptibility profiles at that time, it is, you can see that of the around 12% had shown an azole susceptible resistance and uh, Candida albicans, it was 9.4% to 40%. And the Canada tropical is 5 to 41 percent. This includes the susceptible and dose dependent. So, this is the current study of the susceptibility pattern of uh, Canada species. So, uh, this is again the national AM AMR surveillance conducted uh, in our centers. And uh, here you can see that uh, Canada glabrata is a major issue. There is a 45 percent of it is uh, resistant. This is a susceptibility data I am showing. Since resistance will be 45 percent. And uh, fluconazole resistance, uh, again, uh, in Western countries, it is much, much more. But here it is slowly, we can see the increasing 20% uh, rate of uh, uh, fluconazole resistance. And coming to the Candida paracrosis, only fluconazole resistance is important. And even in case of Candida auris, you can see that almost now it is becoming resistant or it, you can say that it is intrinsically becoming resistant to fluconazole. And echinocandine resistance uh, is up to about 30%. So, but mycofungin is doing better of all the echinocandine. And boriconazole resistance, you can see that 70% of these isolates we had in the, during this time has been resistant to the boriconazole. So, and the resistance also, again, uh, uh, the distribution of the organisms depend upon the clinical practice. For example, whether the patients have given prophylaxis in particular ICU or how long the prophylaxis has been given. Here you can see that when there is no prophylaxis, this is actually the Western data. So, Canada ambicans is the more prevalent. And uh, again, less than seven days, the picture doesn't much changes. But if more than seven days prophylaxis is given with all the antifungals, the Canada glabrata is emerging as a major agent, followed by Canada cruzi. Canada albicans is comparatively reduced. So again, when it comes to the different antifungal agents, when the fluconazole prophylaxis, no prophylaxis, so again, this is the same data. Whereas if you give a fluconazole prophylaxis, you can see that Canada glabrata and Canada tropicalis rate, uh, Canada glabrata specifically is increased, as well as uh, if it is caspofungin uh, prophylaxis, Again, you can see Canada parapsidosis and Canada elaborata as a leading agent. So, in Candida auris, again, you all know uh, in epidemiology about the Candida auris. Here, uh, again, one of our, the, the, that same study, we analyzed separately about the Candida auris, our risk factors analysis was done. And again, here you could see that public sector hospitals was one of the common thing, uh, risk factor significantly associated. Duration of ICU stay, if it is more than the most chance of getting candida auris infection and high prior antifungal exposure, especially fluconosal exposure will lead to this disease, candida auris acquisition. And presence of central venous line was not significantly associated, but duration of the central line was significantly associated. All our isolates, uh, when we did an uh, um, AFLP was uh, almost uh, clonal and uh, there was not only one single plane was seen. So there are many issues about the candida auris. So I will not go into the details of it, especially if it is mainly seen in not from the community, mainly patient acquired infection within an hospital when it comes to the hospital. And it spreads very rapidly within an hospital when it comes. And identification is one of the very, very important factors. Coming to the risk factors, already I have told about it. And uh, these are the four major things. So you should remember that candida auris uh, can generally it is acquired by the uh, uh, endogenous route of infection. So along with that uh, equation, you need to have a risk factors for candida. So candida risk factors can be anything, so intervention within an hospitals or any comorbidities. Even now we are seeing that liver failure, dialysis, uh, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, all these are an 
uh, additional comorbidities having just risk factors and also the classical immunosuppression the therapies including the immunobiologicals and also we have some uh, genetics uh, susceptibility of the patients to this disease. So coming to the pathogenesis uh, of uh, candida infection, in addition to risk factor, as I said, candida albicans is uh, albicans or all the candida generally up lives in a body as in uh, commensal. So most of the time it, it, it is colonizes both the skin and the mucosal surfaces. So in GIT as well as oral cavity and reproductive tract. And from there, most of the time, bloodstream infection occurs by percolating the candida from this. So it is an endogenous infection that is most of the time it occurs. So growth of candida infection is generally controlled by the host immune response and regulatory mechanisms provided by the normal microbiota. That's also very, very important. That's why antibiotic is mainly reduces the, uh, kills the bacteria and fungal flourishes and then they try to invade in presence of other factors. And the presence of a particular organ depends largely on the route of infection and underlying condition in each of the patient. So in addition to endogenous route, so also we have found many, many outbreaks. For example, Pichia outbreak that occurred in the, uh, India in our centers. So the, 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 finally, it was caused by one resident uh, uh, who had uh, colonization with the uh, Pichia anomala and then he spread the infection throughout the hospitals. Uh, wherever he was posted, uh, we saw that clearly it was defined uh, by Professor Chakravarti well explained and also the isolates were correlated very well by doing a molecular typing. So uh, that uh, implication of this uh, uh, agent from an and of a resident to an causing an infection. So candida, other than the host factors and risk factors, you need to have an, many virulence factors has been defined. One is an polymorphism, other is an adhesin and inhesin, and the excreted secreted products, that is virulence product, and also it's an adaptation to a stress and metabolic, uh, metabolic and other stress. So adhesion is one of the most important point. So during an adhesion, it can, it can uh, while candida albicans, uh, when it adheres to the host surface, it will, uh, it will then convert into an uh, Eiffel form. And also this uh, touch in with the presence of the touch, which is called as a thigmotrophism. Many, many factors will be uh, activated and then it will lead, cause uh, the, uh, the, uh, it will cause some pseudo Eiffel formation or Eiffel formation. And also phenotypic switching has been defined, biofilling formation and fitness traits such as stress response and pH and other metals. So coming to the polymorphism, you can see that pH is one of the important factor. It has been clearly defined, especially in case of vulva vaginal candidiasis. And even the candida enters into the serum or a blood, blood sample in the presence of the serum, I have candida antigens has been shown to convert into an yeast form. And also carbon dioxide, pranizol, other factors have been identified. And then pseudo FL formation is mainly responsible for the invasion of by this candida. Whereas each form yeast is responsible for the dissemination into the different area. And phenotypic switching is to from an uh, white to opaque to white form is an, another risk factors. And true IFA, when the IFA formation is there from a candida, you can see many IFA associated proteins are there. That is uh, HWP1, ALS3, SAP. So this is responsible for the invasion and sepsis, uh, other features of the sepsis. So adhesins, so adhesins, uh, one of the most important adhesins is ALS3 hyphen protein. That, because this adhesin, when the patient organisms go and add, it will adhere only when there is an higher expression of this agglutinin-like sequence. And then also, uh, when the, the, this is present mainly when the pseudo FA is produced. Even morphologically independent adhesins has also been used because we have many like candida glabrata, candida, candida auris, so we have an EPA cell surface associated protein, integrated like surface protein, which is responsible for this is each form, which helps in an addition. And after addition, it is an invasins. So invasins, it will help in binding to an epithelial or endothelial surface. So ALS3 and SSA1 is the one. And later, which is penetration, once it adheres, and starts, starts increasing, it will have an active penetration also can be done. For that, many 
sub, uh, this SAP is that is secretory aspartyl proteinase is the one that helps. Whereas lipase and phospholipase uh, earlier thought to be an important factor for invasion. There's uh, now it is said to be it was gotten less much contribution to the invasive procedures. Biofilm formation again is one of an important factors in the pathogenesis. So these uh, E cells adhere to an abiotic or an biotic surfaces and multiplies and then extracellular matrix are produced. And these biofilms uh, from there, the candida again releases into an let's stream. So these biofilms uh, released from the biofilm are really very much antifungal resistant to antifungal agents. And also it will avoid an post immune response. So due to an complex uh, procedures like a matrix, and then in expression of an efflux pumps and even metabolic plasticity. And they are regulated by different genes, such as HSP90 and other genes. So the major factors in an biofilm is an beta 13 d glucan is the one. And many transcription factors that is there, which causes this uh, helps in the matrix formation within the biofilm. And it also adopts uh, ex itself against a stress response, especially from an uh, uh, and uh, the, all these macrophages or monocytes, the uh, immune system. So one, one is it to uh, tolerates the heat uh, of the body produced within the body. So by as a many mechanisms such as uh, ex increased expression of HSP uh, proteins are there, which is uh, very, very important. And also for osmotic process, Og1 is the one which is very important. Here it will try to conserve the uh, water within its uh, by formation of an glycerol in it. And uh, ROS uh, neutralization with ROSS is caused by the, it has a catalase which breaks down the hydrogen peroxide, whereas uh, super uh, oxide dismutase that is produced by uh, macrophages and other cells, it will be neutralized again by the SOD1 and SOD5 that is present within the organism. And also it has got a different mechanism of acquisition of metal. metal. So iron acquisition is uh, one of an important uh, oh. factors uh, like uh, mucorels, how it acquires. It is also acquired by three different systems, detective system, citropore uptake system, and em iron uptake. Oh. Out of most factors, oh. so, mainly the macrophages and the monocytes uh, or other innate immunity is very, very important. So for uh, fungi candida, it has been found that mainly uh, tall-like receptor 2, tall-like pattern resistance receptors are TLR2, TLR4, and TLR9. They work, uh, this candida camps, it attached directly to a phosphomannan, mannan, or volin panocytes. C-type -like, lactic receptors, especially manose receptors, which attaches to the mannan, this is mainly important, especially in the vulvovaginal candidiasis and for our mucosal surfaces, even in case of esophageal and oral uh, candidiasis, not in the sepsis. Whereas uh, dectin 1 and dectin 2 are also very important and NLRs are also being identified as an important pattern recognition factors. So you can see that the majority of the fungal element, especially this candidal, uh, will attach to the TLR4, TLR6, dectin 1, and through the, if it is in the dectin 1, through card 9, it will and then uh, NF kappa beta pathway, it will produce an interleukins and then the uh, immune response is produced like this. In the, and also in case of mannan and beta D glucan, mannan mainly uh, bind to an TLR4 and through NF uh, kappa beta produces an inflammatory cytokines. So genetic susceptibility has also been identified. So especially the autosomal dominant and recessive one, they are mainly implicated with a cutaneous mucormycosis, not in an um, in sepsis features. Whereas in persistent candidemia, we have found that polymorphisms within specific polymorphisms within IL-10, IL-12, B, and then TLR1, TLR2, and TLR4. So many of the polymorphisms have been identified where the polymorphism is present, the patients may have an increased susceptibility to candida or they may have a persistent candidemia. So coming to a diagnosis of invasive fungal infection or candidiasis, so most of the time, the, the current diagnostic method that is available, so will only help in uh, uh, either it can do use an empirical therapy as well as targeted therapy. And most of the time it will be diagnosed in the advanced stages of the disease or when the patient is already having an clinical infection. 
So we need to diagnose, especially when the patient is having a biological infection in an eye risk group, sir, so that we can give targeted prophylaxis and preemptive therapy. Now we have an, an for candidal sepsis, especially we have both antigen and antibody detection, candidal PCRs are there and glucon. So these are all beta D glucon. These are all can, can be utilized to uh, diagnose the uh, sepsis uh, early in the stage of an infection, biology, when the patient is in biological infection. So coming to the beta D glucon assay, you all know about a beta D glucon assay. So it is not in specific for candida itself but it has been evaluated and uh, extremely used for the diagnosis of the candida and as a marker of uh, candidiasis. It can also diagnose uh, uh, candida aspergillosis as well as pneumocystis. So the principal, uh, I think you all know about it already. This thing, is, this test has been used for a long time. It is just like an endotoxin detection. Uh, so, and very good. Thing. One thing I would like to tell about this particular test is earlier we used to have only Fungital as a main test. So now the, in the market, they're having many, many other uh, companies coming out with this test. But one till now, only Fungital is a FDA approved test. So you should know that uh, for, it has been well evaluated with all different populations and its utility. So 60 to 80 picograms, when you are using an other kits, you should use the cutoff value according to the manufacturer that has been described. So, beta D glucan assay has got a very, very important utility. So, you can see that it can diagnose candidiasis 10 days before the clinical diagnosis. And in patients with the uh, intra abdominal candidiasis, it will become positive five days before the confirmation. And it has got an excellent negative predictive value. And you can use this particular test to uh, institute and preemptive antifungal therapy and also can uh, determine whether the patient is responding for therapy or prophylactic failures are, is present or not. And also you can use it to rule out the disease in patients on empirical or early treatment. So even you can decide the duration of the prognosis of the patients with confirmed diagnosis. So some false positive tests you should remember when you are uh, uh, ordering this particular test and even some false negative test. So fungital, uh, actually we make main test uh, that is a uh, micro titer plate we generally get. So generally we need to have a 21 sample. It is a batch test. That was the major disorder, uh, uh, disadvantage of the fungital because every day we will get only few samples in a small hospitals. So if you want to use, get only five samples, then you have to waste uh, 21 samples in this one. The cost is really high. So fungital, uh, now they have come up with this fungi stat. So, which is an even if you have in one sample, you can do it on the, the, you can do it on that particular sample, and they are evaluated with the standard fungital, and the cutoff has been defined accordingly. So now accordingly, so if it is more than eighty, so if you are using fungital stat, then one point two or more than one point two is to be taken it as positive. So another test uh, from uh, Japan, so vaco beta D gluten assay. They are come comparatively technically it is little bit simpler compared to a fungital assay but it has got a very good correlation which we have evaluated and still we are preparing the manuscript not published so bdg value cutoff value of five picogram per ml showed a very good agreement that is 84.7 percent agreement with the standard fungital assay see this is a fungital assay or a sickle and it is uh, comparable to that of fungital so next Dr. is Pukas, yes, sir? Dr. Pukas, can you uh, quickly finish already time at seeding? Okay, okay, sir. Oh, again, you have a manan antigen and anti manan antibodies. So here uh, you can uh, see that uh, mananemia is the one uh, which uh, can be detected six days before the culture is positive. So this is the test where, where you have to use it together, uh, both the antigen and uh, antibody detection test. If you use it alone, it may not be of useful uh, because uh, it may only indicates the colonization or earlier exposure. And also you have a uh, uh, germ tube test assays are present. And in molecular diagnosis, it is an ITS-1 that has been used majorly for the diagnosis or identification of the fungi. And you have many kits uh, in the market. Uh, Mainly it is a uh, multiplex uh, real-time uh, PCR-based test, but main disadvantage is you can only identify five to six pieces if you use any of the, these particular things. So in our uh, the Indian settings, we have 32 species. At least 20 to 30% of the cases you will miss if you are using 
uh, any particular uh, commercial assay for doing an PCR for candidemia. And film array, again, it is an, one of the syndrome based assay. So for uh, uh, sepsis, uh, it has been used. Again, the main disadvantage is only five different uh, common, most common species of uh, uh, candida it can detect. And T2 magnetic resonance is one of the good tests. Again, the advantages, disadvantages, it will detect uh, from two hours uh, after the, the, the two to three hours after the collection of the blood sample, you can sell, tell, uh, sell, tell that patient is having uh, this, but uh, still now it is not present in India. And uh, also again here, you will have only five different species of candida. Multitof mainly helps in an identification of the species and it will because for diagnostic uh, stewardship, uh, this will be very, very important and has been evaluated. So this is the last uh, few slides is on the diagnostic. So only I'll take two minutes. Uh, so this is again the recently just in the July, this paper has been uh, analysis, um, uh, systematic analysis on the diagnostic stewardship of the fungal, especially for the diagnosis of invasive fungal infection. And most of the data that has been given for an candidal uh, sepsis. So they have uh, systematically run the scale, different uh, uh, screening methods and different outcomes have been analyzed. And uh, I'll go to a few findings that they have found out is, so it will improve the, you know, if you're using a diagnostic stewardship, for, for example, if you use a BDG testing, so you can see that time, turnaround time increases, uh, turnaround time is about four hours before. So if you are using once weekly BDG testing implemented for managing antifungal use. So there is also significant reduction in the time of species identification time, especially when you are using multi and vitec. If you are using multi, it is really significantly earlier than a vitec if you are using. Even in case of when they are combined multi top with a real time uh, antimicrobial uh, stewardship intervention. So that's also resulted in significantly improved survival as well as intervention in an intervention group. So PNA fish also helps in a decreased uh, time for antifungal therapy. So time for therapy, again, many other cultures, similarly, uh, it helps in an early management. And even in case of uh, reduction in uh, ICU uh, um, stay, it will reduce us and mortality has been reduced. And also it will help in a de-escalation as well as discontinuation. And it has been shown that significant improvement can be done if you use this uh, diagnostic strategy for a diagnosis of uh, for a while in shifting antifungal agents. So lastly, so coming to conclusion, more than half of a fungal sepsis or invasive candidiasis is seen in an ICU setting. Settings and highest prevalence is seen in developing countries. Candida tropicalis is a major agent. Echinocandin resistance, though it is present, it is still at the lower uh, level. So uh, acquisition is mainly by the endogenous route and in an hospital setting due to a mechanical ventilation and other procedures. And diagnostic stewardship seems to improve uh, turnaround time and also institution change or de-escalate or escalate antifungals and improve survival and reduce hospital stay. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shiva Prakash. Uh, I know it's a very exhaustive uh, coverage of that particular topic in case of epidemiology, pathogenesis, and diagnosis. I just like to highlight uh, five issues which are important. First issue is that uh, I think in two, 2017, uh, we few people across the globe, we said that uh, though you may try for antimicrobial stewardship, your antimicrobial stewardship agenda will not be successful until unless there is development of diagnosis of fungal sepsis. The reason is, if you cannot distinguish between bacterial sepsis and fungal sepsis in your patient, you will be really landing in trouble giving both antibacterials and antifungal. So that's a bit uh, important challenge, which we have highlighted. Though there are some progress now in case of the diagnosis is there, still we have to work very hard. Second important thing which I like to highlight is that uh, the study which you have highlighted in case of India, uh, that 27 ICU, major important point is that we have a defined epidemiology in our country. Our younger patient with less morbidity can acquire the infection much early. 
So we need a different intervention strategy compared to the what is being mentioned in case of the literature. Third important fact is about the candida oris. I would say this candida oris, which have been mentioned uh, in case of our study uh, decade, back, decade back, where we have shown that candida oris is uh, fifth rank in order. But now if you see the recent studies from Define ICU, it shows that it is now the first rank in order. Even compared to candida tropicalis, it is much higher. And in COVID time, uh, there are one study which covered two ICU. It shows that even all candida species isolated, 42% is because of candida oris. Candida oris is one of the pathogen which is just behaving like a bacteria because it is transmissible very quickly, developing resistance very fast, and it is difficult to identify. So we need to do something about candida oris in case of India. And fourth important point which I like to highlight is about the beta glucan test. Uh, we don't have uh, blood culture success rate is around 50%. Yes, T2 magnetic resonance uh, system, it improves the turnaround time, but it is very expensive. Even in Europe where it is available, it costs around 300 euro per test. So you uh, just imagine it's when it can come in the case of India. And here I would say beta D glucan is very important test, but very few centers are performing this aspect. And lastly, what I like to say is that the resistance in case of candida is emerging. And as Dr. Shivaprakas has already mentioned, that there are certain centers where it had shown even up to 40% resistance in case of fluconazole. And fluconazole is the only drug which is very commonly is used in the all centers. So I would say that several work and several studies are required to be done. And clinicians must be aware that our fungal sepsis is quite different. So we need something, a guideline for our own country. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm sorry we have already exceeded the time. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Suman, my friend, is waiting. And Dr. Abdesh, I'm very uh, thrilled that after a long time, I'm seeing online. And he's one of my really uh, respected persons, especially in case of the pulmonary diagnosis field. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chakradi, for these uh, <clears throat> kind words. Our next speaker is Dr. Rajiv Soman, who's going to talk about how to choose the antifungals properly in ICU. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Soman has been working as infectious disease physician in Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. He's also in PD Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, I've seen on the literature, he has written a lot about fungal infections, uh, discovered yes. new fungus as well. Uh, he's been awarded Fellowship of the Infectious Disease Society of America, and he's authored case books on infectious disease, case books on infectious invasive fungal infections. So let me welcome uh, Dr. Rajiv Soman for his talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv Soman. Yeah. Hello, good morning to all. And it's indeed a great pleasure to be on this uh, webinar. And my talk, thanks to uh, Raman Sardana and to the chairpersons for your kind words. Uh, with their permission, I'll start my screen share. Okay, I suppose my screen is visible to all. And uh, so my brief is actually to tell you how one may choose antifungal agents, especially in the critically ill patients. When do we start? Which agents do we choose? And why we do so? And I'm going to give you examples of these three fungi over here and see how we can at what stage treat and with what agents. 
there is really no exclusive pathognomonic sign of an invasive fungal infection. And therefore, you know, if we want to tie all these fungi together and call them that this is a fungal infection, to my mind, that's not the right thing to do. Because the syndromes which they produce are quite different. So you have the syndrome of sepsis, mainly with candida, pulmonary and sinus lesions, mainly with aspergillus, meningitis, uh, chronic meningitis, especially with uh, cryptococcus, and chiefly rhino orbital cerebral lesions with mucormycosis. But I'll remind you that each of these syndromes has alternative microbial etiologies and even non-infectious diagnostic possibilities. And the clinician has to find his way through all these things before he can make a diagnosis of one or the other of these fungal infections. So we definitely need more awareness of the settings in which these fungal infections occur. And also remember that other infections, bacterial and even for that matter viral, may occur simultaneously or even sequentially with these fungal infections. Biomarkers, which Shri Prakash talked about, as well as molecular diagnosis is certainly helpful. But for certain fungal infections, actually a biopsy is needed, especially for mucormycosis. And we can't just wait for all these reports to come. And sometimes therapy may have to be started in parallel while the diagnostic evaluation is going on. And in the case of aspergillosis, even you may want to increase your diagnostic certainty by doing a biopsy or doing some more tests. Let's turn our attention to candida. And uh, we know that the baseline risk in ICU is usually about 2%, but the crude mortality is about 40%. And it does increase with uh, treatment delay. Uh, blood culture sensitivity, on the other hand, is only about 50%. It lacks timeliness. Some of the candida pathogens, such as glabrata, may take their own sweet time to grow in cultures. And the positivity also depends on the route of entry, whether it's coming from the GI tract and meeting the liver first, or it is entered into the circulation through a central venous line. It would obviously depend on the burden of organisms and the species. Also, using an antifungal agent as maybe prophylactic therapy is going to reduce the sensitivity of a blood culture, even though candidemia may be present. On the other hand, the critical window of opportunity, because as I said, the mortality increases with treatment delay, that seems to be the first 12 to 24 hours following the drawing of the first ultimately positive blood culture. So, it's a, I mean, a simplistic thing for uh, anybody to start an antifungal agent after uh, candida has been found. But the true clinician is the one who is going to anticipate that this culture is going to be ultimately positive. And because of all these factors, there is an intense effort to define a population that will benefit from treatment and at the same time in the interest of stewardship to curtail, curtail the use in others. Take the example of this case, he's a heavy smoker, he had COPD, heavy alcohol use, diabetic, and this is a rather old case. So this was the way we used to make uh, diagnosis and treat in 2014. So he had fever with chills, as you can see, he has got a bowel gangrene, he's got a large splenic abscess, bowel infarcts, he was treated with uh, meropenem and tycoplanin, his blood culture was negative underwent a lot, lot of uh, resection of his bowel and uh, anastomosis. A right internal jugular vein was, uh, catheter was placed, TPN was given through this, ARDS developed and steroids were given. So you can see how many risk factors this particular patient has. And yet the splenic blood bed culture had only shown Klebsiella and E. coli. Remember this is 2014, so fair amount of susceptibility to some of these drugs was there. But for in the case of Klebsiella, it was fairly resistant. However, the next blood culture grew Candida glabrata. So here, this really outlines the problem that you can have multiple infections in the same patient. So you have got so many risk factors in this patient and abdominal source likely, TPN there, COPD, steroids and so on, and a chronic smoker. So we really need better definitions of Candidemia risk factors and exclusion of alternative etiologies, which is often considered as one of the important points, is extremely difficult in an individual patient. So multiple risk factors and routes of entry can be involved in the ICU patient. 
at the same time giving so many antibiotics which are obviously justified in a case like this but that is also going to be a risk factor for fluconazole resistant candida although the role of confounding factors is somewhat difficult to exclude and there has been limited data which tells you that even all these antibiotics even metronidazole even especially anti anaerobic drugs are going to perturb host responses reduce the colonization resistance to candida and some of them may actually have not a very useful but some antifungal activity and may induce efflux pumps which will govern the resistance to azoles so imagine that antibiotic associated collateral damage is not pertaining only to bacteria but actually widens the scope of this kind of collateral damage and that may actually lead to may actually impact our choice of antifungal agents in certain patients coming to 2022 now from that 2014 the correct way possibly and the way to go forward is like this that the clinician uh, thinks about candidemia or invasive candidiasis depending on what the patient has so if it is mainly intra abdominal one would think of invasive candidiasis but also perhaps candidemia so we use the high sensitivity of a scoring system so we have so many scores including msg01 and the score from ostrowski zeichner and so on but the problem with all these scoring systems is that the sensitivity is high but specificity is not high and therefore you can use this high sensitivity of a scoring system but then you can also use the high specificity of a negative beta d glucan okay so if you have this you there is an option either to start empirical antifungal or have watchful waiting and then use the negative predictive value of a beta d glucan to stop the empirical fungal agent which you have started for this candida now coming to 2016 guidelines of your idsa you know that the echinocandin is actually recommended as initial therapy in all patients fluconazole is an acceptable alternative only if the patient is hemodynamically stable there has been no previous azole exposure there are no risk factors for maybe clebrata and if you specifically have a problem with echinocandins such as infection sites like cns i and urine now this was actually based on the reboli study a post hoc analysis of the reboli study and there was apparent superiority of anidula fungin in that study and that was found even in patients who had albicans which was susceptible to fluconazole so that set people thinking whether it is the sidality or fungi sidality which is going to be important and even counter intuitively even patients who had low apache scores also did benefit better with an echinocandin and cyclic therapy rather than the azo however the question still remains somewhat open so whether post hoc analysis of a single non inferiority trial can establish superiority of echinocandins as a class over the azoles still remains a subject of some controversy although if you look at this particular study which analyzed seven rcts where they looked at host organism therapy related factors two things stood out as going to be most important and one was echinocandin therapy and the removal of the central venous catheter so each of these were associated with 10% better survival so at the end of it what can i say there is reasonable support that echinocandin is going to be beneficial especially in all these critically ill patients with prior azol exposure and so on but there is no formal proof of superiority what about amphotericin b it has more predictable activity in india especially if you are talking about candida auris but it is otherwise too toxic to be used in the average or the usual critically ill care, uh, patient however it can certainly be an alternative if the person is resource limited but again this is a circular argument because then in a resource limited setting you are trying to use amphotericin b deoxycholate which again will create a problem voriconazole is not really much superior to fluconazole except for some pathogens such as candida cruzii and the treatment can be transitioned within a few days to an azole and this is uh, the latest uh, from the ucast which uh, looks at what are the breakpoints or uh, for candida glabrata as we had in this particular patient and you find that susceptibility is defined if it is extremely low like 
zero point zero zero one, and uh, resistance is defined at sixteen. So what it really means is almost all isolates of Candida glabrata are to be considered in the parlance of UCAST as uh, increased exposure. A similar uh, consideration is susceptibility dose dependent with uh, CLSI. And so one has to use when you transition in such a patient from an echinocandin to an azole such as fluconazole with high dose fluconazole. So the messages from this case are colonization resistance to candida by other gut commensals is actually abolished by antibacterial induced gut dysbiosis. The most important combination of pathogenetic factors for an individual patient. We know all the risk factors, but we don't know the best possible combination which suits a particular individual patient. Doubtlessly, it depends upon the epidemiology and various other factors. Echinocandin is recommended as initial therapy in all, but with some caveats as we discussed and followed by transition to azoles. We can use the high negative predictive value of a beta deglucan test to stop or in perhaps to de-escalate empirical therapy. But I'll again remind you that de-escalate, if that is going to mean continue with an azole, even an azole can produce or increase resistance in the mucosal candida reservoir. So don't think that transitioning to azoles takes you uh, really off the hook. The next case is of aspergillus. So this is a lady with COVID-19 and she had received lots of treatment there. And uh, the, a large lesion, a large necrotic cavitary lesion, as you can see on in the left upper zone, was present. The patient also had severe LFT alterations, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of remdesivir or something like that. At that stage, the patient was referred for an ID opinion. So what we did is we reviewed the previous X-ray and the scan, and we showed that the previously that there was hardly any lesion seen. It was a very tiny cavitary lesion, which had sort of developed into this very large necrotic shaggy lesion within one week while the patient was on very broad top of the line antimicrobials. So that set us thinking that this is unlikely to be a bacterial problem. So it's really suggested that this could be a mold infection. Um, so the BAL, serum galactomannan and beta glucan were all advised. And the uh, LRTI DN uh, low respiratory panel the DNA multiplex PCR panel showed that this was 10 raised to 6 bin value of Klebsiella pneumoniae and what was found markers for CTXM and OXA48 but not for NDM was found. Additionally, beta glucan Bal galactomannan, serum galactomannan, all of these were also positive. So the question is what can be chosen for Klebsiella and here you have various choices. So I'll remind you that this patient did not have, the Klebsiella did not have an NDM and therefore possibly Astrionam is not required. So only cas could be used for this particular patient, but think whether you really even need this septazidine maybe bacteria because you are unsure, at least I was unsure of the diagnosis of bacterial pneumonia. The BAL colony counts, you accept this as a bean value, but even though those Colony counts have a good negative predictive value, but don't have a good positive predictive value, especially in a patient who has an alternative diagnosis like invasive aspergillosis. So I don't think we can doubt very much whether this is invasive aspergillosis. So uh, although unsure of the bacterial pneumonia, the septazidy navy bacteria was continued by the intensivist, but we had all this positive, the bowel fluid ultimately grew aspergillus flavors, as you can see and gave us the diagnosis of probable invasive pulmonary aspergillosis and it's related to COVID associated and therefore it is CAPA. Now our chairperson is here on the committee which made these guidelines and uh, so we know that these EORTC, MSG and even the ICU, IAP, IAPA are not really optimized for making a diagnosis of CAPA. And but there are so many issues which are difficult. So you have various radiologic abnormalities because of COVID-19 itself. And because the disease mainly begins in the airways, what you really need is a direct inspection of the airways, which is something very, very difficult for a pulmonologist to do in a setting of uh, COVID-19. 
the mycological criteria because actually angio invasion is somewhat late in kappa and therefore the mycological criteria such as serum uh, galactomannan is less likely to be positive in these situations bearing all these in mind this uh, uh, ecmm isham guidelines to told you that there could be other criteria which we could use such as non bal galactomannan or 4.5 and pcrs and so many other things to make a diagnosis the next question is okay we are okay with this diagnosis of kappa but what could we choose in this particular patient who already had hepatotoxicity and a patient who had aspergillus flavus so if you look at the various options to us what about amphotericin b we know that it is 15 or 20% inferior to voriconazole based on the herbeck trial and bearing in mind that this is actually aspergillus flavus Ucast does not even consider that asper that amphotericin B is a important drug to test for aspergillus flavus. So there are no criteria even established for this. But looking at hepatotoxicity, it is less hepatotoxic. So that could be one point there. What about voriconazole? It has been considered as the drug of choice all this time because of the Herbeck trial. But again, if you look at A flavors. there are no breakpoints which are available although ecos is too uh, but among all of the isols it is the most hepatotoxic what about posaconazole it is non inferior to yep. voriconazole based on the Mark, martin study but again there are no breakpoints offered at least by ucast what about isavuconazole based on the secure it's a non inferiority trial where it showed equal efficacy as compared to voriconazole and uh, again the problem here is that there might be some strains which might have intrinsic resistance although the breakpoint which is one is lesser than the ecof of two in other words even those wild type strains which do not have a mutation will still have high mics to isavuconazole if you look at this small study from koto and his group it tells us that among all these isols especially between posaconazole and isavuconazole the latter is much less hepatotoxic so in fact that was the drug which we chose for treating this patient so covid 19 and its treatment both predisposed to invasive aspergillosis and distinguishing colonizing bacterial flora from true invading pathogens is frightfully important lrti panel has to be carefully interpreted and not everything that comes up on the panel has to be considered as a pathogen and treat and be treated Galactomannan and beta diglucan are very helpful. Kappa is a different, difficult diagnosis. It needs a lot of special care in diagnosis and management. And flavors has different susceptibility, which governs the choice of treatment. The third important infection in the ICU, and we are just talking of the critical ill care uh, patients, is mucor. And this was a patient who had a MDR. tuberculous meningitis and with lot of uh, difficulties because uh, of the drugs as well as because she needed lot of steroids for a long period of time because of paradoxical responses development of these kind of vascular infarcts thanks to the steroids she developed very intense oropharyngeal and esophageal candidiasis but was reluctant to get admitted so she that 16 year old old girl was also had developed diabetic ketoacidosis and she was admitted to icu elsewhere she had received fluconazole as well as anidulafungin for this almost refractory esophageal candidiasis so after that she was admitted with a diagnosis of pneumonia and as you can see there is lot of nodules effusions ground glassing in my place maybe there was also a reverse halo and so on so what was the likely possibility here could it have been uh, gram positives gram negatives as etiology for pneumonia or could it have been tb nocardia or remember she was on large doses of steroids or whether it was aspergillus or mucor so if you consider the various factors in this patient the radiologic abnormalities such as nodules cavitation reverse halo consolidation prominent pleural involvement all these could be thought of but diabetic ketoacidosis really places the patient at a high risk of this being mucor and so are the steroids on the other end while the patient is on moxifloxacin and linozolid for the resistant tb it is less likely that some of these pathogens would be involved and the 
And on the other hand, the patient was on fluconazole and followed by anidulafungin, which again tends to increase the risk, not of aspergillus, but of muca. And we know that some of these agents actually increase the invasiveness and pathogenicity of mucoralis. So the BAL was done and it grew actually uh, lictemia, which is a common mucor mucoralis variety which produces pulmonary mucormycosis. And in spite of having started liposomal amphotericin B and all whatever we could do for this patient, the patient passed away. Now, today, if such a patient had come, was, the, was there any other alternative? Are any of these agents can be considered upfront for treatment? There is a lot of doubt about all these, but uh, both isaviconazole and posaconazole have been used in salvage treatment and sometimes in combination with liposomal amphotericin B. So, distinguishing bacterial from fungal pneumonia and between mucormycosis and aspergillosis and that too in a timely fashion is definitely difficult but is of great clinical consequence. Pursuit of aggressive diagnostic strategies and prompt antifungal agents with activity against mucor has to be considered when we are strongly suspecting mucor. And importance in neutropenic patients has been shown. Like they have said that if you delay anti-mucor treatment by more than six weeks, there is actually a doubling of the mortality. So I'll close my presentation, friends, with a few thoughts like suspicion of invasive fungal infections in the ICU should be ever present in the minds of the treating doctors. But the best approach is the triggers for starting as well as the choice, the dosing of antifungal agents, everything is still elusive. The nature of the fungus in terms of resistance, it's MIC and what are the clinical breakpoints and the epidemiological cutoffs and what are the relevant, what is the relevance of these ECOS and clinical breakpoints, everything is still being worked on. Pay attention to the site of infection. So there are certain pharmacologically protected sites where some of these drugs do not reach. And there is a phenomenon of hysteresis, which is can explain sometimes failure in spite of having done everything right and on the other way around too. Nature of infection also has to be considered. Is there a thrombosis, lack of delivery of whatever agents we are giving to the site of infection, the size of the actual lesion, whether there is biofilm, whether source control in terms of surgery or removal of a central venous catheter or a uh, uh, permacat or something like that has been done. We have to know a lot about the properties of the drugs themselves, such as what is the PKPD index, what is the dose exposure response relationship. And if we have therapeutic drug monitoring, then have we actually achieved the desired PKPD index either in the blood or at the site of infection? These are all very important considerations. Now, MIC determination is now available for yeast and also for some molds. But establishment of breakpoints is still an endeavor which is a work in progress. It is an important but a lofty goal. I'll also remind you that breakpoints are not really yes-no parameters. And varying MIC is actually what it really means is they yield different probabilities of a response. And it is only when the, when the MIC exceeds a particular level that the chances of a response go very, very low. The outcome also is not just related to the drugs. It's a composite of drugs, characteristics of the infection site, host, and various other processes. What about the future? In future, maybe we can do genotyping rather than phenotypic DSTs. Machine learning organic, uh, algorithms can be helpful. Real-time TDM in uh, blood as well as tissues along with closed-loop AI-supported dosing Maybe we are looking forward to all these things, these other uh, technologies which might help us to move the field forward uh, as we gaze into the future. And with this, I will stop. And if there are any comments and questions, I'll be happy to have them. I'll stop my screen share here. Over to the chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Soman, for such a nicely, eloquently uh, uh, talk. Uh, where you have told us how to select your antifungal agents. Uh, we know now that uh, not only the doctors who've been aware of uh, 
fungal infections in ICU for last more than 10 to 20 years. It is the public also after the COVID endemic, which have become more aware. And actually nowadays, yes. uh, most of the relatives in the ICU will come and ask you, doctor, have you checked for fungal infection? You know, especially after the that white fungus and the black fungus kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are multiple risk uh, factors which are important. Uh, you have to think of fungus infection to make a diagnosis because if you don't think, you Absolutely. will not make a diagnosis, okay? They are difficult to diagnose uh, simply because the clinical features are not very exact. Also, the culture availability, the biomarkers, everything takes time. So most of the time, the treatment is empirical. But what is important is that when you do empirical treatment, you must continue to work towards a diagnosis. And if Absolutely. after five days of treatment, patients are not better, then you must either revise your diagnosis or you must do something else to make sure that you are on the right track. Do not use, which we see many times, addition of another antifungal agents in, in a case where the diagnosis has still not been made. So diagnosis review is very, very important. Another important thing is to use proper doses, which we see in the cases of fluconazole. You know, most of the time people will just use 200 milligram once a day, okay, which is not the right dose. So until as you know the PKPD of the of the drug and not using the right dose, patient will not get better. Also, it is important to de-escalate the antifungal in time to make sure that the resistance does not develop. But what is important is the de-escalation must be done provided the source of infection has been removed or the line has been removed. If the source control is still not there, maybe de-escalation pro process need to be more slower as compared to in a, in a normal person. So it's really, really important. So fungal stewardship has definitely a role, but the biggest issue still remains quick diagnosis, early diagnosis, which remains an enigma in these infections, basically. So thank you, Dr. Soman, uh, for your nice talk. Uh, Dr. Sadana, would you like to say something? No, thank you, sir. Uh, all... Uh... Besides the comments that you make, it's good enough for everyone, sir. And um, after a keynote like uh, what Dr. S Suman delivered, it's always a treat. Uh, just wanted to see all your questions. For, this is for the audience and all of our colleagues who are there on the... All questions will be taken up in, uh, in, the, in the fifth session. That is uh, hypersonics and Prometheus. So we took some time off from Ukraine-Russia uh, war and introduced those terms. So yeah. I hope that is, so the question and answers uh, would be uh, left for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you. With this, I'll take the opportunity to go for the second session. That is uh, viral sepsis, hardly ever thought of, but happens, very aptly named. And uh, it is my again my honor to introduce the chairs. Uh, so ma'am needs no introduction. Professor Amita Jain. Uh, ma'am has been leading our COVID battle, especially diagnostic uh, battle for COVID. Uh, for the whole of UP and uh, we've been very fortunate to have such a leader there amongst us. So ma'am uh, is professor and head department of microbiology KGMU Lucknow. She's also in charge of the state level virology lab for the whole of UP and also intermediate reference lab for TV in UP. She was uh, as I said nodal officer for lab technical support for the for COVID testing for us. And uh, my institute was uh, one of the institutes supported by ma'am. Uh, she's in charge of COVID testing KGMU. She's also a member of uh, National Tuberculosis Expert Group, Subject Expert Committee for Antimicrobials by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. She's also chairman of uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee of KGMU and Vishaka Committee of KGMU. She's member secretary of Hospital Infection Control Committee and faculty in charge for the Center for Advanced Research, KGMU. Her research interests mainly include tuberculosis and virology. And uh, I'll also like to introduce our next chair for the session. Can we have her introductory, can we have the introductory slide, please? So Dr. S.K. Todi, 
uh, sir is currently medical advisor and director for critical care uh, in amri hospital dhakuria and mukund mukundapur so he is also head of the department uh, of academics and research in the hospital he is also editor of indian journal of critical care case reports and also past research chairperson for iss ccm research committee his area of expertise include critical care he has had lot of publications and uh, contributed to book chapters also reviewer for uh, some of the major journals and uh, developing icu protocols he is editor of these books a um, uh, few books on critical care update and uh, principles of pharmacological principles for critical care over to the chair please thank you dr sumi for the most kind word and uh, i think uh, i'll i'll give a chance to dr todi to say a few words and then we will start and we have i hope both of our speakers are already present i can see dr ekta and the other one dr vini welcome both of you and uh, now i think we are already running behind the time so i'll keep a request to both of our speakers to please uh, respect the time a little bit i, I know you, you have a lot to say but we will request you to do that and uh, dr ekta um, is the first speaker and i'll introduce her first she is the professor and head clinical virology and nodal officer for who collaborative center on viral hepatitis at the institute of liver and biliary science i'm so proud of her she has been a, a student of mine and uh, she has made us proud thank you ayekta she she has done our uh, she has done her senior residency and research associateship from new delhi she is also frc path from royal, royal college of pathology london she has more than 100 scientific publications in indexed national and international journal she has authored nine chapters in books she has the gold medal for best thesis that is one medal we give to our pg students who do the best she also has the best scientist award from icmr mr satish chandra talwar memorial award from iamm she has been instrumental in initiation of unique pdcc course at ilbs she is in charge of covid-19 testing laboratory and and she has a whole long list of <laughs> accomplishments to her name i don't need that slide to talk about ekta so ekta you are welcome and i think before you start let's give a chance to the second chair dr todi to say a few words before you start thank you very much thank you <laughs> and welcome to the speakers for this uh, theme which is i think is very unique and is very topical we have been laboring with viral sepsis over the last two and a half years so we look forward to the inputs and insights on this topic uh, by the speakers so uh, so i would request dr ekta gupta to start her deliberations uh thank you so much i hope i am audible and uh, i'll now share my screen i hope my screen is also visible now and i'm yes, audible yes yes you are visible and audible so thank you so much chair uh, dr amita jain and dr todi sir and ma'am for such kind words dr raman sardana sir for giving us this topic viral uh, diagnosis is very close to my heart because for the past i think 15 or 16 years i've been involved only in viruses and um, great thanks to covid 19 from my side for bringing the importance of clinical virology and viral sepsis it's a it's a new thing so uh, different from bacterial and fungal is that when we thought of or think about viral sepsis it is mostly community acquired so the patient would walk in with the sepsis if there is a viral etiology once they stay beyond 48 hours in your icu or this thing more so the fungal and other bacterial nosocomial will occur so this is one thing so i'll be covering my talk under these cases just bringing you aware about 
the uh, how the definition of sepsis from a critical care point of view is changing. So we have sepsis one, two, and three, and now we define sepsis. There is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host immune response to an infection. And this infection need not be bacterial because earlier, a decade ago, it was not bacterial. Fungal also stepped in, but it is infection, any pathogen. That is why this importance of OTT, other than that, that is viral, parasite, and other pathogens come. So it is Three things are important, infection, dysregulated host immune response, and a organ dysfunction. If you clinically summarize the definition of a sepsis. Now, there can be two scenarios, like mostly in viral. There is an infection. There is a dysregulated immune response leading to your organ dysfunction, and we classify that as sepsis. The other scenario, especially in areas like us where we are dealing with transplants, liver, uh, and these are all immune suppressed and uh, severely sick chronic hepatitis patients. There is already an organ dysfunction. You top it up with an infection. There is a dysregulated immune response that also leads to sepsis. So I just wanted to clarify to these things when we call it a sepsis. Now, whom do we call a viral sepsis? So there is a confirmed or a suspected viral infection along with organ life-threatening organ dysfunction and a dysregulated host immune response. This has to be underlined any, almost any viral infection can lead to sepsis. So earlier when we were uh, students, we used to read herpes simplex, neonatal sepsis, dengue virus causing septic shock syndrome, but COVID taught us, and then influenza came leading to sepsis, but now the COVID simple, you know, respiratory virus can lead to an abrupt immune response and can be a causative organ for sepsis. So many viruses need to be worked upon. This concept was not there, that virus alone can cause sepsis. Earlier it was thought that it is a sequential bacterial or top up of bacterial and fungal infection that would cause sepsis, but now the concept and data is coming up. You don't have any other etiology, only virus and there is sepsis. Yes, viruses cause sepsis in susceptible like extremes of age, neonates, adult, elderly, immune suppressed, transplant recipients, pregnant females. And it's very, very difficult to make a clinical diagnosis because viral infections normally do not have a very targeting. You can have a clinical syndrome identification, but usually you do not uh, require uh, have a pinpoint diagnosis to make it a viral infection. So when we talk about birth, burden. It was a decade back or I, let's say five years back, it was grossly underestimated. You did not have markers enough. You did not have insight into that, oh, these viruses can also cause sepsis. But now as with the, the literature is coming up, you have diagnostic uh, armamentarium available. So culture negative sepsis is 40% because that is bacterial fungal culture. And that is the actual burden of the viral sepsis could be because of community acquired. As I said, you have to suspect viral, vir respiratory viral infections always had an upper hand on causing viral sepsis. Neonatal sepsis by herpes simplex virus was always known. Introviruses, dengue viruses are always there. But uh, nowadays, the literature is coming up. This is a very good study, and I would recommend that this was a first comprehensive study published uh, in Lancet Global Health from Southeast Asia, where they tried to look at the entire spectrum of sepsis, various pathogens. This was done across 17 different public hospitals, and the criteria was within 24 hours of admission. So we were talking about more community acquired. We are not talking about what is going to be there after 48 hours of an ICU stay. And as you can see, this is 763 pediatric cases. Mostly, now they try to identify which sim, uh, organ leads to sepsis more. So the respiratory tract infections in pediatric cases causes the causing the most burden of sepsis, followed by systemic infections, CNS, and diarogenic gastrointestinal. In respiratory, definitely rhino, RSV, this is pediatric cases, influenza, was there in systemic infection, dengue, hanta, and adenoma was there. So this is one common 
comprehensive study where they have highlighted, see, there is a huge amount of a burden of viral sepsis, which we are not diagnosing and we can attribute a cause to it. They also studied 815 adult patients. And again, in adult patients also, the most important uh, contributor to sepsis was acute respiratory tract infections. Out of them, you can see influenza was the predominant and there were other bacteria and other pathogens which were there in respiratory tract infections. So uh, in this study, the pediatric and adult, so 36% of pediatric cases of sepsis are because of all alone, only virus etiology. And in adult, about 12% of cases. There is a mixed bag of bacterial viral in both the population, but in pediatric cases, you really need to be very much aware of viruses alone causing sepsis. So how are the, what are the mechanisms that how the sepsis develops? So basically, the viruses are causing direct, indirect injury, and then there is, they can also lead to a systemic illness. Directly means there are certain viruses which have direct cell cytopathic effect like herpes, and uh, those who are cytopathic. Uh, and then they lead to a tissue specific damage like neonatal and once they cause a lot of damage to the tissue they also break the organ and blood barrier and the viruses enter the blood so whatever uh, uh, antibody response was generated for that tissue goes into the bloodstream and then the direct cytopathic effect, the invasion of the blood, and you have sepsis. Now, indirect mechanisms like in hepatotropic and non-hepatotropic viruses with ALF cases, that's also a form of uh, sepsis, where what happens is directly the virus is not cytopathic, but they generate a good amount of immune response, leading to extensive tissue damage. Tissue damage the blood invasion, or you, you have collateral T cell damage by non hepatotropic they fail to recognize their target tissue and they go and damage the other tissues and enter the bloodstream and leads to sepsis. Interesting is the systemic infection caused by viruses. Dengue is a very important example, and now SARS-CoV-2. They lead to a dysregulated, so the pro-inflammatory response, the initial response to the virus is so high that there is an intense amount of cytokine release. They can also cause endothelial cell damage directly or indirect mechanisms like in dengue, and they lead to a shock syndrome or host cytotoxicity, which is also a very new thing like Epstein-Barr virus. So, this regulated growth of the epstein bar virus, they lose the all apoptotic mechanisms, unregulated growth, leading to a damage of the, cell, uh, the host, organ failure, and dysregulated immune response leading to your sepsis. This is a very clustered diagram, but again, this to show that in a normal, I think I'll shift on to the normal immune response by the viruses. Normally, viruses are controlled by our uh, uh, in cases, the uh, innate immune response and adaptive. So a viral infection occurred, they, they go, you have an innate immune response. During that innate immune response, you develop certain pro-inflammatory cytokines, TH1 response, be followed by your CD4, CD8 cells, which clear the virus and clears. But what happens? There is an abnormal immune response. So you have excess amount of either pro-inflammatory cytokines, excess amount of tissue damage, excess amount of antibody mediated damage, all this leads to a huge cytokine response and that causes, so the virus is not controlled. So this clearing the virus is not there and the virus causes da cell damage, tissue damage and the exaggerated immune response causes sepsis. So this is a typical example which is seen like in SARS-CoV-2, COVID, it has become all the more clear. So COVID-19 and viral sepsis, it is an important how it has led in. There's enough of literature now. They show that 76 to 80% of sepsis in COVID-19 were bacterial fungal culture negative. That means all alone. So earlier, there were many speculations that what is happening, and especially during the Delta variant wave, we came to know that what is happening is that there was significant... So the virus was causing infection in the lung, but the pro-inflammatory response was abnormal, aberrant. So all these pro-inflammatory cytokines developed. 
the cell mediated immune response was also abrupt and because the covid became from lung that extensive tissue damage it came into the viral it also went and all these injuries we saw during covid definitely there was a disseminated endotheliopathy and now what happens is that anti inflammatory immune response by the viruses when they develop they start forming the thrombs now these thrombi or micro thrombotic tissue injury further leads to hypoxia and shock so there are three type of mechanisms which occurred in covid huge amount of pro inflammatory lot of tissue destruction directly because of the presence of ace receptors in various sites causing damage to these tissues then endotheliopathy so there was vascular leak syndrome then there was an abnormal anti inflammatory so a lot of micro thrombi started forming and you'll see a lot of thrombotic tissue injury started occurring and they led to another cause of sepsis so the covid 19 had taught us that so important that the host immune response that is pro inflammatory anti inflammatory anti body mediated cell damage all can add to a huge amount of viral sepsis now there is another phenomena of viral immune exhaustion now when in the viral infection this is typically characterized and was again studied so well in covid is that when there is exaggerated aberrant immune response so your t cells cd8 cells are making a lot of anti inflammatory and pro inflammatory cytokines but this is aberrant it is not killing the virus so there is a huge viremia also there there is a huge ex, uh, working of the t cell b cells and they are not doing their functions so this is known as immune exhaustion so you are finally landing into a state of immune suppression although there is lot of cytokines but there is immune suppression now this leads to the attack so if a person stays for beyond 48 hours in your critical care setting secondary infections bacteria fungal all these secondary infections we saw during covid they are also there during influenza during dengue also sometimes it happens they lead to reactivation of dormant infections certain colonizers cytomegalovirus abstein bar virus they are also the one which are never thought about nobody investigates that this can lead to a reactivation and even your colonizers can become pathogenic we see a lot of rhinovirus and we earlier used to think that it is just uh, uh, by standard you should not report but then when we started seeing cases in our liver coma icu that the patient is deteriorating although they cannot do anything because you do not have specific antiviral therapy but we still started reporting so viral reactivation is a huge phenomena i think many studies needs to be done especially on cmv epstein and other colonizing viruses because they lead to a loop of sepsis more immunosuppression more viremia and increasing and adding on to your mortality now we uh, recently published one study because this was a thought which came uh, with our icu patients that what is happening in these critically ill icu because of cmv although we it was not a trial we could not start gan cyclovir it was just an observational study but we definitely saw huge amount of cmv reactivation occurring in critically ill liver cirrhotics and that led to an additional burden of disease and higher rates of mortality and morbidity so increase the icu state but Uh, do not have uh, enough of an antivirals. The gan cyclovir itself is so toxic, so the critical care physicians often restrict themselves to use this. Another phenomena which virus does is secondary bacterial infection. Now, respiratory viruses are prone to do this. Now, there is a whole huge amount of gut dysbiosis and gut microbiota getting displaced because of the viral infection, which is available. so what they call they cause a local tract dysbiosis also but they also lead to your gut dysbiosis increasing certain amount of bacteria and decreasing certain amount of good bacteria which leads to the alteration of the host uh, gut axis leading to all these 
pathogens coming into your circulation, systemic circulation, and causing huge secondary bacterial pneumonia, sometimes secondary bacterial sepsis. So this is another uh, way the virus is attacked. They themselves may not cause direct cell damage, but they disturb your normal bacterial flora and allow the colonizers to grow, colonizers to enter into your bloodstream and cause a lot of huge amount of secondary bacteria. We've been tracking respiratory viral infections in our institute for the last 10 now, so many years. And so we have been stressing that it is not the non-influenza, but the non-influenza, uh, but the non-influenza viruses, which keep occurring in our ICU settings a huge amount. And there's a huge burden in COVID. So this data is minus COVID, but you can see uh, the non-influenza viral respiratory viral infections are always on a rise in our ICUs. And they are associated with a huge amount of mortality as well, and especially the rhinoviruses, which we have started. And all alone, there will be no other cause associated, but rhinovirus will be isolated. And three, four days following that, you'll have a huge bacterial sepsis landing into a patient. Unfortunately, since you do not have any and specific antiviral or a vaccine, uh, at this moment, I cannot say that you should do something, but this is something we must uh, collaboratively produce data and show the significance of these infections. We've been publishing papers on how influenza causes higher mortality in liver coma ICU. And so liver patients are typically very, uh, they do not have a good immune system. We call them immune, almost immune suppressed since cirrhotics and they always land up with very adverse clinical outcomes in, uh, are seen in such patients. This is a quick, uh, you know, our data that I try to uh, collect from our uh, liver coma ICU here of respiratory viral infection of 100 cases and just would like to highlight that when there was a there is a bacterial co-infection, the percentage of sepsis is very high. And if there is a bacterial sequential infection, again, it is very high and outcome is not uh, favorable. But virus alone can cause sepsis and leads to a high amount of adverse clinical outcome. So this is something I would like to highlight that we never go in for an etiology diagnosis of viral alone and we give antibiotic, we give antifungal, but nobody, I mean, we, I have been pressing my case that why can't a ribavirin be started or a gancyclovir if a CMV reactivation is noted or any other antiviral trials should be started like in COVID. But unfortunately, you do not have so many information available so that you can start. Coming on to the diagnostic stewardship for a viral sepsis, uh, as it is defined, all efforts should be made to identify the etiology in culture negative sepsis. Ongoing viral infection should be looked for. So there is no role of antibody assay, but antigen or a PCR based assays are very, very important. Multiplex real time PCRs like the film array syndrome wise approach should be adopted. And there are many systems which are now available which deal with the respiratory GI tract. And I always prefer that it should be a syndromic approach to multiple pathogens rather than isolated bacterial, fungal, and then viral approach. And uh, the only thing is that these are very expensive, so they should be at affordable and cost-effective modules, which should be there. The reactivation of latent and colonizing viral pathogens while you're reporting with the system needs to be looked into thoroughly, because if you do not have clinical signs and symptoms, which leads you and your clinician, there'll be unnecessary use of antivirals in certain cases. So another is the appropriate antiviral therapy if possible like in our institute hepatitis e related ALFs they started coming a lot and then uh, there was a trial of sofosbuvir and we have stringently started giving them because this was not recommended but then they started giving ribavir and sofosbuvir in such patients and they were seeing good responses otherwise de-escalation of antibiotic and antifungal is always nice now can you differentiate viral and bacterial sepsis? There are a lot of information about various few markers is coming. A lot of papers are there, but 
it's not established, I'll not recommend. Although they say that there are certain tumor ligand uh, necrosis factor related apoptosis factor like trails and IP10s, they are more important in viral and uh, mixovirus um, uh, related gene expression is more in viral and IL-6, CRP, they more give you an indication of a bacterial infection, but these are studies ongoing. Uh, if you come for a biomarkers and then they are there in the guidelines, more than welcome because you definitely need to establish if you really want to de-escalate antibiotic and prevent the use of antifungal and um, a higher antibiotic and preserve them, then uh, I think viral infection can should be established. So there are uh, gene expression signatures which people are looking for. They say that uh, viruses, they prefer more interferon-related signatures, while the bacteria are more integrin-related. So these are just studies. I will not recommend that it should be used, but definitely the role of these biomarkers is coming up in a new way in viral sepsis. Although there are a lot of literature where people have tried to find out um, combination of these markers, biomarkers, but a sensitivity of 80% is only achieved where they have started combining CRP with TRAIL and IP10. These are the three markers which uh, a lot of people have started working, especially in pediatric population, and they wanted to know that which biomarker can give you an infection uh, idea about viral sepsis or bacterial sepsis. So um, coming on to the future considerations, I think affordable diagnostic panels to establish a viral etiology should be expanded. We should go more for syndromic testing panels. They should be point of care, rapid diagnostics, but it should be affordable. If you can actually have a biomarker by which a viral sepsis and a bacterial sepsis like combination of IP10, tear trail and uh, uh, MX can be done, nothing like it, but they should have good large trials. So that, and then there should be availability of less toxic antiviral. So like COVID made us so many antiviral and immunotherapy, why can't other viruses, we should come up with vaccines. Like for, we already know that dengue can lead to a lot of sepsis. So dengue vaccine trials should be initiated. Herpes can cause neonatal sepsis. So herpes vaccines trials should be there. And then more and more prospective studies for viral reactivation should be done. And one should definitely try immunotherapy. Steroids cannot be the only recourse for uh, suppressing a viral infection, but uh, other immunotherapy markers uh, which should silent this uh, pro-inflammatory storm of viruses should be looked at. So I summarize that viral sepsis is now an established term. SARS-CoV-2 infection has shown us that you can have isolated viral etiology causing sepsis. Respiratory viral infections, they are the major factor contributing to a vulnerable population and sepsis in them. And usually viral sepsis is community acquired till a person stays for a longer time and a super added bacterial and fungal, which I told you why it occurs, will occur. So unnecessary. So if you can make certain biomarkers to identify this and then so that unnecessary use of antibiotic and antifungal can be prevented, this is should be our ideal aim in the next few years to come. So I thank you all and thank you chairs. Okay, Dr. Ekta, thank you very much. I, I would request you to please stop sharing your slides. Thank you very much, thank you. You have been very, very effective. You've covered everything which should be covered. There were a few points I would like to re-emphasize that as you rightly says that said that sepsis three, as per the current definition of sepsis, there are two things which need to be established to make the diagnosis of viral sepsis. One, there is a viral infection. Two, there, are, there is dysregulated immune response. Unfortunately, this last pandemic has taught us a lot of lessons. And we have learned to diagnose viral infections. There are a lar large number of tests available. And I think everybody, even the lay people, are talking about RT-PCRs like they don't know what is a bacterial culture, but they know that what is a RT-PCR. So diagnosing the viral infections has become much, much more easier in current era. Coming to the dysregulated host immune response, we all have seen people talking about the interleukin-6 level and interferon level and things like that. So that also has been 
um, easier and there are better tools available to diagnose this dysregulated immune response. Bringing them both together, we have to say that 40%, you said rightly, very rightly said that 40% of culture negative sepsis probably is viral culture, viral sepsis. So which the number has gone higher in COVID cases. One thing we forget at times that COVID co-infections with other viruses. So there is COVID, there is super added bacterial infection, there is super added fungal infection, there can be super added viral infection also. And one point you have touched very rightly is that those viruses which are latent, we have seen large number of cases where the COVID-19 and herpes were together. COVID-19 and flu was together. That's not a latent virus, but there was a super infection. So all these cases have added to the viral sepsis. Management becomes easier. Antibiotic misuse and antifungal misuse has come, will come to the lower level. So we have to keep that in mind that there is an established sepsis form, which is a viral sepsis. So thank you for your very, very uh, lucid presentation. Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Brody, please. Say your mic is mute. So unmute yourself, please. Sir, please unmute. Yeah. So we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Vinay Kantru from Indraprast Hospital from diagnostic of virology to therapeutics. She's a consultant respiratory critical care and sleep medicine at Indraprast Apollo Hospital. She has done her fellowship from King's College Hospital, NHS London. She is a Chikitsak Ratna Award awardee, certificate of appreciation in service of humanity, certificate of merit um, from Jumbo University, several publications in international and national journals, author of numerous books, including COVID-19 and multiple clinical trials. She's a very apt person to talk about the therapeutics. You know, we don't have much in our armamentarium as opposed to antifungal or antibacterial but I'm sure there are a few in the pipelines which she is going to highlight. So we look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Kantru, please. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible. Your slides need to be seen. I'll just share my screen, sir. Allow me to share my screen. Yeah, it's visible. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir, for this kind uh, introduction and allow me to thank Dr. Raman Sardana, sir, for inviting me for uh, uh, this lecture amongst so many eminent personalities here. I'm indebted to you, sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity to be present, present amongst these stalwarts. So my work has already been uh, made very, very easy by uh, Dr. Ekta, ma'am. Uh, so sepsis, she has already told you, is a life-threatening organ dysfunction, which is dysregulated Host response to infection, this is sepsis three definition. And as we know, septic shock is a subset of sepsis, which has profound circulatory, cellular, metabolic abnormalities associated with a greater risk of mortality to the tune of 40% as compared to sepsis alone. So this is sepsis three, which has already been spoken about. We all know that culture negative uh, sepsis is contributing about 42% of the presentations where we are not able to find anything. So they are the potential viral infection. However, there is positive of data as far as the prevalence of viral infections is concerned. And documented viral sepsis has been seen to be to the tune of 1% to 4% only. We all need many studies, especially from Indian subcontinent, Asian subcontinent, to get a know-how of how much we are having the viral sepsis to make antibiotic stewardship program successful in our country. So this slide has already been shown, but this is a very, very important slide where we are seeing that this is the dysregulated immune response, which is responsible for tilting the, uh, the immune response and cytokine response response towards the IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha kind of cytokines, which are, so to say, the bad cytokines, causing uh, inability of these viral particles to be phagocytized and opsonized optimally to get them under control. 
Hence, it causes exhaustion of the immune system, the CD4 T cells, which are the cytotoxic T cells. There is persistence of the antigens in the bloodstream, which leads to the problem of sepsis, which we all see. We all know we use sequential organ failure assessment score in our ICUs and also in our wards sometimes. So please keep this in mind that this kind of scoring system, including the Q SOFA score, which is the quick SOFA score, is absolutely essential and should be taught to our nursing staff also to identify these patients very early so that they can be taken care of. Because we all know the moment we act early on these patients, we contribute to saving their lives and decrease their mortality. So PaO2 FiO2 ratio is absolutely important and it is given in the table that if it is less than 100, we score these points as co coagulation platelets. Once they are going down, the scoring goes higher. Bilirubin levels are absolutely important. It again shows you that the sepsis is causing certain kind of organ dysfunction. If it is more and more, the scoring would go higher and higher. Cardiovascular system, wherein we see mean arterial pressure, if it is being maintained more than uh, equal to 65 to 70 mmHg, and as we are using greater number of vasopressors, the scoring of so SOFA goes higher and there is progressive organ dysfunction. The central nervous system is assessed in terms of Glasgow Coma Scale. Now, these scorings have been kept very, very easy for everybody to understand and catch hold of these patients very early to act very fast. So this is the reason we should be using simpler and uh, these smaller kind of scales wherein they are available uh, each and everywhere, including our uh, peripheral centers also. However, if you see here are certain parameters which may not be readily available with your patients, which includes your uh, investigations, which, uh, which is the creatinine and sometimes the other uh, uh, values, which includes the platelets and bilirubin. But this should not deter you from making a diagnosis of sepsis. If you know the Q SOFA score, which is respiratory rate more than 22, uh, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, which is less than 100, and any altered mentation, at once sepsis should come to your mind, whether the patient has come to your hospital with any other diagnosis, you should be readily uh, uh, gauging yourself and asking yourself, is my patient going into sepsis? These are certain kind of clinical syndromes, although ma'am has already elucidated what kind of viruses can cause uh, uh, viral sepsis. Practically any kind of virus can cause viral sepsis. This is unknown to us because we are sus level of suspicion is sometimes very, very low and we are still learning how a viral sepsis can cause problems in a patient. This has been sensitized by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, these certain syndromes which are already known in adult patients are uh, herpes simplex virus, the enteroviruses, the HPEV virus, which causes meningoencephalitis, influenza virus, dengue virus, adenovirus, the chikungunya virus, which is very, very important in our subcontinent. This has already been spoken about. Uh, so gross underestimation, we need more number of studies. The management points which we keep, in, uh, keep into our mind once we are dealing with viral sepsis are the following, which is that the level of suspicion should be very, very high. If your patient is not getting better within certain time frame, which is 48 to 72 hours, you should be keeping your eyes, ears, and brain open to the possibility of viral sepsis and initial resuscitation is absolutely important in these patients. We all know how important is resuscitation and perfusion of each and every organ in these kind of patients where are, we are having the problems of endothelial dysfunction, hypoperfusion per se due to hypotension and coagulopathy. All these three causing a lot of problem in the organ perfusion and leading on to certain irreversible conditions. If we are not acting on time, we will lose the time frame, the time window, and an irreversible cycle wherein we may not be able to help the patient. Supporting and managing the organ failure is absolutely important. And as Dr. Todi rightly said, we do not have many things in our armamentarium. Even if, if we think today 
there is not a single antiviral agent against COVID-19 which has been approved as a therapy and known to uh, prevent the infection or treat the infection. So what we have to do is give the patient the time and the energy to survive this storm. As they say, let the storm pass and you be stable. So you have to keep your patient stable so that the storm passes and you are able to get out your patient uh, absolutely hale and hearty. The source control is very, very important. This is more so in case of bacterial infections, wherein you have to keep your uh, uh, suspicion low. If your patient has been in the ICU, even with a viral sepsis, secondary bacterial infections with the mechanisms elucidated already by Dr. Ekta Ma'am are very, very important. I would be talking about certain therapies. Managing complications is very, very important. Even managing your bed sores and keeping your patient in a well-nursed condition is very, very important. This includes hydration also, wherein you have to prevent DVT, wherein these patients are very, very prone. The prevention of certain select viral infections, especially in the vulnerable population, wherein we will be talking about vaccination. The timeline of events is very, very important. In viral infections, we have been sensitized to this through the COVID-19 pandemic. Even uh, our uh, doctor fraternity who work in a periphery now know that it is the initial timeline of five days wherein we have to act with the antiviral medication and the antibody therapy or the plasma therapies or your antibody therapies should come in early in the picture wherein we are trying to opsonize and control the viral replication so that the storm and the other complications of these kind of viral replication and dysregulated response is controlled right in the seven days. Anti-inflammatory therapy, we all know, can be given in the second week, wherein your patient, in cases of influenza as well as COVID-19 and in certain other viral infections would be showing the signs of deoxygenation, ARDS, multiple organ failure, wherein you have to support your uh, patient and give antiviral therapy in certain select groups. If it is within 10 days of onset, remdesivir can be used in COVID-19 patients and steroid, which has a definite role in case of your COVID-19 patients. Surviving sepsis campaign has taught us, us much uh, for all these years and common strategies which we follow for these patients is the initial bundle upon the recognition of sepsis and septic shock. We have to measure lactate levels for each and every patient, which can be done easily with the help of an arterial blood gas in your emergency or in your ICU. If it is more than two millimole per liter, you have to consider this an emergency and resuscitate your patient. Before giving your antibiotics, ideally take out the cultures very early in the treatment. However, if you're uh, unable to do so, please forget this and give the patient the antibiotic. Broad spectrum antibiotic is very, very important. I will request other uh, participants to please mute their mic. So administration of broad spectrum antibiotics within the first hour is absolutely important. Even if you are suspecting the viral infections, I would say it would be very, very brave of, uh, of anybody for that matter, not to give uh, uh, antibiotics to a patient who comes in shock to your emergency. So begin rapid administration of 30 ml per kg of crystalloid for hypotension if, and especially if the lactate is more than 4 millimole and apply vasopressors if your patient is not being able to uh, get their blood pressure, mean blood pressure above uh, 65 mmHg. If you do not have invasive lines, do not wait. Initially, you can give through the uh, peripheral line, which could be a cannula in your external jugular, as well as your peripheral cannulas, which can be a large bowl vein. Uh, uh, and uh, preferably, this should be below the anticubital vein, and it can be used up to six hours. So definitive therapy, definitely the lines would be required, but till the help arrives, if you don't know how to put a central line, please put peripheral cannula and give them vasopressors. Ventilatory strategies, because we all know these viruses cause respiratory failure very early in the picture. The, the lungs are the first conduit wherein these organisms get in and they cause the damage first to respiratory epithelium and all the cells involved in your respiratory system. So ventilation is something which you should be thinking about these patients. If your patient is able to tolerate 
non invasive therapy their uh, sensorium is very very good you can initially try with non invasive ventilation however do not delay invasive ventilation if you think your patient is very very sick their heart is not going to take so much of load their vasopressors are very very high to offload their other organ systems you should be intubating these patients very early which is when you will get good outcome out of these patients the special strategies to com uh, combat hypoxemic respiratory failure of course are low tidal volume ventilation avoiding frequent disconnections prone ventilations in some cases herein you are seeing a patient where she is wearing the a uh, high frequency uh, uh, oxygenation system uh, this gives much comfort to the patient and is very very useful in hypoxemic respiratory failure in covid 19 we have seen it has given us a good chance to make the uh, patient comfortable get their oxygenation levels better and to be able to give good nutrition uh, even in the presence of these gadgets around your mouth initially you can also use mask if the fio2 requirement is less than 0.4 this can be managed in the ward hfnc as i already told you this gives comfort and peace to the patient if your patient is not responding early intubation is warranted insufficient evidence is there for awake proning there are many studies in covid-19 which were done on awake proning including the niv patients however this is a very cost effective low cost measure this can be done by the conscious patient themselves and you should not be robbing them off even if uh, there is a slight benefit of using this awake proning tidal volume between 4 to 8 ml per kg predicted body weight prone ventilation minimum for 12 to 16 hours ideally 24 hours which should be looked at and refractory uh, uh, hypoxemia should be dealt in uh, dealt in with ecmo we have to deal with these kind of emergencies right in the 48 to 72 hours or in the first week of sepsis wherein we are trying to maintain our patient in a condition uh, so that they are able to pass this storm uh, uh, very well ecmo is a machine wherein the function of the lung is taken over by the machine which takes out the venous blood out of uh, the patient oxygenates it outside the body and then we put in the oxygenated blood inside the body again however this is a uh, limited availability only certain centers have the availability of ecmo in in covid 19 we all saw even with the availability of ecmo personnel ppe a lot of things uh, you know putting in these gadgets in these kind of patients was lot of clumsiness was involved so even if you have this at, at hand it is labor intensive the inclusion criteria could also include comorbidities of the patient the baseline function the contraindications wherein you have to gauge if i am putting a patient on such a big machine which is going to cost so much of cost to the patient and to your resources is my patient going to come out and stand on their feet and walk again because per se sepsis has been known to have comorbidities which linger on later into the lives of people also so ethical dile dilemmas would always be there do not hesitate to consult other persons in your units and discuss with the family the decision of the family is absolutely important in the management of every icu patient the various other strategies which have been uh, Uh, given in the latest guidelines of surviving sepsis campaign which was in the 2021 is a balanced crystallized solution in place of normal saline because higher amount of chloride will cause uh, 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 hyperchloremic acidosis in these patients do not delay vasopressors low dose intravenous hydrocortisone which is 200 mg per kg has been given a weak recommendation for patients with septic shock and hypoperfusion however this is a low cost measure and we should be using for uh, patients who are not getting better with the use of vasopressors after fluid resuscitation improved access of patients who survive to long term should be made towards the rehabilitation services as i told you they have a lot of post trauma stress disorder uh, post icu state disorders and myopathies which needs to be dealt in coming to certain immunomodulatory therapies uh, we all have seen that there are certain preventive measures which can, can be given uh, to patients of uh, especially covid 19 if we are suspecting 
that this patient is going to land up in severe sepsis, we could be giving them the option of monoclonal antibodies, which are very well known now in case of COVID-19. We have seen that uh, the hospitalization was prevented to the tune of 70 to 80 percent pre-Omicron times if these uh, patients with comorbidities who were in their mild to moderate disease were given these kind of antibodies. The current armamentarium includes sotrovimab, bet, uh, betlovimab, I know they are tongue twisters, CAS and IMT, which was readily available here in India, and we have used it to a large extent before the Omicron era. Bamlanivimab plus estemivimab, and uh, all these are the guidelines which all patients should be cho chosen. They are all the risk factors per se for sepsis, for deciding your uh, vaccination patients. They're almost same for everybody. So age more than 65, BMI more than 30, diabetes, cardiovascular, chronic lung disease, immunocompromised condition, chronic kidney uh, disease, pregnancy, sickle cell, neurodevelopmental and medical uh, related technological dependence, which includes tracheostomy positive pressure ventilation, which is long-term. Use of steroids, uh, we all know that it is not for everybody. In influenza, when we started using this uh, steroid in case of H1N1 pandemic in 2009, we did not have good outcomes because the viral replication kept on happening and the cytokine uh, milieu became bad and it led to a bad outcome uh, amongst patients, except when we are thinking of an ARDS, wherein the role comes in, in the second and third week to prevent fibrosis in such a kind of patient. However, in COVID-19, this is the only drug which has proven benefit and has mortality benefit. So if your patient is COVID-19 patient, you're suspecting COVID-19, do not hesitate to uh, do their RT-PCRs. I know during the COVID-19 pandemic, for the fear of keeping these patients in ICU, need certain kind of therapies, it is absolutely important that you keep your mind open to these kind of te uh, testing. The timing is very, very critical. We have learned our hard lessons of using steroids in COVID-19 patients very early in the picture. If it was given within first five to seven days, the picture was detrimental. The viral replication kept on happening and the size of the storm uh, in these patients became uh, bigger and bigger. Although uh, you should be using within a time frame of uh, 10 days to two weeks, it should not be made very, very late when already the fibrosis has set in and the cytokine storm has gone into an irreversible condition. The dose is known to everybody, 6 mg orally or IV once daily up to 10 days. We, although at our center, have used uh, solimedrol mostly because we were more uh, well-versed with that kind of uh, preparation. And we saw patients getting better with one mg per kg of body weight divided in two doses for all our patients. We should keep all the side effects of steroid use in mind, which includes hyperglycemia, GI bleed, hypertension, delirium, fluid retention, insomnia, and increased uh, appetite. Sleep is absolutely essential, including for ICU patients. So six to eight hours of sleep is required for body healing. And don't think it is your armamentarium. It is going to be your medicine, which is only important for your patient to get better. Sleep is very, very important for the processes of the body to get them uh, to their uh, baseline function. Recommended for patients on respiratory support, WHO recommends the use of uh, uh, systemic corticosteroids for seven to 10 days in critical COVID-19 disease. Now, this was uh, the trial which came in the recovery uh, collaborative group. We have seen uh, the, the mortality, 28 day mortality benefit of use of COVID uh, steroids in COVID-19. I'm not going to go into the details of it. Ma'am has already told you regarding the pathobiology of abnormal coagulation parameters which are associated with poor prognosis in patients with novel, novel coronavirus pneumonia. So the overall mortality was 11.5%. The non-survival uh, survivors revealed significantly higher D-dimer fibrin degradation product 
levels longer prothrombin time and activated uh, partial thromboplastin time compared to survivors on admission. The conclusion of this study which was in February 2022, was abnormal coagulation results are very, very common in these viral infections. So anticoagulation is absolutely essential for each and every of your ICU patients, but more so for your sepsis patients who have all the risk factors to get into the coagulation cascade because they are immobilized. They are very, very sick. They are hypotensive. They have microthrombi. They have endothelial dysfunction which predisposes them for these kind of problems. Although the already formed clots cannot be dissolved with this therapy, but further prevention is absolutely essential to make the clots bigger and bigger. It is recommended for all hospitalized patients, especially those on oxygen. D-dimer more than 1,000 uh, should be given uh, LMWH twice daily, otherwise once daily, although there are not many studies which have reported mortality benefits of twice daily do dosage, but our protocols for our ICU patients who are admitted with viral pneumonias, we use twice daily dosage in uh, levels which are more than 1,000. Rising D-dimer again is indicative of increased inflammation and or pulmonary embolism. So complication, very, very important. You have to undergo certain tests to rule out pulmonary thromboembolism in these patients, wherein we have seen a lot of patients who got hypoxemic progressively just because of, clot, because of a clot in the heart or in their pulmonary vasculature. Outpatient prescription of anticoagulation has to be gauged with the risk benefit ratio. If you think your patient is at risk, then please don't hesitate to prescribe oral uh, uh, agents. And also minimum, they should be used for uh, about three months wherein you have uh, proven DVT, which is a provoked DVT or uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. Now, is viral sepsis different? Now, this is not a simple question to answer. In terms of therapeutics, a large portion of it is similar to bacterial sepsis because we do not have many antiviral medications. However, there are certain causes and characteristics which could be heterogeneous and specific to viral sepsis. We all need to study them. We have positive of knowledge regarding the viral sepsis. We need to make out certain biomarkers which are lacking at present and consider them in our patients to make our antibiotic stewardship program uh, a success and also help in saving our resources and cost of the patient as well, as well as the cost of the institution and prevention of certain side effects which happen with the indiscriminate use of antibiotics even at a smaller center. Specific therapies are lacking in many infections. Uh, as ma'am already spoke about gene signatures, the precision medi medicine should come into the picture very early. These are certain transcriptome uh, uh, analysis which help us determine whether we are dealing with uh, a bacterial infection or a viral infection, especially cytokines like IL-16 and INF-alpha, which are inducible gene factors caused by viral infections. Treatment modalities are many. However, I'm going to concentrate on certain factors, including uh, uh, antiviral medication, which has to be for influenza. Now, there are four antiviral uh, medications which are recommended for influenza, which we see very, very commonly, especially in this, this season after the COVID was over. Now we are seeing a lot of patients uh, who are coming in with, with H1N1 pneumonia. So azeltamivir is very, very easily available, can be given easily orally, and the dose is 75 mg BD for five days. For prophylaxis, you have to use it OD for 10 days. Param, uh, uh, paramivir, which is intravenous, is given uh, in azeltamivir resistance, and it has to be given 600 mg single dose. However, there are certain side effects, hepatotoxicity, which needs to be kept in mind. Zanamivir is inhalational, 10 mg BD inhalational dose. Beloxomavir, 20 mg tablets, two tablets as single dose, and four tablets if your patient is more than 80 kg. We do not have much experience with all other agents because easily available one is ozeltamivir. However, I must tell you that there is no mortality benefit if your uh, patient has already gone into uh, a stage of irreversible sepsis. So the ideal position is that this should be used ideally within 48 hours of onset of symptoms, but you can use it up to uh, 
seven to 10 days also. Ebola has been uh, a pain in the neck. Uh, it has been uh, 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 seen that no antiviral medication has been working at present and recommended by the WHO for this particular infection. However, there is a single dose vaccine, which is RVSV Zebo, which is safe and protective against uh, only Zaire Ebola virus species. So there are a lot of uh, species which are in itself tongue twisters, which cause Ebola infection. These are select antiviral uh, medications and a little bit about them. Influenza, we have already seen. Respiratory syncytial virus, we have ribavirin and palivizumab. Parainfluenza, we have ribavirin. Uh, uh, of course, these are under investigation only at present. Adeno, we have ribavirin. Cytomegalo, we have gancyclovir and immunoglobulin therapy, which has to be given early in the course. However, with the want of biomarkers to identify these uh, infections and also in certain situations, patient coming late in the, into the picture, we lose many of these patients. The suspicion levels are sometimes low and we are not suspecting these uh, infections, so we lose these patients. Sidofovir, Foscarnet under investigation, very, very toxic medications. Herpes simplex, varicella zoster, we prescribe acyclovir, this is known to everybody. Remdesivir, uh, this is a, a, a broad spectrum antiviral agent which was first approved for treatment for COVID-19. This is a novel nucleoside analog which causes premature termination of viral transcription. This is used for Ebola, MERS, SARS and SARS-CoV-2. However, this is only important for SARS-CoV-2 at present because Ebola, it has not been found to be effective in reducing the damage which has already been done to the uh, patient's organ systems. This has been seen to reduce the pulmonary pathology in studies and lot of uh, confusion in the data. Certain uh, uh, studies telling you it has a mort mortality benefit and certain others refuting that there is no mortality benefit or use of remdesivir. I'm not going uh, to go into the controversy. Dose is known to everybody, 200 mg loading, 100 OD for 10 days. Uh, the, the hepatotoxicity is uh, some of the concerns which it produces should be started within seven days of uh, identification of the viral infection. Paxlovid is something which has come up for COVID-19. It reduces the hospitalization of mild to moderate patients with com comorbidities to the tune of 80 to 85%. This has been in use in the United States of America and is given there to everybody who has comorbidities. This is basically uh, nirmetrilovir uh, and retinovir co-packaged for oral use. There are two packages uh, which are coming up, 300-100 and 150-100 mg dosages which are coming up. In studies, patients 65 years or older, the rates of hospitalization and death due to COVID-19 were significantly lower than those who, received, uh, who did not receive nirmetrilovir. However, they received the placebo. This is a combined study which was done for three antiviral agents as compared to placebo. This was for Paxlovid, this was for uh, Fevipiravir and uh, Molnupiravir. So in all the studies, you, uh, in all these, you will find that the tilt is towards the uh, uh, favoring the use of these particular drugs. With uh, Molnupiravir, we have seen 30% reduction in the hospitalization of patients. Certain immunomodulators I have already spoken about, the steroids in COVID-19, tocilizumab, which has been in use for arthritis patients and uh, our rheumatology uh, uh, colleagues have been using this particular molecule for quite some time. Dr. Vini, of... we need to, uh, sorry to interrupt, we need to finish. We're I'll wind up, sir. Five minutes left. So yes. this, this blocks signal transduction and calms the inflammatory storm. We have seen uh, a lot of controversy regarding this use, but uh, later on the studies came that there was certain mortality benefit in COVID-19 infection. There are certain other uh, uh, molecules which are available for viral infections, which include sartrivimab, uh, JAK inhibitors, and silvatimiximab. Uh, uh, the convalescent plasma therapy is a subtle tool to care rather than cure. High titers are especially important and uh, these are to be preferred over low titer ones. Use is recommended as a part of clinical trials. There is no mortality benefit. 
to be used preferably within 72 hours and uh, uh, extended use towards uh, 10 days. Immunostimulators are something which are coming up, which is a proposed method of doing a selective application of immunostimulatory cytokines, which includes the IL-7 and GM uh, CSF. We do not have much details. PD-1 target uh, treatment ligands, which ma'am already spoke about. Endothelial barrier disruption prevention, wherein statins and ARBs have been in studies. However, some of these studies were uh, uh, terminated quite early in the course for the want of recruitment. Need to Symptom wind up relief now. Need is to very, wind very important. Now, Delirium psychological support, connection with the outside world, taking care of the comorbidities, prevention strategies wherein we can use vaccines and seven steps of hand hygiene should be taught to each and everybody in the ICU taking care of these patients. Preventive measures include dengue and monoclonal antibody. Uh, we are doing a phase two single blind randomized parallel group dose ranging single dose study of dengue monoclonal antibody from the Serum Institute of India in adults with dengue fever, fever wherein who are coming to us within 96 hours and we are giving them this kind of antibody. So something in the pipeline is already there. I hope uh, our country progresses more in terms of uh, producing our indigenous vaccines and uh, leading on to such an armamentarium which can prevent these infections altogether. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinnie, for uh, that elaborate uh, overview. As we are running 45 minutes late, I won't do my, uh, many comments. Just a, a couple of minutes. I think we need to look at the phenotype, you know, the clinical phenotypes which have been done in bacterial. For example, we are running a dengue epidemic now in the midst of it. There are patients with a lot of HLH type of dengue presentation, jaundice, uh, neutropenia, bicytopenia, tricytopenia, and a lot of very high mortality, almost as high as a bacterial sepsis. Similarly, COVID had so many clinical phenotypes. I think the we need to have a data set of our virals in sepsis and divide patient in different phenotypes that might tell us what are the prognosis and can we have some therapy of certain phenotypes. So with this comments, I will hand it over to Dr. Sardana to carry on the CMA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. Thank you very much for the opportunity, organizers. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, both the chairpersons and uh, Dr. Sumi, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that excellent session. Uh, we move, move on to the next session, which is session three on parasites and sepsis, unrecognized field for early action and reactions. I would like to invite the chair, uh, introduce the chairs. Dr. T.S. Jain does not need much introduction again. He is uh, president, he see, and also currently senior consultant pediatrician at Max Super Speciality Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. Sir has been past chairperson for adolescent chapter IAP and uh, also a lot of uh, IFI, HISICON conferences to 2015 organizer. He has been medical director at Max Hospitals uh, and Pushpanjali Crossley Hospitals, Veshali. He was involved in various capacities in organizing many national and international training programs, CMEs, workshops, and conferences, and uh, also orations at Ludhiana Conference. Sir, uh, again, uh, we will like to be really a really pleasure to have you with us here. Another chair for this session is Dr. Namita Jaggi. So, can we have an introductory slide as well? So, Dr. Namita is a close and dear uh, friend as well. And uh, she is currently chairperson lab services and infection control. Chief Education and Research at Artemis Hospitals, Gurugram, India. She has over 30 years of post MD experience and has led the lab and infection control departments for accreditation, various accreditations at Artemis Hospital. She has also an NABL assessor, a green OT assessor, NABH and JCI International Super Surveyor, and uh, the country secretary for INIC. 
she is also chairperson for infection control committee and secretary for antimicrobial stewardship committee at her hospital she is uh, won awards which include uh, who asia pacific hand hygiene excellence award in 2010 11 apic hero of infection prevention for the year 2012 shia international ambassador for the year 2015 and 10th adi abadi women achievers award in december 2018 she has numerous publications to her credit majorly in infection control I has authored the authored a book on microbiological theory for mlt students she is also the editor for journal of patient safety and infection control has delivered various talks uh, we have listened to her in various forums and also represented india in writing apsic guidelines for clapsi and corti So over to the chairs, please. Thank you, Sumi. Uh, the now after we have gone through, can we have uh, the speakers? I mean, now that we have discussed uh, the uh, fungal sepsis and the viral sepsis, now we are going to go for the parasites and uh, the sepsis. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Arna Pujari. Uh, can I have the introductory slide for Dr. Arna Pujari? Can I? Yes, uh, Dr. <clears throat> Karna Pujari. Uh, she is currently at Beach Candy Hospital Trust in Mumbai, head of department of the Department of Pathology and Microbiology. She is in charge of the infection control and prevention, and uh, she has a lot of international certification, infection control, broad certification of board certification in the medical and public health microbiology. delivered more than 160 guest guest lectures on infection control microbiology mm. and infectious mm. diseases in various cmes and conferences covid task force member for ima maharashtra general secretary of hospital infection society at mumbai forum i mean she has been the post gadget uh, uh, teacher for dnb for microbiology she is a lecturer for cpa cps dpb fcp s medicine and tropical diseases pg teacher for msc microbiology at mumbai university she has 46 international national peer reviewed publications and three book chapters and her primary interest is in the antimicrobial resistance and hospital infection control and as we are running behind the time i will not uh, sort of um, uh, make much of comments and uh, directly hand over to dr arna pujari please Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. Uh, and uh, I would, at the outset, like to thank uh, Dr. Aman Sardana, sir, for giving me an opportunity to be here. Um, parasites and sepsis is really a very uh, different topic, I must say, and I must thank uh, Sardana, sir, for the same. Uh, let's see what uh, uh, what we can get out of it. It was very interesting for me to prepare this particular talk. So uh, the overview of this talk is going to be. I'll very shortly introduce uh, um, uh, sepsis. Uh, there's been Um, uh, the whole background being given in the past uh, uh, two sessions, uh, we look at what are the parasites that are known to be or associated with sepsis, the risk factors, pathogenesis, and a bit on diagnostic stewardship when it comes to specifically parasitic sepsis. So we know that the key to managing um, any patient with sepsis would be uh, early identification. So you suspect sepsis early, so that this early recognition helps. um uh, early hemodynamic resuscitation and proper ventilatory management in patients of acute respiratory distress syndrome and uh, uh, since we've also seen that sepsis comprises of a, a whole lot of um, non specific signs and symptoms uh, it's very important to suspect the probable pathogen that might be responsible for um, uh, for the episode of sepsis so this will allow us early adequate and appropriate antimicrobial therapy to be given which plays a key role and of course source control if um, 
there is a source which is identified and if you look at this particular diagram here uh, while bacterial sepsis uh, takes away the chunk of patients uh, who land up in sepsis uh, fungi uh, is also very much suspected but unfortunately uh, viruses and parasitic sepsis are probably not really in our minds when you really look after uh, when you come across a patient of uh, presenting with features of sepsis so uh, human parasites uh, can be cl broadly classified into protozoa and helminths and um, amongst these human parasites the two that have been documented in literature to be associated with sepsis are basically plasmodium species and strongyloides tercoralis so who is really at risk of parasitic sepsis i think that's something which is very important a patient of sepsis uh, uh, comes um, um uh, is seen and it, it needs to be one needs to en uh, ensure that uh, risk factors are identified so uh, uh, any person who lives in the endemic zone uh, a returning traveler this is particularly important in uh, in the west where um, uh, parasitic diseases are not very common children less than 5 years pregnant women hospitalized patients on immunosuppressive drugs hiv aids has traditionally been one of the uh, uh, important risk factors and uh, a whole lot of other uh, comorbidities like liver cirrhosis cancer kidney disease autoimmune diseases and ace clinic patients so what we gather from here is that history taking seems to be the most important aspect of uh, you know suspecting sepsis and suspecting the probable pathogen and keeping uh, 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 the microbiology diagnosis in mind so let's look at uh, malarial sepsis so malarial sepsis as seen here uh, uh, is very very uh, complex um, in nature and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it, there are overlapping syndromes of uh, severe anemia cerebral malaria and respiratory distress and typically it is associated with uh, severe falciparum malaria where host factors leading to endothelial dis dis uh, dysfunction and tissue hypoxemia cause uh, um, Uh, ARDS the whole the parasite mass biomass causes inflammation and uh, uh, that can lead to uh, again tissue hypoxia leading to cerebral malaria and sequestration and suppressed erythropoiesis causing uh, severe anemia and all of this the end result basically is going to be release of cytokines endothelial damage organ failure and then finally death and that is precisely the reason why severe falciparum malaria um, probably fits into uh, the definitions of um, uh, sepsis here again uh, uh, plenty of similarities in clinical features of severe uh, uh, falciparum malaria as well as uh, patients with sepsis so it's very important that Uh, uh in a patient who presents with sepsis at least in certain risk groups and uh, endemic zones uh, uh, severe malaria should also be taken into consideration so let's look at a study coming from southwestern uganda which is um, an endemic zone for malaria and they looked at it from the point of view of uh, um, how frequently it caused adult sepsis and um, surprisingly about 3% of their definitive meaning uh, uh, definitive diagnosed uh, diagnosed uh, uh, patients of sepsis were actually malaria and uh, uh, in 8% of their patients who presented as sepsis uh, malaria was a presumptive diagnosis what was important was the mortality rate was more than 10% in each of these um, category so uh, while uh, malaria is an uncommon cause of uh, adult onset sepsis uh, the authors said that it requires attention uh, in patients who have risk factors and should be included as a differential in uh, in the endemic zone this is another interesting study and uh, dr vinny mentioned about few sofa scores that is quick uh, sequential organ function uh, uh, assessment scores which are so important when you are assessing a patient of sepsis so this was a four year study from thailand where they classified all patients with quick quick sofa scores of more than 2 uh, within 24 hours of uh, admission as sepsis uh, more than 4900 patients were enrolled so it was a huge study and they found once again about 3% of their patients who were defined uh, who were classified as sepsis to be having uh, a malarial sepsis of which 48% were falciparum 45% was were uh, vivax which is a surprise and about 7% of them had mixed infections and of these 52% had severe malarial sepsis and of the severe malarial sepsis 84% has had q sofa scores of more than 2 so again the authors said that uh, it's important to keep malarial sepsis as a uh, as a differential diagnosis in endemic zones especially in patients who presented with more than a q sofa of more than 2 uh, so while malaria uh, malarial sepsis is uncommon q, q sofa scores can certainly serve as a hint 
especially to include it in differentials based on geography of endemicity as well as if you have a patient within the risk group. Moving on to the next parasite, that is Strongyloides torporalis. So this was a very interesting case coming from French Antilles of uh, a man who was a 57-year-old alcoholic who presented with septic shock. Um, he was uh, diagnosed to have uh, a pneumonia and uh, diarrhea for which he was treated with multiple antimicrobial uh, agents. Uh, his blood culture grew to organisms, proteus and uh, st uh, staph epidermidis, while his endotracheal secretions uh, grew hemophilus influenzae and E. coli. So broad spectrum uh, uh, antimicrobials were given. He was also given high dose steroids, basically from the point of view of managing his sepsis. Uh, subsequently, over the week, he became clinically stable. He was extubated, but his diarrhea persisted. Unfortunately, two days after his extubation, the patient landed up with aspiration pneumonia and a hypoxic cardiac arrest. Um, microbiology cultures that were sent at that point in time showed uh, uh, enterococcus fecalis in blood cultures, uh, myroidus in the endotracheal secretions. And we all know myroidus is, a, is basically an environmental pathogen, a non-fermenter, uh, non an opportunist. And his uh, uh, bowel was done, which showed uh, larval forms of strongyloidus torcoralis. Subsequently, even the stool sample that was sent showed, showed larval forms of strongyloidus torcoralis. Unfortunately, this patient passed away because of hyperinfection syndrome and septic shock. And uh, the authors uh, make a comment that, you know, they probably missed out on uh, uh, on uh, the fact that French Antilles, from where this patient had come in, was actually an endemic zone for um, for uh, uh, strongyloidus uh, circularis. So here in this case, again, uh, the GI tract symptoms really took a backseat versus the, uh, the, uh, the respiratory symptoms. Um, the polymicrobial nature of, uh, you know, organisms in the uh, blood and the respiratory culture should have actually pointed out to something else that was going on and maybe uh, some kind of uh, GI leak. Um, or gut translocation that was happening. Um, and the high dose uh, steroids that were given to manage his first episode of sepsis, frankly speaking, led to um, uh, the dissemination of strongyloidus uh, uh, sercoralis from the, from the gut. Uh, this was an interesting paper that looked at um, uh, strongyloidus hyperinfection syndrome, which we know uh, for many years uh, as uh, uh, an opportunistic pathogen. So basically in an immunocompetent individual, um, uh, strongyloidus uh, uh, filariform larvae penetrate through intact skin, access the venous circulation, enter into the lung, perforate the alveoli, go into the bronchi, and from there, uh, reaching the pharynx, and then they get swallowed, uh, reaching the gut where the filariform larvae convert into um, rhabditiform larvae, which further can either be shed into stool or they will convert back into the filariform larvae and then uh, lead to a sequence of auto infection. Uh, fortunately, in an immuno immunocompetent host, all of this gets controlled. Um, so the infection is controlled. They could be asymptomatic. And uh, when the risk of hyperinfection in an immunocompetent individual um, uh, is, is low, and all of this is possible because the innate and the adaptive immunity uh, uh, comes into picture and uh, is able to control the multiplication of, uh, of strongyloidus sercoralis. So whether it is um, innate immunity in terms of neutrophils, macrophages, complements uh, um, uh, versus the adaptive immunity that comprises of Th2 uh, uh, arm of the immune system uh, and uh, plenty of uh, cytokines being released. And uh, so together, both of these innate and the adaptive immunity actually keep the um, uh, strongyloidus from multiplying into larger proportions and uh, preventing dissemination. But what really happens in a patient who gets immunocompromised, it could be disease-related immunocompromised, uh, infection-related immunocompromised status like HTLV or HIV. It could be simply malnutrition, which is very common in our country. It could be corticosteroids, which we often give in so many different kinds of conditions. Or it could be alcoholism, which is also not a rarity in our, uh, uh, in our country. And all of these, uh, um, of course, lead to uh, some amount of... Uh, 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 delayed or uh, uh, dysregulated responses, both at the uh, level of immu the innate immunity as well as the adaptive immunity, causing chronic infection, uncontrollable proliferation, hyperinfection, and dissemination. And post dissemination, of course, the dissemination happens through the gut wall, and that can further lead to bacteremia, sepsis, organ dysfunction, and death. 
So strongyloid is uh, uh, unlike malaria, which is uh, probably associated as a community acquired sepsis. One should, when uh, when thinking about strongyloidus, it could be both primarily coming from the community, or it could be something which develops subsequently once a patient has got immunocompromised due to drugs which we have uh, um, given to the patient as the case, uh, uh, previous case uh, uh, we saw. And we've also seen this in plenty during the COVID era where uh, there are uh, reports from all across the world uh, of uh, strongyloidus turcoralis uh, dissemination and uh, deaths following immunosuppressive therapy, be it corticosteroids or be it uh, the biological agents. In fact, I was um, also surprised to see this meta-analysis, which looks at comparison of trials using ivermectin uh, for COVID-19 between uh, regions with high and low prevalence. And they found that the ivermectin trial that took place in areas of high regional strongyloidosis prevalence were actually associated with significantly decreased risk of mortality. And that was versus what they found in um, in areas where uh, uh, this was not uh, an endemic parasite. Uh, so, you know, why should we really, uh, uh, you know, go about uh, trying to identify parasitic sepsis? Uh, because unlike uh, viruses, as we have heard, parasites have specific antiparasitic therapy available. And unless uh, you treat the, um, uh, the parasite, now the parasite, um, you know, uh, uh, mortality is going to be very, very uh, rapid. And uh, in fact, untreated uh, uh, strongyloidus can, can lead to 100% mortality, they say. And uh, uh, in addition, both malaria as well as strongyloidus uh, is associated with the uh, uh, bacteremias, and that itself can cause uh, shock and, uh, uh, and death. So a bit on diagnostic stewardship, and we will specifically discuss this with respect to uh, parasitic sepsis. So what is really diagnostic stewardship? According to the IDSA, uh, it means ordering the right tests for the right patient at the right time to inform optimal clinical care. So here in case of parasitic sepsis, diagnostic stewardship ensures that patients with risk factors or those patients who fall into the risk groups are considered while assessing patients of sepsis and uh, uh, they are included, uh, parasites are included in the differential diagnosis of uh, uh, the etiology for uh, uh, sepsis. So, uh, frankly, unlike uh, bacteria, fungi, or viruses, uh, uh, parasitic diagnosis, microbiology diagnosis still remains very, very simple. These tests are available to all of us to the remotest of the places, and uh, they don't, uh, uh, are they not heavy on instrumentation? So, be it a stool routine, be it a wet mount of respiratory secretion, some special staining techniques, peripheral blood smears, use of rapid antigen tests, and naturally molecular assays uh, um, are in the pipeline, and some of them are already there. So all of these, uh, in fact, can uh, very easily diagnose and very rapidly diagnose uh, uh, parasitic sepsis. All that one needs to uh, do is ensure that you have a high degree of suspicion in an end endemic zone and in patients who fall into the risk category. So uh, with parasitic uh, uh, sepsis, microscopy still remains a cornerstone for parasite, parasite uh, diagnosis. And that should be uh, kept in mind. And this um, is very useful even in low resource settings. So finally, to conclude, uh, amongst the most common parasites that are responsible for sepsis are Plasmodium and Strongyloidus mm. turcoralis. Diagnostics is fairly simple and easily available, uh, even in low resource settings. What is needed is a high degree of suspicion amongst the risk groups and in uh, endemic zones. Uh, what's very, very important is ensure constant communication uh, between the laboratory and the clinical team who's managing a patient of sepsis uh, in order to ensure uh, better clinical outcomes uh, when um, uh, parasitic sepsis is suspected. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you. I think Dr. T. S. Chen uh, would like to give some comments. Okay, I think we can go on to the next uh, uh, next speaker, and post that we can give. Uh, uh, I'll I'll be you know sharing with you some of my comments. 
So we have Dr. Sudha Kansal, who is a senior consultant respiratory and critical care medicine in the Prasta Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. She was the past coordinator of the medical ICU. She's the member of the Infection Control Society and teacher of FNB critical care medicines. She has over 50 publications in index international journals and textbooks. We invite Dr. Sudha Kansal to deliver her talk on parasitic sepsis, when to think and how to manage parasite-induced SIRS and sepsis can we do without antibacterial agents? Over to you, Dr. Sudha Kansal. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the nice introduction. Good evening, friends, and a distinguished chairperson. At the, can I be allowed to sh uh, share my screen, ma'am? Yes, please. Yeah, so at the outside, is it visible and no, am I audible? Oh, ma'am, ma please share screen. I've done it. Have you got your presentation on the on the desktop, Sudha? Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, great. Then you will share it in a minute. And please screen? click. Then please click on uh, share screen button. Yeah, I have done that. Just a minute. Have you opened your presentation and minimized yes. it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have done it. Just a minute. Just a minute. What's happening? Relax. Okay. Yes, I'll call okay. for help. In ICU, you always call for help whenever there's a problem. Yes. Let's do that. Can one of the organizers from here help her? I am in a different place, ma'am. I know. Uh, at the outset, and I will, I'll just try to have it. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Raman Sardana for this opportunity. And also, I'll take an opportunity. Yeah, there we have it. Yes, now. Yeah. Yeah, it's seen? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, okay. And I Please also... start a slide, not... ma'am. Yeah, okay. I will not miss this opportunity to thank Dr. Raman Sardana and Dr. Lina and their team for an excellent laboratory support backup, you know, Anytime we call Dr. Lina, she's there all 24 hours and helping us, which makes management of our patients so useful and so easy. So we had a lot of slides on sepsis. So as we know, this is a dysregulated host response to infection. In fact, when Dr. Sardana gave me this topic for next two days, I was just thinking about it because there's very less data. I searched up to date, I searched PubMed, I also searched Indian Journal. But then I discussed with them, and then finally we came to some conclusion. And I'm going to give a real life uh, cases which we managed together. So, as you see here, the Global Burden of Disease study reported that in 2017, an estimated almost 49 million incident cases of sepsis were reported, and there were about 11 million deaths, which represents 19% of all the global deaths. We are identifying sepsis more and more. The previous speakers also said that we use so far, few so far, and also there's an advancing age. So they are at higher risk for sepsis, increased use of immunosuppression because of post-transplant patients, also advances in malignancy treatment. Also there's emergence of multi-drug resistant infection, which are difficulty, uh, which are difficult to treat and increased detection as we came across because of various parameters and easy scoring system which is available. So if you look at the data on etiological agent of sepsis, we all know that bacteria are the commonest. Gram negative still in India are the major majority followed by gram positive, though the share of gram positive bacteria is rising now. Fungal sepsis is identified more and more these days also because of the risk factors. Also, we spoke, we discussed about viral sepsis also. But in about half of the patients, etiology is not known. And even sepsis guideline, all, all these you know, good papers do not talk about parasitic sepsis. So maybe a small fraction of patient in this group could be due to parasitic sepsis, which unless we think of and we investigate, we will not be able to diagnose and we can lose these patients. Then I looked at IndyCAPS data, which is the largest registry for infections in the ICUs. 
where they identified over 1000 organisms 69 persons were gram negative 16 percent were gram positive about 7.5 percent were fungi and as you see here malarial parasite 1.1 percent but even they are not talking about other parasites which could be causing sepsis so then we thought we'll go through our experience and present some cases here dr aruna ma'am has already covered the theoretical part it's so beautifully, so I'm not going to talk much on that. I'm just going to show you our cases. So uh, parasites we know is an organism that lives on or in a host and gets its food from or at expense of the host. There are three main classes of parasite that cause disease in human, protozoa, helmin, and ectoparasite. Protozoa, the important ones are Leishmaniasis and Plasmodium, which can cause sepsis. Helminths are, I would say that they are to some extent our friends also because they do immunomodulation and they can protect us from secondary bacterial infections. And third are these ectoparasites, which are small organisms that live on the outside of the body. They can cause disease by themselves or they can act as a transmitter of disease, which is a major factor why the infection spreads and these patients can have sepsis. So the question is, do parasites cause sepsis? So we had some examples, some cases, real-time cases, so we'll discuss that. So this was a 65-year-old patient, resident of Bihar, a diabetic, presented to emergency with three days history of high-grade fever with chills, rigors, vomiting, headache, and body ache. He had a fever of 103 degree Fahrenheit, heart rate was 124, respiratory rate was 38, blood pressure was borderline 100 by 64. He was drowsy, he was ectric, there was no rash, systemic examination only revealed a mild hepatomegaly, there was no neck stiffness, no focal deficit. So as we always think, first differential diagnosis is, is it a viral fever, dengue, rickettsia, uh, dengue, uh, chikungunya, or some hemorrhagic fever, or is it a bacterial sepsis, is a diabetic patient, elderly, so it could just be a urosepsis, they can just present with urinary symptoms, uh, without, they can present without urinary symptoms, or even a pneumonia, or tropical fever. In, India, whenever we have a patient, we must always think of tropical fever when a patient present with the short history. So investigation showed a hemoglobin of 8.5 gram, CLC was normal, platelets were low, 80,000, platinum was deranged, 1.8, bilirubin, SGOTPT was raised, there was hyperlactatemia, procalcitonin was 1.5, and we checked for malaria antigen, which was positive and the peripheral blood film was positive for falciparum malaria. So with this excellent lab support, we could diagnose this within 12 hours of admission. We treated him with artesunate and ceftriaxone and a good critical care with fluid resuscitation, as I told you, was tachycardic, febrile, hypotensive. So good fluid resuscitation, care of airway, breathing. Uh, he recovered in five days and he was shifted out of ICU after seven days. So it is very important that we timely diagnose these cases of uh, tropical fever and accordingly start the therapy. Now, why did we use ceftriaxone? That is always a debatable thing. But initially, till we have the report and we stopped ceftriaxone after five days, but we did use it for five days. So Madam has already told us about malaria. In, nine, in 2020, an estimated 241 million cases of malaria occurred worldwide and 627,000 uh, 627, people died. And it was mostly children in sub, uh, Saharan Africa. So we know that India is an endemic zone for malaria. And the maximum incidence in India is in uh, Andhra Pradesh. So the Southeast Asia data is there are 4.2 million estimated malaria cases. Out of that, more than 7,000 estimated death. India accounted for a total of 83% of estimated malaria cases and 82% of estimated malaria death. So it is very important that we have the malaria in the differential diagnosis of these patients 
uh, and he diagnose it early, investigate them accordingly. I think uh, this I don't need to say, but what I would like to say is a few words about complicated malaria. See, complicated malaria behaves like any sepsis, you no, know, any bacterial sepsis. It has got involvement of different organs. If it's a cerebral malaria, you have abnormal behavior, impairment of consciousness, seizure, coma, other neurological abnormalities. Patient can present with ARDS. He can have a DIC. They can present with hypotension due to cardiovascular collapse, or they can have acute kidney injury or a severe metabolic acidosis and hypoglycemia. So there is no sign or symptom which is specific for malaria, but all these things also happen in a bacterial sepsis. So it is very important that we think of parasitic sepsis in the patients who come to our uh, uh, hospitals so that we can have a timely diagnosis and better outcome. Now about the uh, question on do, should we give antibiotic to all these patients? Now, it is known that in children, the prevalence of concomitant bacteria with severe malaria is very high. However, in adults, only if the parasitic count is very high, I mean more than 20%, then all these patients must be given antibiotic. Otherwise, if you can closely monitor the patient, no comorbidities, you may not give antibiotic. Again, you know, it's easier said than done. But uh, this is just a thought, you know, we have to titrate it and uh, uh, customize it to our patient. But at least do not give very high antibiotics, you know. Do not start with Piptas or Penems and Picoplanin or some gram-positive cover. You know, just give them a baseline, uh, a basic broad-spectrum antibiotic, especially if they're coming from community. So the some clinical pearls for uh, complicated malaria, geographical location of patient is very important. We know Bihar is one of the endemic city for malaria. Decent history of travel to endemic area must be taken. High index of suspicion is important. Syndromic recognition is important. And timely diagnosis and treatment with antimalarial improve the outcome of the patient. And it, is, it requires as good critical care as any bacterial or fungal sepsis. And role of antibiotic, I told you, at least my, uh, my suggestion is we should at least not use high-end antibiotic in these patients. So this is our case two, a 55-year-old military person, a known asthmatic and hypertensive, came to emergency with one week history of progressive shortness of breath, fever and cough. He was febrile, tachypneic. Blood pressure was 110 by 70, a little low for a patient who was hypertensive, saturation of 95%, and there were bilateral extensive V's. Uh, he had already received treatment. He, as I told you, there was a one-week history. So he was already on OPD treatment with amoxiclav, inhalers, bronchodilators, and oral steroid for three days. As patient was not improving, he came to try it for worsening breathlessness. Investigation showed mild leukocytosis counts were about 13,000 with uh, neutrophil of 90%. Renal kidney and liver functions were normal. Procalcitonin was 5.6 and the X-ray showed a right lower zone pneumonia. So we started, he had already received amoxiclav. So we started him on ceftriaxone and azithromycin, intravenous azithromycin, nebulization and IV solumedrol, 40 milligram twice a day. He showed initial improvement, but on day seven, he developed worsening of hypoxemia, also hypotension, and XA was suggestive of ARDS. So because he was worsening, he was also getting hypotensive, we electively intubated him, and antibiotics were escalated to meropenem and ticoplanin after sending the cultures, blood and the ET cultures. We did an X-ray, uh, CT scan, which showed multifocal opacities in both the lungs, so a diagnosis of ARDS was uh, suggestive. We did a bronchoscopy with bile. Stains were negative for bacteria and fungus, but we got a call from microbiology saying that they are seeing these larvae. So this was a case of strongidoidis larvae, which had developed in this patient who was a immunocompromised patient. 
had developed uh, had received steroids and there was a history of travel to sri lanka which was a endemic zone for strongylides after having this we sent the stool sample for strongylides cercoralis which was positive here we took the history i'm sorry is for bangladesh so the history revealed that he had traveled to marshy fields of bangladesh about two months back and that may be the place where he acquired this uh, uh, parasite and after he received steroids you know he had uh, uh, symptomatic strongyloides we checked his hiv and hdlv2 which were both negative because by now his spasm had settled we stopped steroid and ivermectin was started patient improved and extubated after 5 days so what are the risk factor for strongyloides cercoralis madam has already covered it but you know i have divided into condition associated with impairment of cell mediated immunity like hdlv1 infection hiv if you look at the literature you know they are very different some say that hiv is not a common risk factor some say it is anyway we always check hiv in such patients malignancy and malignancy treatment hypogamma globulinemia congenital immunodeficiency alcoholism and malnutrition and travel to endemic area and this travel could have been you know few years back also so it could be a, as madam showed immunocompetent patient it can just remain without being active and you can just have a auto infection repeatedly again about uh, the second thing is medical intervention associated with immunosuppression like administration of corticosteroid cytotoxic drug pnf inhibitors and solid organ transplantation now if you look at the literature it's not necessary that the patient should have received corticosteroid for a long time even 8 to 10 even they say 5 to 10 days of corticosteroid can exacerbate uh, strongyloides in the patient so our diagnosis of this case was bronchial hyperresponsiveness presumed to be an asthma exacerbation which was complicated by pneumonia and subsequently sepsis and ards whether it was a bacterial or a parasitic uh, sepsis of course we continued our antibiotics and uh, ivermectin when the patient subsequently improved now there is a some data which says that uh, clinical features i'm not going to uh there's a there's a data it says even madam showed that when it translocates from the gut into the systemic circulation they it can carry gram negative bacteria with it so in such patient if there's a suspicion of infection you should give them antibiotic also along with uh antiparasitic treatment and as as soon as you have a suspicion of strongyloides hyperstimulation syndrome you must immediately start antiparasitic treatment because if not treated the mortality rate is as high as 87% so some clinical pearl is a pertinent epidemiological background and if conventional therapy and broad spectrum antibiotic is failing please do think about uh, parasitic infection suspect in critically ill patient with immunocompromised state who are not improving it's very important to have a high index of suspicion and epidemiological risk assessment are the cornerstone so go back take history you know i think 70 to 80 percent of the time the diagnosis is made in history so those who are my junior colleagues please you know always take a good history don't be a computer don't treat reports you have to treat the patient so always go back and take good history we already always learned that neurology history is important but i say that history is important in each and every field in medicine and if you take a good history maybe we miss something but if your patient is not responding go back and explore more thing all these patient history of travel is very very important occupation is very very important so please take a good healthy history and his view of travel and occupation also and as soon as you think have a clinical suspicion alert the microbiologist about your clinical suspicion and it should be considered in patient from tropical countries presenting with severe sepsis and both respiratory and digestive disease even long after any travel at risk area
And the studies have shown that uh, strongyloides hyperstimulation syndrome, the respiratory symptoms were more present than the digestive system. So of course the entry is through the gut, but the symptoms can be in, if they are more common in the lung. Now the third and a you know, very interesting case again, and of course Dr. Sardara was always there for our help. So this was a 28 year old resident of Faridabad. She had no comorbidities. She was admitted with history of high grade fever, throat pain, body ache, and wound on the right forearm for 10 days. She was admitted initially to a nearby hospital where she underwent debridement and fasciotomy. They started her on piprazilin, tazobactam, and clindamycin. But the patient was not improving, continued to be febrile, also tachycardic, became a little drowsy, so she was shifted to Indipasapolo Hospital. A local examination showed an incised, I'm sorry, I don't have the picture, but uh, there was an incised wound with black discoloration of skin, skin with slough. Already she had undergone debridement and systemic examination only showed a hepatomegaly. Investigation revealed a hemoglobin of 10, TLC was about 2300, and platelets were 50,000, and a deranged KFT, LFT, and hyperlactatemia. So we asked her whether there was any travel history, because she was not getting better with the conventional therapy. She gave a history of travel to Uganda one month back and an insect bite. Peripheral smear was sent and it showed hemoflagellates. Now, in view of clinical profile, diagnosis of African trypanosomiasis was made. Pentamidin was started, but as we do not have much experience, I'll say we have no experience of treating these patients. We spoke to a doctor in Africa who said that you should start suramin rather than pentamidin. We took about three days to procure suramin, but we could give it after that. And also the blood sample was sent to IVRI Bareilly, where it was confirmed to be trypanosomiasis. So this was the uh, peripheral blood film. No, these are flagellated unicellular parasite. Uh, after 48 hours of this, patient developed increased fever and developed respiratory distress. He, she went into ARDS. So this time we thought whether it's a sepsis or fluid overload or whether it was an immunological reaction. We sent repeat cultures. Surgical review was taken. Procalcitonin was sent, which was 1.09, and CRP was over 100. It was some 109 or so. We also did a 2, 2D echo to look for cardiac status and hemodynamics, which was normal. So we upgraded the antibiotic to meropenem and lidinic and solumetrol is added. You know, so at this time, we were really perplexed. You know, this disease, which is totally new, we have never treated it. What is happening? You know, so of course, we did think that it has happened so soon after giving suramin. So whether it is some immunological reaction to that. So along with upgrading the antibiotic, we gave solumetrol also. And in 48 hours, her fever started to come down. Her oxygenation got better. She was requiring about 10 liters of oxygen, which got came down to four liters. And even symptomatically, she was feeling much better. So I'll just show you what data we could get from the net on trypanosomiasis. Others, madam has covered, so I thought I'll take five minutes, maybe maximum. So I human- think, uh, I think, Sudha, you can just wind up quickly. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it is a uh, trypanosomiasis is a human African trypanosomiasis, also known as sleeping illness. It is caused by trypanosoma brucei rhodesiens and trypanosoma brucei cambiens. Rhodesiens is known to cause acute illness. Cambiens is less commonly. It causes more of uh, chronic illness. However, almost 80% of cases have Gambian's positivity there in Africa. Both are, both coexist in Uganda. Okay. 
otherwise there is a geographical distribution but both can occur in uganda and there are two stages first stage is hemato uh, hematological and lymphatic lymphatic uh, uh, they are there in blood and lymphatics and it's like any other symptoms you know any fever but there is also lymphadenopathy in second stage it is mainly involvement of the brain which causes meningoencephalitis the diagnosis i think my microbiologist colleague know it more but for rhodesians peripheral blood film is a very sensitive uh, uh, test whereas for gambians you need to do a screening and a confirmatory test the treatment in the first stage for gambians is pentamidine whereas for rhodians is suramin however it is described in the literature that in rare instances suramin administration results in hypersensitivity reaction so initially you must give a small test dose prior to giving the full dose and this is more common if they are also suffering from oncocerciasis which is again common in africa and second stage nect and melarsoprol anyway all these medications are not available however if you have a patient you can get it through who so just to summarize parasitic sepsis does exist though uncommon a good clinical history to look for risk factors in appropriate setting is important to diagnose these cases early appropriate therapy is vital all sers is not sepsis so you must be vigilant to look for other causes of sers and parasite like helminths you know they are immunomodulator and they protect you from secondary infections thank you so much thank you thank you dr sudha and thank you dr aruna they were excellent lectures can we stop the screen share uh, yeah. dr sudha can you stop yeah, the screen yeah, share yeah. so uh, i think dr jain uh, probably had to leave for somewhere so i think i'll cover both the things now uh, first of all raman thank you very much for having this uh, this unusual topic and i think it has put everybody to read which is very good and think out of the box so that's excellent now uh, like i see it if i just summarize the parasites and sepsis we can see four big buckets you know one is that the parasites cause sepsis per se like strongyloides has been reported plasmodium falciparum dr sudha has just talked about trypanosomes and there could be other case reports also that is the first one the second one is that these parasites do cause tissue damage especially in the gut and then they compromise the pulmonary or the gut um, uh, the lining and therefore they can take the microbiota the gram negatives into the uh, blood stream and i'll talk about each one of them very briefly considering that we have a time constraint the third one uh, is of course diagnostic stewardship and what we really need to uh, you know diagnose these things and they are simple things but what we need to concentrate on and the last but not the least what you just mentioned in passing sudha was about the immunomodulatory effect of the helminth so these are the four buckets which i'll talk about now starting with strongyloides of course as you have emphasized and aruna has emphasized history taking is extremely important you know this uh, strongyloides is a cosmopolitan neglected disease and we have more than 100 million people across the globe living with this strongyloides and it has got a very peculiar uh, nature that it causes auto infection so you know because of this even a travel just like you mentioned even 50 years before that can actually they can just be dormant and then they can cause auto infection and then they can cause disease that is the other very peculiar thing we have case reports i came across a very interesting study from aims rishikesh where they have taken 166 cases of strongyloides starting from 20 2001 to 2018 so for 17 18 years they were looking at that this was a study by paul et al and it's a wonderful study to read you uh, i think aruna uh, talked about this uh, the um, the study from france we have studies from velour and all of them point to one thing that a high index of suspicion has to be there when you look for parasitic causes of sepsis because there is i mean they, they, they it's very difficult to differentiate the sepsis caused by parasites and caused by the bacteria the number two thing is that when you have a history of gastrointestinal and respiratory symptoms please be on high alert for strongyloides tercoralis because this is the life cycle of the of the worm 
The third case is when you are talking about a diagnosis of strongyloides and when you look at the stool routine. Now, I don't think that one time looking at the stool routine is enough. There was a study in which in the fifth or the sixth attempt to look at the stool, they found the larva. So keep on looking at the stool uh, routine and there should be proper expertise of the person also who is looking at it. And this is not to say that when we are doing blood cultures, where have, you only have about 30-40% positivity, the adequate blood must be taken to look for this. So diagnostic stewardship becomes extremely important in these cases. Immunocompetence and immunocompromised. If you have a patient who is immunocompromised, whether the person is taking steroids, malignancy, transplantation, or HIV or HDLV or whatever. Again, a high index of strongyloides, especially if the person is coming from an endemic area like Brazil, like Thailand, even in India, you'll be surprised. I mean, some of, I was at least surprised that there's possibly not even as, I mean, one or two states which don't have cases of strongyloides, rest it is spread in the entire India. Talking about hyperinfection and dissemination in, uh, in strongyloides. So hyperinfection is when it stays in its proper life cycle and dissemination is when it goes out of its normal life cycle and disseminated is the one which really causes septic shock. Whereas the hyperinfection causes, um, you know, something which is mimicking asthma or which is suddenly having asthma. Another, pro another point which I want to discuss is eosinophilia is, does not really denote any uh, severity of the infection. So, you know, if it's there or not there, please look at the other things. The other cases of diagnosis of strongyloides is, of course, the sputum. I think uh, we, you know, we, we just sort of did not mention it. Sputum also sometimes shows these larvae and the filariform larvae. The stool shows rabidiform larvae. So stool examination, sputum examination, bowel fluid, please be very careful. Serology for strongyloides, not highly recommended, but if a person is coming from an endemic area, please have it in mind for the larval stage three, we must do the serology. Withholding steroid therapy. Now, if you are not sure that you, know, you have a strongyloides, please uh, withhold the steroid therapy unless you uh, diagnose because that can cause uh, you know, really a flare up. So uh, these are something about strongyloides. Then about malaria. Now, uh, I think uh, Aruna mentioned in passing, I think you mentioned that in children, there is a high chances of concomitant bacterial infection. So the WHO has recommended giving of antibiotics along with the severe falciparum malaria infection. It has not been done in adults. There is not, it's not there in the guidelines. But of course, if you see a blood film positive, if you see a rapid antigen test positive, of course, you can think of giving antibiotics. So malaria is more of a, a diagnosis where you can have concomitant bacterial infection. Strongyloides is more, you know, it's, in children also you can see, but sometimes it's alone also, but strongyloides can itself cause. So I think a high index of suspicion here has to be maintained. Coming on to the second point, the tissue disruption. Now, when you have tissue disruption, you have the translocation of these things. So when we study in textbooks, we have viruses, we have bacteria, we have fungus, we have parasites. In the real world, they are all living together. So one can influence the other. We can have concomitant infections and we must take it into consideration. We've talked about SIRS a lot, but just after SIRS comes the CARS, the compensatory anti-inflammatory. Now here, the parasites can have two-way function. Sometimes they can go the TH2 response and they can suppress the CARS, in which case more dormant infections will come. If they suppress the SIRS, then of course they can, and sometimes they can have better, you can have, you know, the bacterial sepsis becoming a little better because they are suppressing that. So these two, and this is mostly seen in cases of the helminths, and this is mostly in, uh, seen in cases of immunomodulation seen by the cystosomiasis. In fact, uh, at places it is said that uh, in the Western communities where you have less of these uh, parasitic infections, probably the bacterial sepsis can have more of an effect. So we must keep that in mind. And coming on to the last aspect, which is about diagnostic stewardship, you know, I think we must um, move on to the molecular methods on the one hand and look at the metagenomics to find out all the bacteria which can be there, 16S metagenomics, or look at the syndromic analysis. But at the same time, we must not leave a good stool examination a good uh, bowel examination, a microscopic examination of the bowel, a microscopic examination and repeatedly of the stool of the bowel, 
etc where we must look for uh, you know signs of uh, a, a parasitic infection so uh, i think uh, with this we uh, you know we we come to the very fascinating world of parasites and sepsis and because parasites have a dual uh, you know response in cases of sepsis one must be very very sure that uh, whether it's a concomitant infection whether we want to give antibiotics whether we want to give antiparasitic but also in the guidelines as of now in pal plasmodium falciparum in the children in severe pal falciparum we must give uh, the uh, antibiotics okay. but we must of course keep the antimicrobial stewardship also in mind and also must not unnecessarily this uh, this uh, seminar should not prompt us to go back and start giving ivermectin or start giving you know the anti malarial drugs but it must be uh, it must make us very very aware and have a very high index of suspicion for these parasites so with that uh, we come to an end of this Please. very very interesting session and uh, thank you very much uh, for um, making me a part of this uh, for the organizers uh, raman dr jain lena and um, we go on i hand it over now to the uh, to sumi to carry on the further so dr raman you want to comment something so you want to raman wanted to say something no comments please i am waiting for people to just finish off and then uh, you know the other speakers and uh, yes are, uh, yes yeah, yes yes, yes. i think we should go ahead yeah we yeah, should please. go ahead thank you okay. thank you okay okay so we'll quickly move on to session 4 which is the brass tacks and we have interesting topics here again we have on hand hygiene and antimicrobials and sterilization disinfection etc i'll introduce the chairs we have three chairs for this session can we have the introductory slide please so first uh, we have professor dr anjum farana uh, professor and hod department of microbiology government medical college shrinagar uh, total teaching experience of 29 years teaching experience she has been an examiner for mbbs bds and also for exam uh, post graduate subjects in shrinagar gmc shrinagar she was head of the state reference lab for hiv testing for whole kashmir division of ladakh since 2002 till date she started molecular testing both at influenza and covid lab for year two in year 2017 she has been member secretary of infection control committee and ethical committee at kashmir institute of medical sciences shrinagar uh, she has been investigator principal investigator at uh, vrdl lab gmc shrinagar Uh, she has several publications and has organized various events to her credit she has received the lieutenant governor's gold medal for honesty integrity and meritorious public services on 74th independence day that's interesting and nice uh, then the second chair for this session doc dr oc abraham uh, he is professor of medicine cmc vellore sir has a lot of publications to his credit uh, more than 100 134 publications and has received various awards uh, which include past uh, he was past president clinical infectious disease society lifetime achievement award at hiv congress 2018 mumbai uh, molly thomas and thomas bhanu award for best teacher at cmc vellore he is also member of clinical research group expert advisory group icmr task force on covid 19 member board of studies and department of general medicine bhu varanasi he is also reviewer of various clinical journals including clinical infectious diseases plus one medical mycology and journal of clinical virology the third chair for this session is captain dr usha banerji Uh, ma'am is group director nursing organization uh, for apollo hospitals she is also uh, group head of leading corporate hospitals like manipal group and max healthcare etc her major achievements include she was bestowed with president's medal and army headquarter medals countess jafrin medal and many other coveted awards for academic excellence she is a first rank holder and all round outstanding student she is also recipient of many national and international awards which include healthcare management asia awards fiki awards national women's excellence awards etc she is also core member of fiki and healthcare skills council of india other task forces 
recently she has been nominated as member of indian nursing council by ministry of health government of india she has various publications to her credit and also keeps appearing in several medias representing nursing so i hand over uh, the session to the chairs please professor dr anju professor dr anju uh good afternoon uh, can you hear me please yes you are audible okay, good afternoon uh, to begin with i would like to thank uh, dr raman sardana for inviting me to chair the session frankly just a few minutes after attending this infection control webinar i realized how much we have to learn i feel honored to be chosen alongside with such eminent personalities it's more of a learning session for me and my faculty now i would like to uh, introduce the first speaker of the session dr shanti bansal who will deliver a talk on hand hygiene and prevention of sepsis her um, her present designation is uh, director medical services in the prashta apollo hospital new delhi thank you ma'am for your kind introduction uh, i am presently director medical services at apollo hospital delhi and i must take this opportunity to thank uh, dr raman sardana and leena to give me this opportunity to be here amongst all you clinicians who are so keen on uh, infection control and prevention of infection uh, it was a delightful session i have been attending right from the beginning of course i have been doing my work as well Uh, but it's so important that we discuss viral fungal and then back uh, parasitic and then bacterial and now we are what we as a group can do about preventing uh, hospital acquired infection and what is the role of hand hygiene in hospital acquired infection much has already been talked about uh, sepsis and everything i would keep my presentation very brief and focusing on what as a healthcare administration can bring to the table and uh, help clinicians achieve this goal of keeping hospital acquired infections uh, to the lowest so can i with your permission ma'am uh, share the screen yes please ma'am go ahead thank you dr anju right Uh, so when we are talking about role of hand hygiene in prevention of sepsis we are aware that it's been almost 150 years since uh, uh, semmelweis's epidemiological observation uh, observations and implementation of proper hand hygiene still remains a challenge in clinical practice but i must give credit to the pandemic where we really didn't have to keep pressing on everyone otherwise every year it was a task for us to see to it that everybody follows hand hygiene a uh, pandemic has really taught us a lot and improved our hand hygiene scores so i am here talking about us data because us also happens to be third largest populous country and it shows that almost uh, in us acute care hospitals show that up to 58% of sepsis episodes are of healthcare origin origin we all know how uh, bad healthcare acquired infection is one in four cases of sepsis in hospitals and one in two cases of sepsis in icus results from healthcare associated infections look at this data this is like amazing and scary data 25% of sepsis because of Uh, in the hospitals is because of hospital acquired infection and 50% in icus is hiis real scary i mean i am scared looking at this data when i was doing this research and this is through who uh, that what will happen if i have to be admitted to the icu so i am as an administrator so driven and so passionate about preventing hospital acquired infection and i keep a close eye and i must thank my team here which is led by leena right now 
and Lena is the prodigy of Dr. Raman Sardana and both Lena and Dr. Hina who are part of my hospital here in Apollo Hospital Delhi are doing a fantastic job of keeping everything in check. And as we, uh, the WHO presents that every thousand hospitalized patients an estimated 15 patients will develop sepsis as a complication of receiving healthcare. Again, a scary number. Mortality estimates for healthcare associated sepsis in hospitalized adult patients ranges from 20 to 30 percent. That's huge. So, sepsis is a major contributor to the global burden of disease, with the majority of sepsis cases and deaths are estimated to occur in low and in middle income countries, whereas I am talking to you about a data which is coming from the US and not from a low and middle income countries. Imagine if we could really gather the true data which is happening in the low and middle income countries, where would that stand? It would be among us. The lack of access to safe and effective antimicrobials for human population is a threat to global health security and it contributed to the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. And we all are struggling with our antimicrobial stewardship program in our institution. And our armamentarium of antibiotics is just vanishing. We have no more arrows there to kill these um, infectious uh, uh, causes. Sustainable availability and supply of antimicrobials is under constant threat, both locally and globally. Antimicrobial shortages are increasingly hindering timely access to effective therapies. Now, we all know this is for the benefit of all who uh, students who have joined us, how infection is transmitted and why hand hygiene is so important to prevent healthcare acquired infections. According to the WHO, transmission occurs via the following steps. Organisms are present on the patient's skin or have been shed onto objects or equipment immediately surrounding the patient. Organisms are transferred to the hands of the healthcare worker who are working with these patients. Organisms survive at least several minutes on healthcare workers' hands. And hand washing or hand antisepsis by the healthcare worker is inadequate or omitted entirely. The contaminated hands of the healthcare comes into contact with another patient or an object or equipment. It comes into direct contact with the patient and there Hello, we have healthcare acquired infection. So what is the clinical significance and why should we hit at this um, healthcare acquired infection and have all strategies and policies for hand hygiene in place within check? What is the gain? What is in it for us as an organization and as patients? Hand hygiene practices are paramount in reducing cross transmission of microorganisms hospital and acquired infections, and the risk of occupational exposure to infectious diseases. Hand hygiene is considered the single most important factor in the control of infection. It protects patients and healthcare workers from acquiring microorganisms that may cause them harm. The WHO multimodal hand hygiene improvement strategy has been shown as the most effective approach leading to practices improvements. Hand hygiene improvement programs can prevent up to 50% avoidable infections acquired during healthcare delivery and generate economic savings on average 16 times the cost of implementation. So here you go when you want to pitch to the management that how hand hygiene implementation measures, which may cost a bit, will improve the outcomes and actually the savings, economic savings will be 16 times more than the cost of implementation. And these are WHO data. Mortality and morbidity increase in the presence of hospital-acquired infections. Thus, diligent hand hygiene is essential to providing safe, cost-effective quality care to our patients. And we all are committed to that. So how do you approach hand hygiene? So I have this three-pronged approach. Educational programs, infrastructure, and the material which will create awareness and how administration can contribute to this. So we all know educational programs of patients and healthcare providers, the ergonomics and staffing ratios all play a role in hand hygiene compliance. I cannot expect that a one nurse serving 10 patients will do the same where we have a one nurse 
so in four or five patients. So we have to have those ratios right. And we always uh, struggle with nursing and nursing is the most, is the commonest factor which is acting between the patient's uh, care plus the housekeeping. Again, if a single person is taking care of more patients, the hand hygiene goes for a toss. We all know this. So this is how staffing ratios will help. And this is how, this is what management need to understand. You know, cutting down on human personnel, personnel working in healthcare doesn't help us. And uh, when it comes to providing the material for hand hygiene and creating an infrastructure for hand hygiene, it should be convenient and easy to access alcohol-based hand rubs or soap and water, bedside dispensers and PPEs. We all know the importance of these. I don't want to elaborate on that because during pandemic, we have been talking about all these things. And as far as administration goes, providing adequate staff as inadequate adherence to hand hygiene protocols is associated with low staffing levels in one study and high workload in another, which you can see the references down there. We need appropriately trained staff and all the time assessment and surveillance is the key. So you make a policy, you make a process of the policy, and then people are trained to follow this. This is the circle which needs to be completed all the time. Whenever you have a problem, check on the policy. Is the policy correct? Is it coherent? Is it right? Is it relatively okay to be there? Is the process following the policy for what we have created the policy? Is the process following it? And are the people, people trained enough on the processes so that we achieve the outcome that are desired? This is what we do when we talk about continuous quality care. So we have monitoring mechanisms, surveillance mechanisms. On surveillance mechanism, we find what is the percentage? Is the percentage increasing? Hand hygiene is increasing or decreasing? How is it affecting my outcome? What do I do to increase hand hygiene compliance so that infections are brought down? Um, and my infection control team is an amazing team. I must say I've been supported by a team which has been mentored by Raman sir and Dana sir. And Lena and Hina are taking it forward. I am blessed. I feel blessed because everyone is taking care of all the patients infection control. So what we do is we have this visual learning material which are displayed at every hand uh, hygiene uh, stop or uh, kiosk that we have created. We do awareness and motivational activities for our staff. And these are like our front office staff, not the nursing staff. So training activities involving all the staff, it's like right from the housekeeping to a senior doctor as well. Uh, patient and family education, because when the patient is in the, is in the room, the family is with them, and if they don't understand, they will not use hand hygiene as the patient and below you have uh, infection. How, we also do many community uh, awareness activities so that we can create. And we all know under the guidance and leadership of Dr. Raman Sardana, um, Apollo Hospital received Guinea's world record on the most participants in a hand sanitizing relay, which was almost 1,711 achieved by Apollo in 2016. We have not yet been able to beat that, uh, Dr. Sardana. Uh, so that was a fantastic feat achieved by you. This is all I have to say about how uh, hand hygiene can help us prevent hospital acquired infection and can bring down the mortality or infection uh, rate in the ICUs from 50% to 25% and from for the general public, maybe half of uh, what 25% that I mentioned. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Now, uh, I would like to invite our second speaker, Dr. Fatima Khan, who will speak on role of sterilization and disinfection in sepsis. Dr. Fatima is Associate Professor in the Department of Microbiology, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, 
uh, Aligarh Muslim University. Her teaching experience 14 years. She has uh, 67 uh, publications to her credit, and uh, she has also two books to her credit. And uh, also, she has uh, abstracts 49 published, and workshops attended are 19, and 22 conferences and CMEs 14 attended. A very good afternoon to all of you and thank you ma'am for the uh, introduction. My sincere thanks and regards to Dr. Raman Sardana, Dr. Lina, and the entire HISI family and to all the teachers, seniors and my colleagues who are here. Uh, may I just share my screen? I don't know. I'm unable to share my screen. Don't know why. The presentation not visible. Ma'am, please uh, click on share screen button. Yes. Please start a slideshow. My presentation is visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. Okay. So I have been uh, deputed to discuss about the role of sterilization in preventing sepsis. And uh, sepsis in healthcare can be due to a number of underlying causes. Since maternal mortality is a key indicator of a country's progress in improving health, so let us begin this session with maternal or puerperal sepsis. So according to the Government of India, as displayed on the National Health Portal, puerperal sepsis accounts for 15% of the maternal deaths annually. So let us just raise a question. A mother who has just given birth can be risk of developing sepsis. How can this risk be reduced? And we have a, a multiple choice question by constantly changing the medical team that is delivering the baby and monitoring the mother by discharging the mother from the hospital as soon as possible after the delivery by giving broad spectrum antimicrobial coverage or by using sterilized equipment during childbirth and in examinations. And I hope you all will agree with me that the correct answer should be by using sterilized equipment during childbirth and in examinations. Because if we see the causes of purpural sepsis, there is a long list. And if we highlight the few important ones, the ones who are at the top of the list and the other important ones, the causes include poor standards of hygiene, poor aseptic precautions, manipulations are high in the birth canal, a num the number of per vaginal examinations, particularly if you are in an academic hospital like ours, right from the GR1, GR2, GR3, each one tries his or her hands on the uh, poor uh, woman who comes for the delivery. Insertion of unclean hand instrument or packing into the canal and frequent vaginal examinations. So these are for some of the important uh, causes which can lead to purpural sepsis and amongst these, we can see that all these are associated with poor infection prevention practices, or to be more specific, poor standards of sterilization, decontamination, and asepsis. So just to curtail this simplest, most common sepsis that is occurring in the hospitals, what we need is vigorous hand washing, use sterilized equipments, and reduce the number of interventions that are being done on the patients. So if we now move on to the other healthcare associated infections, I love to show this WHO fact sheet each time I am given a presentation. So uh, just I'm highlighting the facts from this WHO fact sheet. Of every 100 hospitalized patients at any given time, seven in developed and 10 in the developing countries will acquire at least one healthcare associated infection. In high income countries, approximately 30% patients in ICUs are affected by at least one healthcare associated infection. And in contrast, in low and middle income countries, the frequency of these infections is at least two to three times higher, which makes it up to 60 to 90% of infections in ICUs. So uh, the frequency of infections in ICUs is high due to the higher interventions uh, being done in these patients. And there are other reasons, of course, like 
they are most of the times immunocompromised. They have long duration of hospital stay. They are more on broad spectrum antimicrobials, etc. But our focus is here the number of interventions, the number of devices they are being used, are being that are being used on these patients. And if we see the device associated infection densities, they are up to 13 times higher in the low and middle income countries than in the developed ones. Uh, comparing the different types of HCAIs, then UTIs are the most frequent healthcare associated infection in high income countries, whereas surgical site infection is the leading infection in settings with limited resources, affecting up to one third of operated patients. That is, if 100 patients are op being operated, then of these 30 patients will be at risk of developing surgical site infections. This is up to nine times higher than in the developed countries. And if you see the data, the number of surgeries being performed worldwide, nearly 3 billion, 300 billion surgeries are being performed every year. Uh, I was unable to retract the Indian data, but uh, the US data, which I could see was 101 million medical procedures like endoscopies, eudinoscopies, et cetera. They are being performed annually. And I am sure that in India, we are not behind since uh, uh, we were amongst the uh, aims conducted 1.94 lakh surgeries, which was a world record in 2018. So in minor procedures also, we must be far beyond any other country. So whenever a patient undergoes any of these procedures, then there is a risk of developing infection because of failure to follow the adequate disinfection and sterilization, uh, so which increases the chances of infection transmission and a patient may line up into cases like these, patient may lose uh, there have been reports of patients losing eyes due to improper sterilization techniques. And this may land up, uh, uh, we can land up, we ourselves can also land up into trouble because of these. Then unusual implication of biopsy forceps and outbreaks of pseudomonas aeruginosa infections to, related to bronchoscopy. Uh, my slideshow has stopped moving. Okay. Then superbug infection transmission after bronchoscope. So we are at risk whenever we are doing any procedure, we are putting our patients at risk of developing infections if we are not following the stringent infection prevention protocols. So let us just have a look uh, uh, for these procedures. So the question arises, does the sterilization disinfection have a role in preventing sepsis? So for, to answer this question, we must know the epidemiology of transmission of infection in these procedures. So infection following any open or endoscopic procedure can be divided into three broad categories. Exogenous infection, endogenous, and the infection transmitted between patients and hospital personnel. The endogenous infection is due to the translocation of bacteria from the site of surgery as a result of the endoscopic or open surgeries like infections due to traumatic tissue injury during the endoscopy. What we are more focused is exogenous infection, which involves the spread of bacteria via contaminated equipments between one patient and another, and which is the avoidable type of infections. Lastly, infections transmitted from patients to the healthcare personnel and vice versa, if, if proper technique and personal protective equipments are not utilized. So our focus will be the first one and the last one. Most common healthcare associated infections caused by harmful device use practices, that is the uh, misuse or not proper use of the sterilization, disinfection, decontamination protocols are the surgical site infections, hepatitis B and C, HIV, urinary and vascular catheter associated infections and ventilator associated infections. Now these three, uh, these, the, these four SSIs, UTIs, COTI, ventilator associated infections, they may land up, uh, they may lately, our patient may land up into uh, the complications like sepsis in higher rate of mortality because of these infections. So somehow we have to curtail these infections to prevent the long-term complications like sepsis and others. So the mantra is use only sterilized properly reprocessed instruments for any intervention along with other stringent infection prevention protocols and the healthcare associated care bundle protocols. So I repeat again, use only sterilized and properly reprocessed instruments for any intervention. So the for proper reprocessing and sterilization uh, laid back in 
more than 45 years back, Spalding gave us a beautiful classification, which is easy, simple, basic, and which classify these instruments, the healthcare instruments into critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. And I hope we all are well aware of this classification. So uh, once we know this classification, we can reprocess our instruments properly, but there are certain factors which influence the disinfection and sterilization, like cleaning of the object, the organic and inorganic load that is present, the type and level of microbial contamination, concentration of and exposure time to the disinfectant and sterilant, nature of the object, temperature and relative humidity, improper packaging or overloading the sterilizer chamber from air pockets that prohibit items from being sterilized, Cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, they are complex processes made even more complex by the wide variation in the types of instruments and equipments being processed, the materials they are made of, the different chemicals in the market, the resources available for this process, and most importantly, the skill and knowledge of those who are doing this work. So breaches in sterilization and disinfection or decontamination can occur at any of these uh, processes like during cleaning, at packaging, at sterilization, during storage, at the time of usage, and by the default of the by default of the staff. So we need the most important thing, we'll be discussing these points one by one, but I would like to focus that since I am in a government tertiary care center, what we face is many times untrained staff leave vacancies, the trained staff has gone and leave and another staff he or she comes and he is totally untrained, temporary staff, shifting of the staff. Our trained staff is shifted to some other unit and another untrained staff one fine day, uh, we are supposed to make him or her work. So we need proper standard operating procedures in hand so that anyone who comes, he can read it and just do the work that is required. Cleaning is defined as the physical removal of all the visible soil, dust, and other foreign materials. Effective, effective cleaning will reduce the microbial contamination on environmental surfaces and equipment. It is the first and most important step before disinfection or sterilization can occur. If this material is not removed from the item, the disinfectant and sterilization process will be improper, obviously. But before cleaning, Pre-soaking can be done and it is one way to begin the cleaning process. Enzyme pre-soakers uh, break up the blood and protein matter. They can make the job of cleaning easier and more efficient. They prevent the soil and proteins from drying on the instruments. They soften the soils and assist with removal. Biofilm can begin developing within minutes. And this pre-soaking, it prevents the development of biofilms. Pre-soaking the instrument should ideally occur as soon as possible immediately following the procedures and there are a number of enzymatic cleaners which are available in the market. This is to be followed by manual or automatic cleaning. If we are doing the cleaning manually, then it has to uh, be followed by pre-soaking. Instruments should be uh, that are to be washed should be submerged underwater to prevent potential exposure to microorganisms through aerosolization. Healthcare worker must be instructed to not put hands into the sink or basins with sharps. He or she should use a basket or a strainer to lift out the sharpened items. Proper personal protective equipment, including eye and face protection should be worn. Change the enzymatic cleaner after each batch of instruments are washed. And please do not forget to wash the brushes that are used to clean the instruments. They should be washed, decontaminated, and dried properly each time. Then the disinfectants that we are using, again, uh, we have to keep a track of the proper concentration of the disinfectant that is to be used. Uh, the manufacturer instructions are of each time we have to read the manufacturer instruction. Check the expiry date before using label while uh, making the your personal dilution. Label with the concentration and date at the time of use. There have been a number of incidents and failures because of improper disinfectant use. And I was reading through a paper that I had gone through, and it mentioned the largest disinfection failure involved the distribution of an inactive lot of glutaryl dehyde disinfection solution that has been used by 60 hospitals in Belgium involving 34,879 patients. And this is a huge number. So if any of the failure occurs in any of these steps while making the disinfectant anything, 
then tracking back these patients is really difficult. So it is better that we follow the SOPs, we follow the guidelines all the time. Then the next step is packaging for sterilization. Use the correct wrapper or casket for the type of sterilization being done and items to be sterilized. Follow all the manufacturer's instructions for use. Obviously, follow the guidelines, train the staff. Once the instruments have been sterilized, then they have to be stored properly because they should be away from humid areas. A proper distance is to be maintained from the floor, from the uh, roof, etc. Use the bottom shelf. And most importantly, first in, first out. And no rubber bands. Maintain the temperature and humidity of the storage area. Then another challenge during the sterilization is the sterilization or reprocessing of the endoscopes. Because... Uh, Autoclaving is easier, but a number of uh, flexible endoscopes, we cannot go for autoclaving. They have to be reprocessed either by high-level disinfection or we have to use ETO. So many hospitals, they cannot afford ETO. For those who can afford ETO, the clinicians, they demand their items uh, way back soon. So ETO has a long cycle and it is costly also. Chemical disinfection, like glutaral dehyde, if they are using, then it is difficult to monitor. Then cleaning of the endoscopes before the disinfection or the sterilization is again very challenging. It has to be disassembled before uh, we go take it for the sterilization process. Then correct concentration of the disinfectant, it has to be monitored every time. For the autoclaving, uh, we have to maintain the quality control log. We have to follow the all the control parameters like physical, chemical, and biological controls, which give the combined results. So what we follow is we use the physical indicator tapes with each lot, ev with every packed item. The bovidic tapes we are doing weekly and after each surface to check the vacuum and the biological indicators, the geo geobacillus stereothermophilus, it is being run weekly and each time with the implants and after every surface. However, uh, since the biological indicators, they are closest to being ideal, they should be run at least weekly, but if it can be run every day, then it is preferable. Uh, with each load, then it is even more preferable, but at least weekly and run for every implant and the ETO run. And the rapid indicator for implants must be negative before releasing the items the rapid indicator for the biological indicators in the implant run. In case of failure of biological indicator, that is, it turns out to be positive, we need to have written protocol, who to notify, how to identify the instruments, use, recall, etc. So what if the biological indicator turns out to be positive? Check the printout. If the cycle parameters are not met, remove from the surface, quarantine the load, investigate, and fix the cause. If the cause is readily identified, Correct and run to return to service, reprocess the load. If the cause is not apparent, remove from surface, call the manufacturer, quarantine the load, do not use until fixed and tested. Recall item processed since last good load. So before uh, the uh, uh, the autoclave can be used for sterilization of these uh, healthcare equipments, run three consecutive empty loads with biological indicator. This is known as the qualification testing and all the must pass before using the auto, this autoclave, which has, which have had a false a positive biological indicator run. So depending on the findings, we need to notify the surgeons and the patients that instruments may not have been sterilized properly. We should have written procedures that specifies actions to be taken when a biological test is positive. So after we have taken all these stringent precautions and uh, we consider that our sterilization is complete, still we cannot be 100% sure that the, the, at the time of usage, there is no fault. So before usage, check the physical indicator. There is still intact, intact. Check the expiry dates that are mentioned on the packaging. Check the integrity of the packs. If they are torn or moist, then do not use these uh, packs. So what if a sterile instrument trips inside the OT just before or during the surgery? This is the next query. 
So there is a term that is immediate use sterilization, and I do not promote immediate use sterilization. It should not be used as a substitute for sufficient instrument inventory. It is to be kept to a minimum only in selected situations in a controlled manner. It is a process designed for the steam sterilization of patient care items for immediate use. Uh, should be used only when there is insufficient time to sterilize the item by the preferred wrapper or container method in an autoclave, which is just in, uh, near the OT. It refers to processing an unwrapped item for 3 to 10 minutes at 132 degrees centigrade at saturated steam. There is no drying time and there is no cooling time. But uh, this should not be promoted. This is just in case. Uh, as discussed, there is a sterilization failure just when the needle or when the syringe, uh, your scissors or forceps, they just fall off inside the OT. Then another challenge for the infection prevention team is the use of single-use devices. Uh, a single-use device is designed by a, by a manufacturer to be used only on a single patient and then discarded. Emphasis is on single patient and a device may be used more than one times on the same patient depending on its design and manufacturer's instruction. Much consideration needs to be taken when deciding to reprocess a single use device. It needs to involve the highest level of administration in the healthcare facility as well as the infection control team, the SSD and the biomedical experts because the reuse of single use devices has been associated with uh, a number of challenges again when attempting for example uh, this slide has been given to me by Dr. Raman Sardana and so I would like to highlight this when attempting to flush the single use devices a distribution of the contamination rather than cleaning was achieved and most of the inspected devices showed residual contamination in the hinges and under the isolation codes this was true for harmonic scalpels so the finding indicate that cleaning agent penetrates into the device and dilutes the blood, but it cannot be flushed out of the device. Therefore, contamination, it persists inside these devices. So what will be the consequence? Obviously, uh, infection, healthcare-associated infection, a single bladder use pressure transducer cover was not changed between patients, resulting in cross-infection due to pseudomonas aeruginosa. One patient developed septicemia and died of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So single-use devices have to be used very thoughtfully, very carefully, the first thing is do not do it, but if you do it, very good reprocessing systems must be in place. And what is expected? There need to be a reuse committee, including members from the facility with the responsibility for administration, risk management, epidemiology, infection prevention and control, biomedical engineering, medical device processing and procurement and the accounting. The committee should establish policies, ensure the protocols, exist for each reprocessing device and monitor adherence to the approved procedures. Then written reprocessing procedures for each type of single-use device should be present. Validation of the effectiveness and reprocessing procedures to ensure both sterility and functionality of the device and quality assurance. This includes monitoring of control points and quality indicators, regular sampling and inspection of the devices, and a periodic review of the external factors that could affect the safety or function of the reprocessed devices, such as changes in the hospital use practices, changes in the supplier of the device, or changes in the design or material of the device. So uh, my next question is, is sterilization, disinfection, decontamination limited to the OTs, ICUs, HDUs? No. There have been reports of chronobacter infections from powdered infant formula. So, and leading to adverse events in four patients and two reported deaths. So I would just like to focus once again that in, uh, this sterilization, decontamination, uh, disinfection is to be done everywhere in the hospital and sometimes even outside the hospital. So how do we ensure that appropriate infection prevention practices are used? Develop and implement policies and practices based on recognized guidelines, accreditation agency standards, and state federal regulatory requirements. Ensure the personnel receive orientation and ongoing training. Document that training. Prepare standard operating procedures. Monitor personal practices and competency and provide feedback 
hold accountability this is very important for government setups i think develop uh, document competency assessments and there should be incentives for those who are going doing good work implement quality assurance and validation programs manual cleaning visual inspections detection of protein test automatic washers ultrasonics lumens card washers for proper functioning before initial use weekly preferably du daily during use after major maintenance check the instrument for cleanliness and performance implement a preventive maintenance program to summarize to ensure patient and staff safety develop and implement policies and practices that comply with recognized guidelines accreditation agency standards the state and federal regulatory requirements base cleaning disinfection and sterilization protocols on type and intended use of instruments and devices ensure that personnel understand and follow the recommended guidelines and practices so these are the references i'm so i end with primum non nocere this is the minimum we can do for our patients healthcare without avoidable infections at least thank you Thank you, Dr. Fatima, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Namit Jirath, who is a senior consultant pediatrician in charge of the PICU uh, and the pediatric critical care and pulmonology specialist at uh, in the Pusta Apollo Hospitals. Uh, he'll be speaking on an unusual case of uh, community acquired sepsis in a pediatric patient. Uh, we are way behind schedule, so may I request all speakers to please, please adhere to the allotted time. Thank you. Over to Dr. Jirath. Trying to is my screen visible? Yes, yes, sir. Please, okay. thank start. you. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons and uh, Dr. Sadana and Dr. Alina for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just present one case of a, a community acquired sepsis, which is non-bacterial. That was my mandate. And uh, uh, I know we are going behind schedule and I'll try to be as quick and brief as possible. Uh, so I'm just going to do a case presentation just to uh, sort of uh, keep our ears and eyes open for unusual presentations. So this was a three-year-old boy uh, who was uh, who presented to our hospital uh, last week of last month, actually, with a history of fever for 10 days, dry cough for 10 days, loose for, uh, stools for two days, and difficulty in breathing for the last two days. So a short history of a very typical uh, viral uh, sort of a prodome of cough, fever, loose motions. Initially, he presented to a hospital in Agra, uh, which is about 200 kilometers from here, uh, and uh, he had significant distress when he was there and he was just given some oxygen, given a shot of antibiotic, nebulized and shifted over to us. And the blood test that was sent there, by the time the child came here, we got the reports that the hemoglobin was 8.6 with a TLC of 3,600 and 54% neutrophils, platelet 43,000, SGPT of 81 and a CRP of around 30. So, uh, in other significant background history, his neonatal period was uneventful, but around by one year of age, he was diagnosed to have Down syndrome, a trisomy 21, with hypothyroidism, 
uh, for which he has been on uh, thyroxin and he had a small uh, atrial septal defect on the echocardiogram, but he was otherwise doing well and was uh, growing well. So on presentation to the emergency department, uh, he was in significant respiratory distress. He had a tachycardia, his saturations were 86% with 5-6 liters of oxygen. Um, his blood pressure was okay, maintained, but uh, the capillary refill was delayed around four seconds. There was no audible murmur. His respiratory rate was very high. He had significant retractions, nasal flaring, was, there was hepatomegaly. The child was irritable, inconsolable, and also had bilateral conjunctival injection. So this child was clinically in a state of decompens uh, a compensated uh, shock with respiratory failure. And because of this, he was intubated in the emergency room because of the severe distress and hemodynamic compromise. And this was the first set of numbers that we had. Uh, the blood gas showed a pH of 7.33 with a CO2 of 30, O2 of 48, bicarbonate of 16, and a lactate of almost four and a half. Uh, you've seen these numbers, the hemoglobin, the TLC, and the platelets, all of these were low. The liver enzymes were raised, the urea was slightly on the higher side, and the CRP was raised. And as you can see, the first XA, which was after intubation, showed bilateral significant inf infiltrates on both the lung fields. So at this point, we had a child who had features of pneumonia with ARDS, which could be of any origin. It could be bacterial, viral, fungal, or some atypical infections. So the season being of dengue, that is always in the back of our minds. It could also be some non-infectious uh, uh, reasons like uh, re not recently, maybe a few months back, till a few months back, we had lots of cases of MISC, which were following the COVID infection, Kawasaki disease, or in a child with a background of trisomy, whether there's a leukemia with macrophage activation. So these were the differential diagnoses we're going on in our mind. So as part of the workup to rule in and rule out most of these, lots of tests were sent that you see on the panel. Blood smear was sent, which showed no abnormal cells. The dengue IgM, the scrub typhus IgM were negative. Blood culture and sensitivity, which was sent later on, turned out to be sterile, appeared cultures and sensitivity, one from the center line and one from the peripheral line. Uh, a community fever panel was sent, which was uh, non-contributory, uh, and a lavage, a bronchoalveolar lavage and nasopharyngeal aspirate for the respiratory infectious panel were also sent. So on day one, this is the XA that we had seen, bilateral infiltrates, but more importantly, he was requiring very significant pressures and oxygen requirement to maintain the saturations on the ventilator. So a child on day one requiring a PEEP of round 12 and 85% oxygen is always a very big concern for us. He was started on antibiotics empirically. He was sedated, he was muscle relaxed and all the supportive care were continued. An echo was done, which did not show any uh, atrial septal defect. And we were concerned about features of pulmonary hypertension. So the cardiac function was normal and there was no feature of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. So the, over the next two days, his ventilatory requirements remained very high. The hemodynamics were reasonably maintained, but as you can see on the gas, his PO2 was low, his CO2 was high, and the bicarbonate was on the lower side with a slightly high lactate. So we were on a PEEP of 13. This child had continued uh, um, frequent episodes of desaturations and had, had a very labile respiratory status. And uh, oxygenation index is something that we look for as a marker of the worsening of the respiratory status, uh, which is a product of uh, the mean alveolar pressure and the, uh, and the uh, divided by the FiO2. And so, uh, so this a rising oxygenation index is usually a marker of worsening respiratory status, co combining everything, all the ventilator parameters and the oxygen parameters. And when it starts reaching somewhere around 15, we are really concerned where we think of high frequency ventilation and often start thinking of ECMO at this point. One of the options we have at this time is to turn the child prone. This is just an illustrative picture, not of this child. And we turn this child prone. 
pruning helps homogenization of the lung and uh, um, realignment of the ventilation perfusion match across the lung. So over the next two days or the day two, day three, uh, we had the, the viral panel which had come back and in the test, as you can see on the report there, the adenovirus had come back positive. The blood cultures had showed no growth. The child, we gave the blood, uh, child some blood transfusion because he was on very high ventilatory requirements. And with high ventilatory requirements, we usually prefer to have hemoglobin around the 10 mark rather than the 7 mark. So at a hemoglobin of 7.3, he was uh, given blood transfusion. Over the next two days, from day two to day four, on the prone position, the child gradually improved. We were able to gradually reduce the uh, ventilator settings, though a small amount, but our oxygenation index reduced from 12 to 5, which was very uh, encouraging. So an aggressive turning prone. And at this point, unlike in the adult world where patients are turned supine to prone every day, uh, we tend to keep them prone for a longer time or we use the prone position till the uh, advantages of prone position are uh, visible. So around day four, day five, we turned the child supine. And uh, uh, by day seven, when he was slightly more better, when the oxygen levels were reduced and he was maintaining saturations, that is the point when we weaned and extubated the child onto a high flow nasal cannula support. But immediately after extubation, within a few hours, he had severe distress, severe strider, got re-intubated. So this was a failed extubation. And empirically, the child was started on steroids, suspecting a subglottic stenosis, or not stenosis, but a narrowing, which is very uh, common in children who get uh, ventilated um, uh, at this age. So the concerns at this point were, do we have an immunocompromised child? A child being a child of Down syndrome is inherently immunocompromised, had severe pneumonia, which was viral, adenovirus, failed extubation, a secondary with probably a secondary or an acquired infection. And sedation is always very difficult for children with Down syndrome. So if they are to be controlled, we have to use a lot of sedation and sometimes that becomes a double-edged sword. You have to use the sedation, but then you have to be worried about the adverse effects of it as well. We never went on to treating the adenovirus with specific agents, though not don't have much of choice there, uh, because he did show improvement with our conservative management of with our um, non-specific generalized management of ARDS. By day nine, the fevers were persistent. We had changed the lines. Culture was sent again. The bronchialveolar lavage showed uh, growth of uh, E. coli, and according to the reports, an amikacin was added. Blood transfusions he continued to require. So this was a child, if you remember, initially had pancytopenia, and uh, uh, we were also concerned because dengue children can have sometimes an associated leukemic event. By day 10, this child again settled and was re-extubated, though the fevers continued, and over the next uh, few days, by day 15, day 16, he uh, again, with a lot of use of sedation, partly contributed by sedation, partly because of the lung condition, he developed a left upper loop uh, collapse, which worsened and it uh, went on to a complete collapse. So we did a bronchoscopy, cleaned out his lung, and which opened up the left lung. And lucky for us and for the child, the lungs remained open. Uh, often some these uh, lungs have this tendency of collapsing over and over again. But for this child, this continued to remain open. Gradually, his nail pharyngeal CPAP was stopped. His center line was removed. He was shifted to the room. His counts showed gradual improvement and all the uh, um, infection-induced suppression of the bone marrow gradually recovered. And his uh, uh, all the three counts, uh, the hemoglobin, TLC, and platelets did show continued improvement. And by uh, late into the third week, this child got discharged. So just to highlight, this child never came to us with an active bacterial sepsis. This was a non-bacterial sepsis, possibly because of an fulminant adenovirus uh, uh, infection of the lungs. And then developed, uh, went on to develop a secondary lung infection in the hospital, which was E. coli and was uh, treated uh, with appropriate antibiotics. 
So just a couple of slides, adenovirus, double standard DNA viruses, you all probably know much more about this virus than I do. But in children, you can often have uh, the typical bronchiolitis and pneumonia-like features with adenovirus with lots of extra pulmonary complications like conjunctivitis, which the child had, gastroenteritis, which again the child had, hepatitis, child had, and meningoencephalitis. Children under five years of age are predisposed to having very severe infections. And sometimes the adenovirus can leave a very long lasting effect on the lungs. And these lungs can even sometimes go on to develop necrotizing pneumonic condition, which uh, luckily we were uh, spared in this child. Uh, for treatment, if you consider treatment, a quantitative RT-PCR is, uh, would be in order. And they, though there are no very effective antivirals, Sidovifer is only the only one which has been used, not really approved in children, uh, but very rarely when our backs are against to the wall, we end up using it. Uh, I think that is it. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jainat. We will move on to the next presentation. Uh, the speaker is uh, Dr. Jatin Ahuja, who is a consultant in infectious diseases at the Apollo Hospitals, Delhi. Uh, he has completed his uh, MD and DNB in internal medicine and DM in infectious diseases at the Ames, New Delhi. Uh, he'll be speaking on uh, rare pathogens causing community acquired uh, sepsis. Over to you, Dr. Ahuja. Thank you, Dr. Ossie Abraham, sir. And thank you, entire team of FISI, especially Dr. Raman Sadhana, sir, for giving this opportunity. Uh, Indraprast Apollo Hospital, Dr. Lina. And now we have gone through all the type of pathogens, starting from bacterial, fungal, later on viral sepsis, and parasitic sepsis also. But my topic has been unusual pathogens causing sepsis. So I don't know what to present on unusual pathogens when I was making these slides. So I start with a very few, you know, two typical cases which we see in the daily basis, either in the emergency room or in our ICU settings. And here are the two types of presentations which we see either the unusual pathogens or unusual common pathogens with the unusual presentation. So this is the first case. It's the chief complaint with several episodes of emesis in female, female of around 62 years increase in bowel movements, drowsiness, and a fever of 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Feeling worse over the last two days and has not been able to eat. On presentation, she had a tachycardia, fever, hypotension, and tachypnea. And routine cultures were, and medications were started. So she fulfills the criteria of SARS, though, you know, SARS cannot be denoted to the sepsis, but on the basis of acute febrile illness or sepsis suspected, we started on the IV antibiotics. This is one typical case, which is a community acquired infection. So how we go through the approach to this community acquired sepsis, which is uncommon and unusual. So maximum effort should be made for the diagnosis. Multidisciplinary management is always required. Maybe, maybe patient may require ICU settings, vasopressor support, promptly but not aggressive treatment to be done, resolutely but not excessive, and last, continuous reassessment on daily basis to get to the bottom of the diagnosis, especially with the uncommon pathogens. This is something different case of again a 62 years female in ICU on mechanical ventilator for two weeks. The new onset fever, reduced sensorium and the hypotension. And she had all the lines in C2, whether A line, C line, HD characters, follies and the ET tube. Underlying she had diabetes, acute kidney in injury, on hemodialysis and CAD. She was also already on antibiotics, but antibiotics were revised because of the new onset suspicion of sepsis. She also fulfilled the criteria of SARS. So now we have two kinds of conditions. Second seems to be hospital acquired and the first one seems to be the community acquired pathogens. In the hospital acquired sepsis or infection, if the patient is already on antibiotics, 
and patient is still not improving what could be the four you know approaches these are four w's one is the wrong diagnosis second is the may wrong bug we are targeting the wrong bug or it could be wrong drug we are using it and the fourth one is without source control the lines are still in the c2 so when our mind is full of assumptions diagnosis and conclusion it has no penetration it just repeats the past impressions so we divide the unusual pathogens causing sepsis into two broad categories one is the uncommon pathogen with the uncommon disease and the second one is the common pathogen with the uncommon disease today over here we are discussing with the common pathogen with the uncommon disease so two questions before we move on to the common pathogens one is the how or when to suspect true sepsis or infection from the colonizer and the second one is when not to start the antibiotics that is more important especially we are when we are dealing with the colonizer so sars though outdated but still holds true when we are talking about the patient have the new onset temperature or fevers heart rate more than 90 respiratory going more than 20 or arterial pco2 less than 32 and there is a change in the tlc count However, SARS is the clinical host immune response assessment. It is the first clinical host immune response even before we have the rise in the procalcitonin. Coming on to the new definition, which already been covered earlier, it's the body's overwhelming and life-threatening response to infection that leads to the tissue damage, organ failure, and death. But do we have the time to wait for the tissue damage to happen? Or do I have to catch early so that patient can start on the appropriate antibiotics and can be prevented or going into mortality. But at the same time, we have to look at whether the patient is having the true sepsis or it's just a something other reason for the fever. So this is the sepsis 3 definition, which use SOFA criteria, CNS, respiratory, and six vital organs are being involved. But what is the drawback of this sepsis 3? It uses the dopamine as a one of the criteria, which is not being used nowadays for the as a vasopressor support. So question to ponder before we go to the uncommon pathogens. So do you require antibiotics with every fever? Is it always infectious? Is sepsis synonymous with the bacterial infection? Is it always the gram-negative sepsis we are dealing with in the ICU? What are the other infectious causes of the sepsis? Remember, these all scenarios which we are discussing is not the community acquired. These all are in our ICU settings. So Three things which we have common in the, all the sepsis is it can be caused by any type of bug. We have already seen it can be bacterial, viral, fungal. Clinical picture is always taken into the consideration and sepsis is not equivalent to bacteremia. But there are the two lists of the bugs, uncommon pathogen with uncommon disease. We know that Burkholderia, pseudomeliae causing maladosis, Brucellosis presenting as spinal problems, infective spondylitis or neurobrucellosis, leptospirosis, nocardia. We keep on seeing this kind of bugs, but yes, they are uncommon, not we see on the daily basis, but we keep on seeing them in the OPD or in the, our ICU settings. But what about these bugs, the common pathogen with the uncommon disease, with the pink box? They are the bugs which are daily basis, on our daily rounds, we see these kind of bugs, but we don't know whether to hit the bug or we not to hit the bug. Most of the time, they are the commensal colonizers, but never be the true pathogen. And very rarely, they are the one which cause the sepsis. They are known as unusual pathogens causing the sepsis. So A chromobacter species, Citrobacter, Chrysobacterium, the list is endless. And we know there are kind of new fancy names coming into the list like Rastonia, Providentia, Lugonostoc, and the Ocrobacterum anthropi. So always, we have to differentiate between the, these three contamination from the colonization from the true infection or sepsis. It's not patient who is in the ICU. It's not advisable to just with the fevers shift to the another antibiotics. We should be knowing when not to start the antibiotics. So avoiding antibiotic overuse in the ICU setting is one of the very good publication over here that CMI published when not to start the antibiotics. So when the patient in the ICU setting, we have to differentiate whether the patient is having febrile with new onset hypotension or not. Patient is having the low virulence pathogen 
in the blood culture or it's with the very high virulence pathogen patient is having ventilator acidic condition is there or not so all these things to be keep in the mind and then only if suspected on a very high suspicion we have to change our antibiotic we have to take care of the amr in not only in terms of the i would say changing the antibiotic so quickly but also which narrow spectrum antibiotic can be used then only we can prevent the amr development few points about the various type of infection which we see in our daily basis so these are the bugs can be isolated from the urinary tract especially from the catheter and uh, that can lead suspicion for the you know cotti development and whenever the, there is a patient with having fever we say that could be acrom vector or it could be flavo bacterium attributing to the development of a cotti it's a chart which taken from the internet book of the critical care a chart which showing that patient if having fever it should be looked whether patient having cv angle tenderness or not if patient we look for the foley's character evaluation of the functioning of the foley's character whether the, it's been functional or dysfunctional from the focus that is the point of care of ultrasound we have to also look for the urine routine which shows whether the pus cells are there or not whether it's a pathogenic bacteria or not if not then it could be just a colonizer we have to search for the other reason for the fever so cotti is out from our diagnosis similarly the other thing which we called as the clepsy the clepsy is or clepsy catheter related blood stream infection we have to look for the line site whether it's a, a pus or coming out from that insertion of the catheter site if there is some arrhythmia is there or not patient is having the hemodynamic compromise or not whether the two cultures been taken up or not or just a single catheter site culture is taken whether the site has been cleaned with the alcohol swab the hub of this catheter or just a sample has been taken up so all these things are taken into consideration and along with the procalcitonin that is the host immune response we have to guide our antibiotic therapy similarly with the ventilator resistant pneumonia we have to look for the sars response along with that we have change in the fio2 and or it's a decrease in the peep requirement if further down the line if we are suspecting it's a probable vap we have to look for the change in the procalcitonin levels our et cultures all along with the given scenario we can say that it could be the pathogen which is responsible for the vap development so coming on to the acrom vector species the acrom vector species they are again the gram negative species quite commonly isolated from the you know our et tube sometimes with the um, drain site quite commonly and most of the time after the surgery the drain sites are commonly get contaminated with the acrom vector and we keep on you know upgrading the antibiotic changing the antibiotic because of the fever development this is a case presentation or i would say the series of case which has been taken uh, from the kims institute kerala which has shown that the prosimide ampules are contaminated because of the acrom vector species acrom vector species are quite common because of the contamination in from the soil and the water similarly this is this uh, series uh, of the patient which is more than 200 and published from aims delhi by dr seema sood and the dr arthi kapil citrobacter infections so most of the citrobacter infections they are the 95% of patients they had mentioned that it's because of the hospital acquired infection so usually uncommon pathogens if they cause infection they are mostly hospital acquired and we have to take in into consideration whether it's a true sepsis or just a colonizer another one of the you know common bacteria which we see on rounds that is the chrysobacterium endologenes so it can also cause infection but it's this is a paper published from the jolly grant dehradun and they have shown that the two bugs two cases with the similar bugs isolated from the central line acid infection and that two from the periphery as well as from the central line showing the spear culture positivity this is a study done uh, in the pgi rotak uh, by dr dhruva choudhury which is showing that the gram positive cocci are very least responsible for the sepsis but yes i do say they are also one of the responsible so cons though most of the time it's a colonizer they still holds true if the patient standing in terms of you know the clinical picture is holding true so gram positive is can also be responsible for the 
sepsis. Again, an uncommon pathogen which can cause sepsis, especially the Staph epidermidis. Multidrug resistance, Elizabeth Kingia, Meninges septica. Elizabeth Kingia, again, a gram negative bacteria. Commonly, we see from the ET tube and sometimes with, through the drain site and from the wound site. But whether it is to be targeted or not to be targeted, that depends upon purely on the clinical picture. So clinical picture is always taken into consideration. And sometimes the center line can also be get infected with the Elizabeth Kingia. So if peer cultures, as I already mentioned in my previous slides, that peer culture or clinical scenario fulfilling the CREPSI or VAP criteria, then only Elizabeth Kingia should be targeted. Most of the time it's been seen that patient who is having prolonged intubation or prolonged hospitalization and repeated suctioning, these are the bugs which come into the picture and we keep on targeting and they keep on, you know, harboring also. They're not easily uh, targeted and uh, I would say difficult to eradicate because they are mostly their colonizer and they're not the true pathogens which are responsible for the fever or something change in the nutrition of the patient. Another bug which I have recently, uh, I would say when I was doing my DM, I heard that is myrodes bacteremia. So this is also a bacteria which is coming from the family of the Plavibacterium, quite commonly again from the urinary tract. And uh, most of the time, again, it's the colonizer because it's part of the uh, soil and water. And uh, again, this to be taken with a pinch of salt, the myrodes bacteremia. Rastonia piketty, uh, causing the inverted sepsis, we know where four types of Ralstonia, whether Ralstonia piketty, Ralstonia phronesium, Ralstonia insidosa, and manilotica. So there are four species. Most of the time, it's a colonizer. But sometimes, because it belongs to the Brucellaceae family, and most of the time, it's a colonizer from the wound, our drain site, our center line site. But sometimes, because of the low immunity, we have seen that in this, not even this, in this uh, case report, neutral sepsis has been documented many times with the Ralstonia species. Another new name that is the Ocrobacter anthropy, which is also a, um, I would say, pathogen which is present in the soil and the water. And this is a paper published from the AIMS Trauma Center by Dr. Neha Rastogir Puramathur ma'am, and which is been responsible for the meningitis. Here they have sent the sample, paired sample that is CSF and in the blood and both showing the same pathogen that is Ocrobacter anthropy responsible for the meningitis. So take home message from over here is that in the absence of good clinical information on request forms, microbiology labs are unable to distinguish from colonization and infection. And so if we just report the presence of bacteria, so it's my humble request from this platform, always mention the clinical scenario, at least two lines so that microbiologists can give us a good hint about the what's going in the lab. It is then up to clinicians to decide if these bacteria are causing infection or it's just a colonization or contamination. And every isolated bug, it doesn't mean we have to respect every bug. Thank you very much. With this, uh, I will get back to the our chairperson, Dr. O.C. Brahm, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jatin. Um, just a few couple of comments. Uh, the whole day we have been hearing about uh, sepsis. What I would like to remind this audience is that sepsis is a syndrome. Uh, we know that the definition of sepsis has been evolving. Uh, but as of now, the definition is based on host response to an infection. So we define sepsis in terms of organ dysfunction assessed at the bedside using the SOFA criteria, SOFA score, very objective. However, uh, the cause is a dysregulated post response to an infection. The diagnosis is an infection, it's not mentioned in the guidelines at all, it's left to the treating clinician. Neither does it differentiate between the different types of bugs, the whole day we have heard about bacteria, viruses, parasites, causing sepsis, nor does it differentiate between the site of infection, a pneumonia versus a liver abscess versus a peritonitis versus a necrotizing fasciitis. So uh, I think the, 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 the evaluation should start with a good history and physical examination like all good clinicians 
and then look at uh, SOFA scores and laboratory data. So we all heard ad nauseum during our training in MBBS and MD and DM that a syndrome is just a collection of symptoms and signs which occur together. So it doesn't tell you anything about the etiology. So sepsis is only part of the diagnosis. I'm really glad that Dr. Sardana had made this effort that OTT sepsis. So people get a wider picture. So with that, I will conclude. I'll hand over to the next chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ma'am, you are muted. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anjan Mukherjee, who is a consultant microbiologist, Apollo Medic, uh, Multi-Speciality Hospital, Kolkata. He's an associate professor, Apollo Health, Med, uh, Health Education and Research Foundation. He is MD from uh, AIMS and he's a senior ex-resident Department of Microbiology, a decade of postgraduate experiences across various government, uh, government and private organizations in New Delhi and Kolkata, uh, an honorary secretary for Health, Hospital Infection Society, India, Kolkata chapter, NABH accessor for hospital and entry level hospitals. Research experience includes um, project management and publications in peer reviewed national and international journals. His topic is going to be antimicrobials in OTT, that is, uh, other than that, sepsis, prudence and choice, duration, and de escalation. Welcome, sir. Hello. Yeah, am I am I audible and visible yes, to everybody? Sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your kind introduction and thanks to HISI team. With your permission, I'm, am I allowed to share the screen? Please, sir. Uh, uh, Sohal, yes, uh, sir. Your screen is still open. No, sir. My screen is closed. So, sir, I am having a problem sharing the screen. Can sir. someone please guide me? Any IT yes. person around? Please, please open your uh, presentation. Then click on the uh, share screen button. Then select your presentation. Okay, uh, it will be on the desktop? Yes, sir. Yes, so this is my presentation. Please uh, click the it screen good. share button uh -huh. on uh -huh. Zoom. Dr. Anjan, there is a share screen on the... Yes, 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 I'm trying, trying it, sir. Share screen, here you go. Please select, uh, select your presentation mm -hmm. and share. Microsoft PowerPoint, it is showing. Yes, yes, yes. And share. Uh, can I can I mail this presentation to you if you can share it from your end? Please, sir. Please, sir. What is the please, mail ID? Uh, WhatsApp, Dr. Anjan. Hmm. Who WhatsApp? Karu, sir. Aapko kar do. Mere ko kar Ma mail hi kar deta yeah, Rohit ji ko kar You have Rohit ji's number on you. Sir, I aapko uh, mail ID chat box mein de raha hu. mail kar आप बता ही बता दीजिए बता दीजिए मैं मैं I'll just type it बताइए सर 
सर प्रोजेक्ट्स प्रोजेक्ट्स एट द रेट एट मीटिंग्स एंड मोर डॉट कॉम मैंने चैट बॉक्स में डाला है एंड एंड नीस ओनली एन मीटिंग्स एन अच्छा एम ओ आर ई मोर डॉट कॉम एंड मोर डॉट कॉम भेज दिया मैंने ओके सर मैं चेक करता हूँ समथिंग Sir, my slide is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah. So my topic today is antimicrobials in OTT sepsis, students in choice, duration, and de-escalation. Throughout the day, we have had uh, excellent deliberation on the topic, and many of the things have already been covered. We will just discuss it once more for the sake of brevity. Uh, next, next slide, please. okay so uh, this is a very familiar picture especially to cricket buffs uh, if you would notice that uh, last slide please uh, if you would notice that murli dharan here uh, who was uh, one of the greatest of off spinners to have played the game of cricket he is holding the same ball with two different grips and the second grip became famous with the delivery known as dusra which essentially means that the off spinner will bowl a ball that is different from off spin and it is leg spin so it turns the other way round so in my opinion ott sepsis in uh, that is non bacterial sepsis is just like dusra the presentation is same the patient profile is same but the management is different and the course of events is different thereby we are all bowled by this dusra next slide please so our topic of discussion is sepsis and the sepsis and ott or, or other than that sepsis or the dusra sepsis what causes it the role of biomarkers and diagnostic stewardship if it is possible in ott sepsis next please now what is sepsis as we have already discussed it is a complex syndrome of physiological and pathological abnormalities resulting from infection the pathophysiology of sepsis is not fully understood the third international consensus definition starts for has advocated a new definition of sepsis and septic shock in 2015 this has replaced the previous definitions that is sepsis 1 given in 1991 and sepsis 2 in 2001 um, so what does it include it basically it has got rid of uh, the terminology called sirs and it is now limited only to sepsis and septic shock while sepsis is life threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection so there are three components life threatening organ dysfunction one dysregulated host response two and three is infection while septic shock is a subset of sepsis where profound circulatory cellular and metabolic abnormalities are associated with a greater risk of mortality than sepsis alone next please so the causes of sepsis is essentially infections but which infections is it viral fungal or parasitic next please 
Now, parasitic sepsis, parasites causing sepsis, uh, although it is rare, but parasitic infections can lead to fulminant infections as Dr. Aruna Pujari has so vividly discussed. Um, so these uh, sepsis-like features are uh, very common in certain diseases like malaria, uh, which can can be caused by do both uh, Plasmodium vivax as well as Falciparum. In these situations, targeted and therapy with antiparasites is a mandatory. Fungaloidis infection, as we have discussed, is aggravated to a life-threatening level on administration of corticosteroids, which often form the mainstay of treatment in sepsis. Several antiparasitic agents may trigger dysregulated immune response causing sepsis-like features, which includes ivermectin, something which was rampantly used during the COVID-19 times. Next, please. The causes of sepsis. It is caused by a broad range of pathogens. Bacterial infections represent the majority. Very important to note, however, is that up to 42% of sepsis presentations are culture negative. The initial standard of care as advocated by the surviving sepsis campaign, however, is that the immediate use of broad spectrum antibiotic based on whether septic shock is present or not. It, it is a time frame of maximum three hours to minimum one hour. So within one hour to three hour time, all sepsis patients must receive broad spectrum antibiotics. That's what um, the surviving sepsis campaign promotes. This unfortunately inevitably leads to unnecessary antibiotic use with associated consequences for antimicrobial resistance, effects on the host microbiome and excess healthcare costs. It is important to understand non-bacterial causes of sepsis so that inappropriate treatment can be minimized and appropriate treatments can be developed to improve outcomes. Next, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, we have had a view of this slide. This essentially summarizes our presentation. Uh, uh, there are three is the viral sepsis and the fungal sepsis. While there are certain common areas uh, for each, uh, for example, this, that immunosuppressed may be fatal if improperly treated, inflammatory organ damage, and it is biphasic in nature. While the OTT sepsis have some definite characteristics, like the viral sepsis is often contracted outside of the hospital, underlying disease is often self-limiting, Largest risk factors are age and prematurity that it affects extremes of ages. Elimination of normal antiviral mechanism leads to interferon gamma mediated inflammation, least common of the subtypes, direct virus mediated cytotoxicity and the endothelial damages are common. While the fungal sepsis almost exclusively is contracted in the hospital, severe CNS sequelae are well documented, higher mortality response to rare, uh, rare fungal toxins and metabolites, mediated by IL-17, reactive oxygen species, carbohydrate receptors, and TLR 2349. We would remember, however, the bacterial uh, sepsis is essentially triggered by TLR 2 and 4. Next, please. Etiology of viral sepsis, as we have already discussed, almost any virus can cause viral sepsis in susceptible population. HSV and enter are the most common viral causes of neonatal sepsis. Enteroviruses and human paracoviruses are most common causes of viral sepsis in young children. In addition, influenza viruses are a major cause of severe infections and then among children less than five years of age, older adults, pregnant women, and immunosuppressed individuals can lead to substantial morbidity and mortality in either break group. Dengue viruses are leading cause of sepsis in several tropical countries, including ours. Next. This is a summary slide uh, showing the um, uh, these various viruses, please note that epidemiology and risk factors are given in this table. As we have already discussed, it varies according to age, according to presentation. However, um, uh, 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 HSV and entero, as you have discussed in the last slide, and influenza affects extremes of ages. Next, please. 
Now, what is the difference between viral and bacterial sepsis? It is very difficult to differentiate clinically. The diagnosis of viral sepsis can be useful to inform treatment in case where suitable antivirals are available. Immunological data are scarce to separate viral sepsis. It cannot be said with any certainty. Viral sepsis is meaningfully different from bacterial sepsis. But viral sepsis is understood only insofar as immune response involved in several severe viral infections are understood. The cause and character of sepsis can be highly heterogeneous. Next, please. In With this background, transcriptomics has been used to identify gene signatures that can differentiate between viral and bacterial infections. And some we have had some headway in this. Some genes identified in these studies includes genes that downstream of the interferon signaling pathway, such as interferon-stimulated genes and interferon alpha-inducible protein 27, as well as some cytokines like interleukin-60. The role of these genes um, in viral infection is not yet understood uh, fully. However, the information is not required for their use in biomarkers and they have clinical utility regardless. The results of these studies may inform future research to identify biomarkers which can be used in a clinical setting to quickly differentiate between bacterial and viral infection. Next, please. Next, please. Now, treatment of viral infections and sepsis, up to five, as we have discussed, up to 42% sepsis are culture negative, suggesting a possible non-bacterial cause. Despite this, the preferred treatment of sepsis in all cases is early administration of broad uh, anti spectrum and uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, we must remember also that the survival rate of patients presenting with septic shock decreases by an average of 7.6% for every hour that antimicrobials are not applied. So, broad spectrum antibiotic has to be applied. However, the administration of only antibiotics will not be effective in the case of viral sepsis and can be associated with adverse effect. It is in this background that understanding a potential viral cause of the disease increases the possibility of treatment options, opening the possibility of broad spectrum antiviral medication, um, which is uh, and how the immune response to pathogens may contribute to it. Next. No antivirals, however, have yet been tested specifically for sepsis. Examples of antivirals which benefit in presentation of sepsis are, as, are common antivirals which we know, acyclovir in HSV infections, amantad in rimantad in oseltamivir, zanamivir in influenza, both broad-spectrum antivirals like the favipiravir and the ribavirin. Antiviral medications may also have a role to, uh, in the treatment of viral reactivation, which may improve outcome even in non-virally induced sepsis. Like gancyclovir has been demonstrated to measurably decrease CMV reactivation in mice. However, human trials have failed to show any benefit. There have been numerous other drugs developed against CMV, which could be effective in preventing viral reactivation. Next slide, please. The novel approaches to viral sepsis therapy include with the advent of research into personalized medicine, idea of treating host immune response rather than the infection in sepsis has become popular. By understanding the host response to pathogens and modifying it, we may prevent serious infections that can result in sepsis or sepsis-like illness. One common strategy is the use of immunomodulatory molecules to prevent harmful uh, excessive effects of inflammation. Immunomodulation in sepsis aims to decrease the harmful effects of excessive inflammation by altering or counteracting the effects of inflammatory pathways such as TNF-alpha or, or the use of broad anti-inflammatory molecules such as corticosteroids. Most trials, however, with using immunomodulatory drugs have failed. This approach has fallen out of favor. However, with adjunctive corticosteroid therapy may be beneficial and can be considered in patients with VZV encephalitis or HSV encephalitis. Now with the failure, next slide please. With the failure of uh, this approach, Next slide, please. The Can I have the next slide, please? In recent years, the approach, we have taken a reversed approach, that is an immunostimulatory approach has become very popular. This is, this is because a large study has shown that uh, 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 viral, most deaths due to viral sepsis occur on the day three of the infection, where um, immune, immune response actually fall, uh, is, uh, is falling. 
So our immunostimulatory approach may work for viral sepsis. That was the plank of, um, uh, that was the hypothesis. So one proposed method of doing this is the selective application of immunostimulatory cytokines such as IL-7 or GMCSF, which contribute to more effective viral clearance. In order for the treatment of the immune response to work as a meaningful way to decrease overall mortality, a better understanding of how the immune response to infections contributes to the development of sepsis is essentially needed. Next slide. The PD-1, that is a program death one ligand, is a promising target in this regard. PD-1 has been implicated in the development of immunosuppressive phase of sepsis by inducing apoptosis of affected T cells. Continued elevation of PD-1 expression in septic patients has been found to correlate with high patient mortality. So blocking PD-1 may allow vastly improved clearance of serious vi viral infection. As um, already discussed, other targets like the gut dysbiosis or endothelial dysfunction are promising potential targets. Next. Next, please. Next, please. Now, fungal bloodstream infection or the sepsis, we have had a very extensive discussion on this. Severe sepsis and septic shock uh, are major causes of admission and death in ICUs globally with hospital mortality ranging between 30 to 50 percent. IDSA 2016 guidelines on treatment of candidiasis in various settings have been given. Um, uh, there is a concept of inappropriate initial antibiotic therapy which increases mortality. So the bottom line is any culture positive uh, fungal infection must not be denied antifungal treatment and um, the candins are now the first line of treatment, especially in case of bloodstream infection because of their fungicidal effect as against the azoles, which are fungistatic. Studies show that candida colonization, other risk factors may guide prophylactic antifungal therapy and prevent sepsis. Next, please. What, what if it is a culture negative uh, case with a strong suspicion? Given the overall importance of early appropriate therapy of septic shock attributed to candida infection as an outcome determinant, clinical strategies facilitating the attainment of this goal are needed. Studies of biomarkers and rapid microbiological diagnostic techniques are promising, but more study is required. Similarly, clinical and colonization-based, one, one um, prediction tool is use of candida index may assist in the identification of patients with candidemia. Unfortunately, these instruments lack adequate accuracy or can result in treatment delay that may take, make them less than ideal clinical tools. A strategy of empiric or preemptive therapy of septic shock with antifungals is reasonable whenever patients are at risk for infection with candida species. But here, patient stratification and risk identification is a very important criteria. However, such an has, uh, uh, approach uh, has the risk of promoting unnecessary antifungal therapy. Therefore, if empirical or preemptive therapy for candida infection is employed in septic shock, then efforts to de-escalate therapy should be instituted as soon as clinically and microbiologically indicated to avoid further promotion of resistance. Next, please. Biomarkers in sepsis. Now, uh, the, with the background of discussion that we have had, early diagnosis and targeted management are necessary to reduce the mortality of, of sepsis. However, difference in physiological response to infection vary widely. The signs and symptoms of sepsis are nonspecific, making early diagnosis very difficult. Even then, a number of potential biomarkers for the diagnosis of sepsis have been developed. These molecules are mainly involved in the initial pathogenesis of innate immune response, in many cases, they show prognostic value as well as diagnostic value. But in our case, what is more important than prognostic or diagnostic value is the differential value, whether a biomarker is able to differentiate appropriately between bacterial and fungal infection or viral infection. So next, please. No such bio um, um, biomarkers are as yet widely popular, however, uh, studies are on. So serum biomarkers to differentiate between gram-negative, gram-positive and fungal infections in febrile patients. This was a study published in JMM. Uh, next, please. Where they have done a... Next, please. 
A total of 567 patients were taken. The serum levels of several biomarkers like the IL-6, PCT, neutrophil leukocyte ratio and CRP were compared in, amongst four groups, uh, gram-positive, gram-negative, fungal and culture-negative. And they were statistically analyzed. So the conclusion of this study is that IL-6 uh, is a promising serum biomarker to discriminate amongst bacterial infection and fungal infection in febrile bloodstream infection patients. In, a, in addition, NNR is valuable to discriminate fungal infections from gram-positive infections in febrile patients, but not gram-negatives. Next, please. Diagnostic stewardship. Uh, in order to make diagnostic stewardship successful, a rapid non-culture-based diagnostic method for non-cultivable organisms is mandatory. The clinical team needs to de-escalate broad-spectrum high-end antibiotics at the first opportunity uh, when the diagnosis is confirmed. A two-way communication between lab and ICU for speedy sharing of results is must. Other lab parameters in conjunction to culture or PCR results need to be studied to make diagnostic stewardship more effective. Next, please. So the take-home message is not all sepsis is caused by bacteria. So antibacterials, although our use is mandatory, may not be of much help in select cases. Suspect other etiology and tailor treatments accordingly if your patients do not respond to initial antibiotic therapy. Rapid microbiological diagnosis and biomarker-based diagnosis are needed. And we need a lot of study on this going forward. However, their availability is suboptimal due to lack of understanding of pathogenesis. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce uh, the next speaker here, uh, Professor Dr. Malini Cooper. At the outset, I thank Dr. Raman Sadana and Dr. Lina for giving us this opportunity to be here. What a great learning opportunity and wonderful sessions that uh, transpired throughout the day. Dr. Malini uh, Kapoor um, has more than uh, 100 publications. She is a professor, microbiology officer in charge, biomedical waste unit and Kaya Kalp, VMC, VMMC and SGH Delhi, has more than 100 publications and delivered more than 100 lectures as, as a faculty, both at the national and international levels in microbiology, microbiology and mycology and BMW. Uh, she's also authored three book chapters on, on the same subject. She's a member of various committees and uh, prestigious offices. Um, she's an expert committee at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Lab Diagnosis and Therapeutics. Uh, she's conducted multiple national training sessions on Kaya Kalp uh, guidelines as part of the ministry's program. Um, she's a WHO CEO Fellowship on Healthcare Waste Management 2016. She's guided and co-guided theses related to mycology and microbiology. And she's been on the advisory board at a global level for Journal of Global Infectious Diseases and a counselor at IGNU on its CWM. Ma'am, what a privilege to host you here on this wonderful platform. Over to you, Dr. Malini. Uh, thank you, Dr. Usha Banerjee for a very gracious introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Not yet. No, ma'am, please share screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, please. No, it went off again. So it went off? Okay, wait. Is my screen visible now? Yes, please start a yeah. slideshow. Yeah, yeah, okay. At the outset, uh, I'm very thankful to Hisi, Dr. Raban Sardana, for uh, giving me a very pertinent topic which is very close to my heart. That is uh, healthcare waste management. It's an important neglected public health issue. And Government of India is signatory to so many documents, 2015 United Nations document on standard, standard. developmental goal of which uh, 
uh, waste management is an important standard developmental goal number six government of india is also signatory to cop 26 that held was held in glasgow last year related to wa waste management so i just uh come to um, the point that sorry to slide... interrupt you please yeah. start a slideshow uh Okay, wait. Uh, in the bottom, ma'am. In the bottom. Yeah, it's already. We see 100%. Yes. Uh, uh, can you see now? Yeah, okay. No, ma'am. So, it's, uh, in the right side bottom, yeah, click yeah, on la right. Yes, yes, click on this. Yeah, yeah, I have tapped on that. Yeah, okay. So uh, these are the various types of healthcare waste. You have biomedical waste, plastic waste, e-waste, hazardous waste, solid waste in the uh, ICUs, in the labs, in the wards, in the emergency rooms. These are associated with these all legislation, national legislations. They have important implications on biomedical waste management. For example, the plastic waste management rules, they got notified last year and they have implications on biomedical waste management rules the plastic bags the disposable bags which we are using they need to be of more than equal to 75 microns and by end of this year i mean from the early next year we need to have more than equal to 120 microns these are the various national legislations and guidelines right from 1998 then we had the most comprehensive biomedical waste management. Dr. Malni, your slides need to move, please. Uh, are they moving? No, they are not. You're on the legislation slide. It is not appearing on the screen. Okay. Now it's visible. Dr. Malni, uh, you are still not on the slideshow. You have to go on slideshow. Yeah, wait. I'll just end my show. Um, please re uh, resharing. I'll just reshare it. I'll just reshare my slides. Is it uh, visible now, like the legislation and guidelines? No, there is no slide on the screen. Okay, wait, I'll just reshare it. Are my slides visible now? Coming. They're coming. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, these are the various legislations and guidelines right from 1998 to 2016. Then we had uh, the uh, CPCB guidelines. They came out in COVID, but they had important implications for uh, laboratory waste, if you read them carefully. And uh, then uh, these are the various international guidelines which came up during COVID and the most recent one on WHO, Global Analysis of Healthcare Waste and COVID Waste Guidelines, one of the authors I am. Solid Waste and India is also signatory to so many documents like recent being of 2015 United Nations on Standard Developmental Goals and Waste Management is one of the important SDDs. Then COP26, which was last year. And uh, apart from the biomedical waste, we have the solid waste, which is there in the wards and the emergency rooms. The hazardous waste is there. The radioactive waste, if the patient is uh, of cancer, you need to follow the radioactive waste guidelines. This is the radioactive waste disposal and the waste storage room, which is surrounded. The waste bins and the containers, they are surrounded by the lead bricks and e-waste if we can see the icu uh, the uh, automated uh, monitors and the automated equipments in the laboratories we see important e-waste components they are covered under extended producer responsibility then uh, plastic waste management rules uh, they say that more than equal to 75 microns Hazards of unsafe biomedical waste management. Everybody is aware of the infectious diseases, the chronic heart and lung diseases. And of course, as microbiologists, we all know the antimicrobial resistance and Ministry of Environment is also working on the uh, effluents and the antimicrobial resistance in the effluent. They have come up with the Gazette notification on streptomycin and tetracyclines being banned 
in use in uh, farming and animal industry. So waste management is an important commitment of government of India. 2016 rules, their amendments, everybody knows. I will not dwell on that. The, you just need to upgrade your policies of the hospital as per the recent guidelines, your IC material as per the recent guidelines. Most of the hospitals have the segregation at source followed by their uh, transport to the common way site and they are linked with the common facility operator. Very soon CPCB will come up with the primary health center guidelines wherein the primary health centers are not linked with the common facility area, especially in the rural and the far off areas. Uh, in any tertiary care or uh, district level hospital, you need to have a waste management committee and uh, and barcoding is also essential. The, all the bins and the bags, they need to have a specific barcode. And for occupational safety, we have two vaccinations mandated under rules that is uh, hepatitis B and tetanus. But from 2020, we have COVID vaccination. And if monkeypox, the cases increase, you need to give to the waste handlers the monkeypox vaccine of the countries which do not have monkeypox vaccine can uh, give the smallpox vaccination. Training has to be dedicated. Why I repeatedly say department wise because the departments like the anesthesia or the ICU or the emergency medicines which are rarely covered are covered in specific trainings and uh, you could have the uh, include the recent guidelines and uh, formulate the policy and cover in your departmental trainings. Monitoring is you can have a simple performer or a WHO performer is there for monitoring on biomedical waste, or you can devise your biomedical waste app also. COVID waste just has two components, double bagging and the labeling, rest other principles and the practices under rules are same. So I come to the topic that is uh, in the emergency rooms, the ICUs and uh, the laboratories. So what has changed because of government of India being signatory to so many documents, the yellow category waste you will find has increased, uh, is it has decreased substantially. What was there in the yellow category in the laboratory waste has gone to the red category after pre-treatment. So human anatomical, ana, uh, animal anatomical, soiled waste, solid waste, and expired drugs are all yellow as earlier. The discarded linen mattresses, beddings, and the uh, the triple ply or the single ply mask made up of this material, it goes in uh, yellow category, the N95, then the chemical liquid waste, the discarded samples, aspirates are made safe. That is pre-treatment with sodium hypochlorite. Of course, the best practice is, of course, uh, autoclaving or microwaving the samples. But uh, you could do with sodium hypochlorite also before mixing with wastewater. And the endowasher fluids, they need to have a chemical uh, liquid waste uh, uh, holding time of eight hours neutralized with its specific neutralizer. Like if you're using glutaraldehyde for the end washers, then uh, uh, sodium bisulfide or PHA needs glycine, then a pH check. And uh, you need to have a safe that is environmentally safe pH that is between 4.5 to 9.5. And uh, these categories of waste, especially the culture plates, the uh, endotoxin assays after their respective pretreatment, the vacutainers, they go in red category. So there is a change, there is a decrease in the yellow category and everything is shifted to red, the laboratory waste, especially the plastic disposables. And liquid waste needs pretreatment. There's a beautiful uh, document, I'll be showing that. You need to have uh, material safety data sheets of your disinfectants. And uh, there's a document from uh, like that is from the Ball State University, a US uh, university, wherein they document this. They have the environmentally safe pH should be between 5.5 to 9.5. And what are the environmentally safe, uh, wherein uh, you can do the sewer disposals, like they mentioned, like formaldehyde, if it is less than 10%, it is your acceptable. Uh, and uh, uh, very soon you will be having um, important documents from CPCB on the liquid waste management. So that was the yellow category. Uh, the laboratory waste from the yellow category 
after pretreatment goes into the red category. So I'll just show you that contaminated waste. Red is for the infected plastics, uh, the PP, the gloves, all kind of gloves, the uh, the coveralls, the apron, the goggles, and uh, gloves after mutilation, of course, they go in red category, the cut syringes. And what about the disposables used in the ICUs or the emergency rooms? So all these circuits, all these, uh, you know, the uh, ventilator or the tracheostomy uh, tubes and all that, they all go in red category. And uh, these are the other circuits which I'm showing. They all go in red category. The bedpan, if you want to dispose of, again, red category. And uh, urinary catheter, the nasal prongs, all red cat category. And now this is an important aspect, the laboratory waste. If you open the CPCB guidelines 2022, the rapid antigen detection kit after pretreatment, the uh, all uh, the rapid antigen test kits, the ELISA plates, the gene expert cartridges, they all go after pretreatment into red category. And so what requires uh, autoclaving, that is log six reduction, it is the culture broths or the culture plates or the viral culture bottles. Uh, the vacutainer, they all require pretreatment by log six reduction, that is by autoclaving or microwaving. And uh, as far as the sharps are con concerned, they are in white category. Uh, not all sharps can be mutilated. The needle cutters, they are uh, uh, preferred over the needle destroyers because of the biosafety and the fire safety issues. Then uh, the ampules, they will go in glass. And so what has changed? The vaccine vials, which is made, which are made up of glass after pretreatment, you could do by sodium hypochlorite or by uh, autoclaving. They go into its respective category of glass. The glass slides, cover slip. Also after pretreatment, you could do by autoclaving or you could do by sodium hypochlorite. They go in the uh, blue category. And uh, you need to have the ETPs and STPs if you are a bedded facility with an online monitoring system. The effluents needs to be tested. And now what are the important points to ponder? Urgent interventions we have done in terms of system capacity, greater resources, processes, on especially on the biomedical waste management rules. But what about the implementation of other rules, the solid rules, the e-waste? They also require... Uh, important and urgent interventions because COVID was an eye opener. How uh, the non compliance in the solid waste management rules can make the system of biomedical waste haywire. Important uh, 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 trainings we have done health checkup, immunization, inspections, and the equipment related records we have maintained. And there would be further amendments coming up, guidelines would be there, especially to decrease the yellow category waste because the focus is on non-burn technologies and because the pandemics, whether COVID or monkeypox, or <laughs> they will be coming. So we need to be prepared for that. And home care waste needs uh, urgent interventions. Remember that not all sharps can be mutilated. Combination of sharps and plastic needs to be treated as sharp waste. Return back to the manufacturer, the big, the stapler guns. E-waste needs to be covered under extended producer responsibilities. And uh, the vendors, they are given on your respective state pollution control board. Remember that for e-waste, you have the uh, recyclers and dismantlers, two categories of list. Gray areas definitely would be there. Whatever is not documented in the rules, follow the international guidelines. Common facility operators are not enough in number. The healthcare facilities, which are located in far off areas in the hills and et cetera, they need to notify their state pollution control board and the uh, central pollution control board. And because our ultimate aim is green and clean hospitals under Swachh Bharat, under WHO Roadmap to One Health. And uh, since Government of India is signatory to so many international documents, so uh, we are 
to abide by the rules and there would be amendments and certain guidelines coming up in future. Thank you. Dr. Malini, uh, thank you. I so hope much. I retain the time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for such a short, crisp, and informative and interesting session. Such an important topic biomedical waste generation and management in OTT sepsis conditions. Wonderful. And I personally learned a lot. For me, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Manju Joseph, who works with me as a charge nurse at the prestigious. Indraprastha Apollo Hospital in the BMT unit, who has uh, a qualification in BSc nursing with more than 18 years of uh, experience. And she's a member of many prestigious councils in the nursing profession. Manju, uh, you are a significant part of uh, the clinical outcomes in this hospital, and you are a true advocate of patient safety and infection control. So over to you as the last speaker for this session. Request you to kindly keep on time. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful introduction about me. And uh, I'll, I'll do the maximum, ma'am. Ma'am, is my screen uh, visible, ma'am? I think it's coming up. Yes. If you could go to a full screen, yes. So here I would be presenting management of sepsis in the critical care unit. I'll request all your attention to a case scenario. A patient named Mr. X with a 21-year-old male a resident of Uganda, diagnosis of relapsed ALL. There was no comorbidities. The patient's relevant history was a bone marrow transplant done, and the findings were severely neutropenic or mucositis with watery diarrhea. Blood culture, the Klebsiella species, chest CT, it was bacterial or fungal. Drugs, he was on as antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral, and obviously omenosuppressants. Focus, focus of infection, chest, central line, gut translocation. A case scenario, Mr. X, a case of severe plastic anemia after TBA-based conditioning had undergone an allergenic stem cell transplant. On the day plus six of his transplant, he was apparently well throughout the day. Unfortunately, at the night, Mr. X had complained of a choking sensation and suddenly he started deteriorating. His saturation dropped down to 80, then to 60, later unresponsive. Emergency management system, or CODDU, has activated. The team came, tried to put an endotracheal tube which failed due to inflammation and swelling in oral cavity due to the mucositis and throat. An LMA was inserted and the patient was put on ventilator. That night has passed by the critical care team along with neuro anesthesia team, tried and succeeded in the endotracheal intubation and Mr. X has been continued on the ventilator support. He was running high fever, loose motions, a blood culture sent and that has added fuel to the fire again that was found to be Klebsiella, a nightmare to any member in the critical care unit. The next day, his blood pressure dropped slightly, along with tachycardia. A fluid syringe was given with a two liter of normal saline and without wasting time, antibiotics were upgraded and noradrenaline was started and later tapered off once the blood pressure settled to a satisfactory level. Weaning of ventilator was tried on him and unfortunately he was not tolerating, hence a tracheostomy was performed. God was kind enough with the doctors and nurses were on the toes all the time. He has sailed through the journey slowly, safely. And on the day plus 25 of transplant, we got discharged him hale and hearty, except with the tracheostomy. Yes, I here would say time matters, time saves, act on time and act quickly. And by this case scenario, we, the transplant team, has actually learned even in the neutropenic time, the patient can be saved. The definition of sepsis, I know uh, one of the eminent Doctor has told this is not the uh, sepsis definition now, but please, sepsis is defined as the overwhelming response of the human body and like threatening reaction to a probable or documented infection which results in tissue hypoperfusion and organ dysfunction. The nurse, else who could be the execution of all these? Monitor the patient and prompt reporting of patient condition to the physician. Monitor exact detailed reports to the patient records. Order interpret and evaluate diagnostic tests to identify and assess the patient condition, to manage the critical reports, to implement all the preventive actions in ICU, 
all assessment score yes we need a nurse to execute all the orders here comes the red flag or the diagnostic criteria for resepsis hyperthermia more than 38.3 degrees celsius or hypothermia less than 36 degrees celsius heart rate of less than 90 more than 90 beats per minute tachypnea altered mental status hyperglycemia hypotension systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and map of less than 70 or a significant change of more than 40 mm of hg in adults are considered as a red flag severe sepsis on the other hand reflects a massive amount of organ dysfunction such as decreased urine output poor creatinine clearance lactic levels above normal mm -hmm. levels and persistent hypotension so how could we manage sepsis the sepsis six which should be initiated in one hour give high flow oxygen take blood culture give antibiotic start iv fluid resuscitation check lactate monitor urine output and for the nurses out there it is abc as air enriched with ot oxygen antibiotics after blood culture blood culture blood gas with lactate crystalloid bolus catheter urinary and obviously peripheral iv access here is the sepsis bundle again we are the one to execute it the crucial one hour what all are we supposed to do the time zero or time of presentation is defined as the triage in the emergency department if persisting from another care venue from the earliest chart annotation consistent with all elements of sepsis what are we supposed to do measure the lactate level obtain blood culture before administering antibiotic please make sure we are not wasting time there administer broad spectrum antibiotic begin rapid administration of 30 ml per kg crystalloid for hypotension or lactate more than 4 millimol per liter apply vasopressors if hypotensive during or after fluid resuscitation to maintain a mean arterial pressure of more than 65 mm of hg yes here comes the sepsis bundle within 3 hours you measure lactate level obtain blood culture aerobic and anaerobic prior to administration of antibiotic cbc and differential chest x ray broad spectrum spectrum antibiotic ct abdomen or chest pelvis yes we have to settle the patient before that pros calcitonin level administer all the antibiotics empiric broad spectrum therapy with one or more antibiotic microbials to cover all likely pathogens which includes bacterial fungal and viral here comes the preparedness of nurses a critical care unit bed with ventilator to be kept ready a well arranged intubation truly yes it should be with us keep the drugs ready for ventilation sedation muscle relaxation and dinotrophs align the instruments and article for sample collection assemble enough number of equipments like infusion pump syringe pump bed former etc get ready for any emergency which may arise that can include a cardiac arrest continuity of care yes obviously this is the responsibility of the physician may be but yes we are there to execute all of them and to observe them correction of 5h and 5t the 5h include hypoxemia hypovolemia hypo or hyperkalemia hypo or hyperperemia and hydrogen ions the five t's are tension pneumothorax tamponade thrombosis thromboembolism toxins or tablets which can be the drug overdose identification of organ failure again becomes our major responsibility yes we are supposed to see whether the patient has any problem with the circulation the hypotension the map is not maintained more than 65 or your systolic blood pressure is not maintained more than 90 we are supposed to be on to perfusion we are supposed to see the lactic acid it should be less than 2 acute kidney injury if the creatinine is more than 2 or urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 2 hours acute liver injury bilirubin more than 2 or inr more than 1.5 respiratory failure new initiation of bipap or invasive mechanical ventilation and if the patient platelet level drop down to 150 as yes, we should be alert infection prevention bundles there are a lot strict hand hygiene and aseptic precautions assess for the need of any invasive devices and remove it as soon as it could be maintaining strict sepsis for the central lines to prevent klebsi follow klebsi bundle follow cotel bundle and follow wap bundle there are many more care of a ventilator patient to keep the tidal volume 6 Centi, uh, 
6 cc per kg, plateau pressure to 20 to 30 centimeter of HG to see the modes are as per the requirement of the patient to keep the patient with head and elevated at 30 to 45 degrees Celsius, sorry, 30 to 45 degree. To do the section, preferably a close to section, oral care with chlorhexidine, follow VAP bundle to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia. Special ICU needs special care. Yes, we are equipped with all type of special ICUs here. And they are neonatal ICU, pe pe pediatric ICU, transplant ICUs, and bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy unit. Nurses role in management of sepsis. Nurses play a fundamental role in detecting changes in physiological observations that could indicate the onset of sepsis. A nurse who is at the bedside 24 by 7, her duties and responsibilities are numerous and infinite. I cannot enlist them in a slide, but yes, I'm trying my level best. Early recognition and appropriate management of a patient with safe, sepsis saves lives. Receive the patient in ICU, assess cube sofa score, collecting blood sample for arterial blood gas, blood cultures, and other necessary investigation. Initiate the sep initiating the sepsis bundles, Continuous monitoring of the patient for vital signs, urine output, glucose monitoring, identify the early warning signs and complications. To maintain the patency of peripheral or central lines. Titration of vasopressors and administration of other drugs. Assess for therapeutic effectiveness and side effects of drugs. Manage the nutritional deficiency with the help of a nutritionist. To look for any signs and symptoms of organ dysfunction. To follow infection control practices to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, catheter-associated bloodstream infection, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, keratitis, bed sore, DVT, and many more. To follow all the bundles. To assess and manage the patient with pain, sedation, GCS, Braden score. Collaborating with other teams. Management of equipment family support and counseling, documentation. I have put it at the last, but that is not the least. It is a lot. United Nations WHO Roadmap to World Health. I am. Hereby, I just say I am proud to be a nurse and proud to be the part of this life-saving team. We, the ICU nurses here at Apollo, would proudly proclaim we have a true leader for us and a supporting medical team. Thank you, Manju. That was brilliant. I think I'm I'm very proud to have you on this panel. And thank you, Dr. Raman, for including a nurse um, as a panelist in, in such an important topic because everything rides on the shoulders of the nurses. We might have great protocols and policies, but it's the nurses who deliver it to the T. Um, I would proudly say that the sepsis survivors are those who defy all odds to be alive, thriving and grateful to the ICU team that saved their life and especially remain grateful to the nurses. So wonderful to have such a wonderful presentation here. To sum up, I would just say that the history of healthcare has been like an epic involving service, sacrifice, trials, triumphs, achievements, ambitions. Last decade and a half, we've really come a long way. And I think we have to accelerate our pace and calibrate our speed. To me personally, Dr. Raman, today was like uh, what I witnessed was obsessive optimism and a persuasive passion with a quest for lifelong learning on this unique webinar on OTT, which uh, kept us amused and forced us to learn. For me personally, it's been so much of takeaway, and I'm sure we will implement what we learned so that our patients benefit. Thanks to all the speakers of this panel. And over to you, Dr. Raman, uh, for the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Uh, Ms. Manju, uh, sister. I mean, that's that's wonderful. In fact, I have never heard a better lecture uh, from a nursing colleague. Um, you know, so lovely. Uh, you, you said everything what it was uh, to be required. I am uh, sorry that we are running quite late. Otherwise, I would have kept on listening and asked you some more things too. So, um, Dr. Sumi. Uh, I, I think it's, we'll take very few questions about two of them, two or three of them. Uh, Dr. Mandel has to leave. And I think, uh, I believe that uh, the rest of the faculty, the chair, uh, are they there from the morning? Uh, 
Dr. Yes, Raman, I have been there since morning, but now I have to take sure. I, I, I know I, that. I, I, I know that. Raman, I know that, uh, uh, Raman, yeah. so Thank I you so think, much. Yeah, I think uh, you, you are very absolutely right. Let's take only very few questions because I think everybody has so, something. A couple other of questions. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, very few. Uh, yeah, so Dr. Sumi, we'll just uh, request you. Uh, Amit is there. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Mayor, yes. Uh, can I... Is Dr. Osi Abraham there? Sir is there? It's, it's quite late. Actually, we are... Uh, thank late. you, sir, for, uh, for being there for us, sir. Yeah, um, I, I understand that. And due apologies. I know you are a strict disciplinarian. Um, so, uh, yes, but there are there were technical glitches. And um, sometimes, uh, you know, people just uh, flow with the... So, um, uh, Sumi, I'll leave it to you. Uh, I think we have, sir, and uh, a few questions, Dr. Mayer, uh, from you and Dr. Amit. And um, I'll just uh, chip in, um, uh, uh, you know, just expand on the episode, uh, which I wanted to bring about from... Uh, uh, thank you. From Dr. Sudha Kansal. Sir, thank you so much, sir. This was a huge learning experience. I think one doesn't get such an opportunity of listening to such uh, amazing talks, learned a lot through the entire thing. I'd just like to make a few comments and one question, although I have a feeling that the speakers are not there, but anyway. Uh, would just like to point out that many people did talk about 40% culture negative cases could be fungal, bacterial, viral, but we do need to remember they could be causes other than infection. So diabetic ketoacidosis, pancreatitis, pancreatitis, adrenal insufficiency, cytotoxicosis. So it's not like all 40% need to be infectious. It could be so many other causes which we need to keep in mind. And that's where the other than steps, other than bacterial sepsis, this point I think needs to be just kept in mind. Uh, what one has understood, and what I think has understood all through, is that there is no substitute for immediate resuscitation in any case of sepsis with appropriate antibiotics have to be given, whether we think it is infectious, non-infectious, viral, bacterial, with relevant investigations done in the first hour. And finally, a good detailed history and a good clinical acumen, essential at all strata of healthcare. Now, microbiology is sitting in the lab, but we do need to develop a good clinical acumen, and we can get that from the detailed history, which our clinical colleagues would kindly share with us. And sepsis is dealt at all levels of hospitals, from the rudimentary services to uh, state-of-art facilities. And it's interesting where too little support and too much support can both be uh, difficult in making the right management choices. For example, if I have a flare and that throws up, uh, that throws up uh, uh, say, an immunosuppressed patient and XCR gram-negative bacilli, a rhinovirus, as well as an estrogen. Which one should one take seriously? And that's where the clinical acumen has to be at the forefront of all uh, such managements. I was hoping that you would have some more discussion on procalcitonin and CRP. In management of OTT, Dr. Sudha did mention PCT in her uh, discussions, but we could not understand whether they were used to determine whether it was bacterial or non-bacterial and was it used as a tool for antimicrobial stewardship. And finally, I'm, I would have liked to ask this of our speakers about this biosis. Now we know that gut is the motor of multiple organ failure. So can fecal microbiota transplant have a role in management of sepsis where we are unable to get, you know, despite everything done, we are unable to really, really resuscitate the patient. So that's the question from my side. And uh, I can um, take questions from the other people later. So, uh, any of the speakers would like to address this? So maybe uh, I think it was a wonderful uh, uh, afternoon of, uh, you know, other than talking about other than bacterial infections. And I think that's something that often, uh, particularly the parasitic session was important, uh, particularly the one with uh, strongylitis where a bronchial asthma patient presenting with uh, a right lower lobe pneumonia. Uh, we have a couple of questions, maybe with Dr. Abraham being there. Can I, uh, maybe you could probably, I don't think Dr. Ekta Gupta is here with us. Uh, so would it be possible for you to answer this question of how to approach uh, in CMV or EBV sepsis? What are the diagnostic clues and what 
would be the idle samples? That's the second question. Third question is any role of quantitative load in prognosis and treatment? I think you're the best uh, to answer this rather than any of us. Dr. Abraham, sir. Um, sir, good afternoon. Again, I would like to emphasize uh, what I said earlier. Uh, sepsis is only a syndrome. Uh, syndrome uh, currently defined as organ dysfunction as measured on the SOFA score. Uh, and this is due to an infection and the dysregulated host immune response. Uh, but the way infection is this, uh, uh, defined in the guidelines, in the definition, there is no definition of how an infection is diagnosed. It's proven or possible infection diagnosed by the clinician. <laughs> Can cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr viruses uh, cause sepsis? The answer is yes, in the appropriate host. And who is the appropriate host? Somebody who is severely immunocompromised, uh, it can cause, especially T-cell-mediated immune deficiencies. Uh, like uh, advanced HIV, uh, somebody who had an allergenic bone marrow transplantation and uh, developed a bad GVHD and lost some terrible immunosuppression. It can cause uh, infection, multi-organ uh, failure. Uh, but it is uh, reactivation of latent infection. Data from our own bone marrow transplant program, uh, almost every individual screen is CMB0 positive, and in the appropriate setting, this will reactivate. So we now know that uh, reactivation is followed by CMV viremia, and the uh, dynamics of CMV replication, higher the rate of replication, higher the CMV load, more the risk of developing uh, organ specific disease, the gut, the lung, and in PLHIV, the central nervous system and the eye. Uh, so that is why the strategy of preemptive therapy in somebody who had an allergenic bone marrow transplantation, once they have engrafted, you do CMV viral loads. And once it goes above a preset threshold, you give them, uh, give them ganciclovir uh, till and you treat to negativity. So uh, CMV and uh, Epstein-Barr viruses are problems only in appropriate hosts. And uh, there also you would uh, either look for consistent clinical syndrome or appropriate tests. Uh, uh, viremia is equal to disease only in CNS and lung. All the others you would like to get a tissue sample, uh, look for uh, pathological changes and uh, CMB inclusion bodies or immunohistochemistry positive. So, uh, we should not leave this uh, uh, seminar with the in, in impression that you need empiric therapy against uh, cytomegalovirus or Epstein virus. Epstein virus, anyway, there is no specific antiviral therapy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think there could have been a better answer uh, other than uh, somebody like you to answer this question. Uh, there's one question which probably Dr. Meher could take. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham, sir. Uh, this is basically uh, asked by Dr. Gargi Mishra, and she wants to know. Uh, an explanation on the beta D glucan index in fungital uh, uh, assay. Uh, how is it calculated? Dr. Meher, uh, would you want to take that? No. Or Dr. No, maybe no. Dr. Namita, if you could probably help us answer that question. Um, see, um, I, I think I will pass this because we are not calculating any index as of now. So I don't want to give information which is incorrect, Amit, really. Maybe Raman can throw some light on it. I don't know. We are not doing this. Leave it to the master. Leave it to the master. So we will yeah. ask Dr. Arun Chakrabarti and uh, let audience know about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, correct. So we have I audience so. uh, particulars with us. Yeah. So we'll pass on that. But so. to answer your question, Meher, about uh, dysbiosis and uh, you know fecal transplant. So uh, you know, I, I I think this is a very fascinating field about dysbiosis. And uh, yes, everything starts in the gut. But the question is that probably in, uh, in diseases like sepsis, it is the alteration of the gut permeability, which is the problem. And uh, maybe not really the bacteria which are present over there. So uh, I don't know if uh, fecal transplantation is uh, really, I mean, a long-term solution uh, for, uh, uh, for treatment of something like sepsis. Or, uh, you know, because the, the pathogenesis is not uh, 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 going to be treated. It's just the, you're just changing the, the uh, bacteria over there. But this is a very fascinating field 
which is going to prove uh, very very beneficial maybe in the in the future but uh, as of now i don't know how much of relevance it has Laura, I, i see dr hena uh, along in fact so both of us uh, and dr lena so we have done a few uh, yes you have you have yes. tickle transplants and, i know uh, i know that uh, we, in all our cases uh, we had some very good results i For still believe IBD, that right? it is Ah, for IBD. Yeah, main, ah. major, majorly, majorly for that. Majorly for IBD. Ah. Uh, we we um, wanted to do it for uh, uh, for multidegradation organisms also, but there is a very especially in um, you know uh, uh, you know patients undergoing uh, liver transplant and uh, but there is a very small window yes. uh, which they give yes. and uh, there is not much time so one has to you know unlike. With IBD, where there is a time where we can yes, yes. work with the uh, with the patients uh, and yes. the person who is donating. Um, so here it is very very less, and we don't want to take any uh, harsher risk. You know, something Correct. else can get into the uh, system Correct. if we work too fast. So that Correct. is there, but uh, that is on our agenda. I think. um next few months should see us uh, yes. performing many many more uh, microbiome and antibiotic uh, resistance is a very yeah exactly especially especially on on i may be permitted to uh, yeah uh, if i may be permitted i wanted to share we did a very small study meher uh, we compared procalcitonin versus crp latex and crp quantitative uh, microbiology here in our institute we were doing all these three and we compared their uh, predictive value for uh, sepsis uh, bacteremia basically not sepsis bacteremia and we found that uh, a combination of using three crp quantitative and crp and procalcitonin was giving the uh, best results in matters of sensitivity and specificity and alone uh, separately procalcitonin or crp uh, were not such a good indicator so we had very small sample size i am planning to put a project and then we can do that so i i have a so small question problem with pcp uh, with procalcitonin is that uh, people don't start up at the right time yes so yes. single single uh, uh, a time when uh, you know you just take uh, with your whims and fancies oh just send it across let us see how much is a procal it doesn't work like that yeah So yeah. uh, with all the thesis that we had on PCT in uh, neonates or pediatrics or in um, in, in adults uh, in pneumonitis, uh, community acquired pneumonia, uh, or in um, hospital associated pneumonia, uh, you know they have to be done systematically, and then seen. Then it becomes a beautiful way of uh, prognos, progno you know, getting to the prognosis or knowing about whether the patient is going to go down there. uh irrespective of whatever we do so uh, the, it all depends upon how how do you treat your biomarkers it is nothing like you know a single or two readings here and there are going to be now i just want to before i forget i wanted to bring about a um, a particular pertinent point in the case discussion on trypanosomiasis see there is a there is a reason for putting up that case and that was Uh, that um, uh, just after starting sura, I mean, forty-eight hours after that, the patient started going rapidly downhill. Mm. You know, uh, that was one of the very tough decisions when we sat down together um, with critical care people and uh, the internal medicine person, and uh, uh, we thought about what could be the reason because if the patient is deteriorating uh, because of the worm itself. uh because of uh, trypanosoma itself then probably uh, they say that it is better to give intrathecal uh, approach go in for uh, you know csf and then uh, look at intrathecal approach and but then there is a big problem that once you traumatize uh, that portion uh, during uh, lp or uh, during the procedure the chances are trypanosomes will go get into that um, uh, you know uh, in, in the cns and it is very difficult uh, then to uh, you know eradicate so that there's a big risk at that time second thing which was coming to mind was shall we indulge in uh, so, you know um, enhancing or uh, putting another drug to it uh, that wouldn't have had much of effect 
So what we thought about at that time, I got my primary teaching from what Dr. Bhalla, our um, serology teacher. He, she told, you know, while teaching us syphilis, she told about Zelix uh, Huxemer reaction. And that is exactly a similar episode which happens with when you introduce Surami um, uh, with, uh, with Trypanos. So we just wanted to bring out that. And just introduction of uh, steroids at that point in time, and this lady just came up like anything. So uh, it was an immunological onslaught because Suramin had broken down trypanosomes, and the body reacted very fervently to the components of trypanosomes. So that was something which, which I wanted to bring about, that it is not only the parasite, but also the uh, components of breakdown. And this happens with bacteria also. It happens when we introduce broad spectrum uh, antimicrobials in certain patients. Raman, so, does this happen with uh, uh, does this happen with cysticercus also when you give the treatment? The same thing happens. Yeah, it, it would yeah. happen with any any anything. Mistake. Yeah, what I anything. said that you know one has to apply certain things from your yeah. old teachings. You know, teachers were fantastic. Those, those teachers were excellent. I mean, I can see you know when I see Doctor Professor Osi Abraham, I see that. <laughs> Um, uh, that image of um, the teacher of the youth who, who, who would actually inculcate of, uh, you know, application. Yeah. That's something which I wanted that yeah. parasites can... Yes. So may, to... may I make a comment about procalcitonin? Yes, sir. Yeah, procalcitonin uh, is a very poor biomarker when it comes to diagnosis of bacterial sepsis. Uh, studies and meta-analysis have shown that the sensitivity and specificity is roughly around 70% only to distinguish bacterial sepsis from other causes of uh, multi-organ dysfunction or SIRS. So there's a meta-analysis. And uh, the current guidelines do not recommend procalcitonin either to make a diagnosis uh, and to distinguish whether it is a bacterial or a non-bacterial cause of sepsis and to decisions to start or not to start antibiotics. Maybe in somebody Absolutely. with fever and cough, uh, is it a bacterial pneumonia? Do you need antibiotics? It's a decent tool. And uh, probably the best use is, like Dr. Saldana said, if you have serial procalcitonin values in proven bacterial sepsis and it's coming down and patient is doing well otherwise, a good tool to augment decisions about de-escalation of antibiotic therapy. Thanks. Absolutely. Dr. So, Mayer, you want to ask certain things? No, sir. Dr. Mayer? I think that's it. Sir, just wanted to say that procalcitonin is a negative predictive uh, factor may be useful. And as far as Dr. Namita, you know, the, the, the change in the flora, I just read that within the first six hours of a person being admitted in the ICU, the yes. bowel flora uh, takes a huge, huge change. So it is not just the hypovolemia and the, you know, the shift of the gram-negative bugs into the bloodstream which is causing it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's just very, very uh, nascent knowledge. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, but you know, once it changes, then it can very rapidly change again. So, I mean... I don't know about that. that if we, like Raman said, it's a very small time that we have. So yeah. uh, I don't know in that small time if we can really, you know, rapidly make changes in the flora and then hope to have a... I have a small query and it's a very basic query and I, maybe Sir Dr. Abraham can answer or maybe any of you. You know, when we say that culture, neg culture positive is only 42% of sepsis, are we understanding and are we taking the blood cultures properly? Are we doing it properly? Because is, is, is there somewhere that we are doing something which is incorrectly causing the yield to become less? Can we improve upon it? Because, you know, we really don't emphasize enough on how we should, how much blood we should take, how much, uh, how we should take it, from where we should take it. And uh, maybe that is also pushing the yield down a little bit. Is adequate blood being taken for blood cultures? So we face this issue, especially in the pediatric institute, especially from NICU. Uh, we actually uh, try to adopt something which uh, someone senior, Dr. Chug had come once, visited our department, and he suggested that uh, we can have a simple uh, comparison of the height of the uh, 
of the fluid in the bottle yes just comparing the height of the fluid in the bottle will give us a an idea whether we've actually got enough blood sample or not mm. in that bottle correct correct uh, which is very difficult to uh, in children practice, especially yeah, especially in niku and especially in small uh, age group pediatric yeah. patient yeah yeah which is which which brings uh, us back uh, to our clinical uh, acumen again uh sir dr uchi abram sir what what has been uh, your this thing on uh, you seeing cases with must have seen cases with pneumocystis uh pure pneumocystis and leading to uh, a sirs of sepsis in fact a sepsis situation so uh, what has been the management in such cases uh pcp uh mostly in severely immunocompromised uh, in our setting mostly pure hiv but uh, others on hydrogen immunosuppression also uh, it presents as a respiratory failure uh, in pure hiv it's a very subacute onset in non hiv it can be very rapid and they have bilateral diffuse uh, infiltrates and severe hypoxemia multi organ failure uh, extremely unusual maybe patients have had uh, blood culture i would like to emphasize uh, three things number one sending adequate volume uh, we hear it all the time from our colleague balaji especially second is that start yes, uh, sending blood cultures before you start antibiotics and third is uh, stringent asset precautions while drawing blood culture uh, uh, even in a patient uh, who uh, the urgency to start broad spectrum antibiotics Uh, that is if the patient is in shock or has an infection like meningitis or necrotizing fasciitis even then uh, you have time to draw two blood cultures before you give the first dose of antibiotics so so adequate volume before you give the first dose of antibiotics and uh, to avoid contamination stringent aseptic precautions while you drawing blood cultures excellent sir thank you thank you uh, so, uh... so this will take a prolonged situation so dr sumi i will yes sir. Um, well, this is very interesting in fact i would keep on continuing for next two hours or something yeah. but uh, dr rita has been waiting for quite some time so dr sumi just a quick one from this thing so that we can yes. put the essence of the whole day uh, yes. together so we can keep going on and on but i would like to thank all of you and uh, in fact with the flow of the things we forgot to introduce uh, our interceptors and diverters so just 2 uh, minutes i think we'll just uh, introduce the people we have been uh, talking with and discussing with so we had dr amit kumar mandal sir is currently director pulmonology sleep and critical care at fortis hospital mohali and uh, sir is co author of national guidelines for infection prevention and control in healthcare facilities ministry of health and family welfare government of india he has had various papers in national and international journals sir is also a principal investigator in respiratory medicine as a part of phase 3 multicentric international drug trials and he has been a teacher and also uh, various uh, research projects etc dr meher i am very very happy to introduce her again she is my batchmate and uh, i am proud that she is uh, doing so well Uh, she is currently associate professor department of microbiology and immunology sultan kabus university muskat oman she is ambassador of oman for american society of microbiology she is pi of large multicentric 63 center international study which is on dash to protect antibiotics she is international ambassador for society for healthcare epidemiology for america she has published a lot of research papers in reputed journals and few handbooks and book chapters she is also recipient of dst grant for young scientists and several large uh, trc grants uh, we have uh, of course then dr raman dr raman needs no introduction but sir is currently professor adjunct aherf clinical microbiology and infection control apollo hospitals new delhi sir is also honorary secretary pc india sir is member of advisory committee and core expert group amr program of government of india and national action plan 2.0 2022 sir is member expert covid 19 public private partnership group under ministry of health and family welfare 
Neeti Ayo. So me, I think we can proceed on with the Dr. Richa. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sir is very humble and <laughs> he... Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Richa Mishra. She is additional professor, Department of Microbiology. At uh, she is currently at SGPJ. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. SGPJ IMS Lucknow. Okay. So she is currently at SGPJ IMS uh, Lucknow, and she is also the Infection Control Officer and uh, President of the EC Lucknow chapter there. She has been awarded uh, a poster prize at Sitzcon. 2022 recently. Uh, over to Dr. Richa, please. Ma'am, thank you so much. And uh, first of all, I'll just take about two, three minutes, sir. I'm feeling so tiny and so humbled in front of all of you that I really don't know how to proceed or summarize. Uh, it is really, sir, it has been a great, amazing experience. My deep regards to the whole Hissi family. And I'm deeply indebted to you for giving me the opportunity for summarizing the talk in the hand. So thank you to you and all your team. You, we have got tremendous energy, which is absolutely infectious. That is why I'm saying, sir, that it is, I'm, I mean, it is a very humbling experience for me at this stage. And as was said in the beginning, it is a unique concept which you have initiated. And uh, we have been for decades discussing on bacterial sepsis and how it is defined as organ dysfunction. No one, uh, at least, uh, sir, in my knowledge, we have not gone into the detailed etiology of non-bacterial sepsis. So, of course, it was a very unique uh, concept. Uh, I'll just quickly summarize the whole day today. Dr. Sumi, as professor and head of PGICH, she initiated this whole academic feast. And the whole uh, day was divided into four sessions. The first was on fungal sepsis. The second was on viral sepsis. The third on parasitic sepsis, which is largely unrecognized. And as you told that um, uh, trypanosoma was an unusual case uh, in which uh, uh, all of you got together and uh, decided the course of action in the uh, patient. And session four was devoted to hand hygiene um, uh, antimicrobials in OTT, biomedical waste generation by Dr. Malini. Fungal sepsis was beautifully dealt with by Dr. Shiva Prakash and um, Dr. Rajiv Suman. Dr. Rajiv Suman, sir, uh, very succinctly and very nicely summarized the use of all the antifungal agents. Uh, Dr. Ekta and Dr. Vini um, uh, went into the details of the viral sepsis. Dr. Aruna Pujari. Uh, very nicely, you know, highlighted the cases of strombolitis and Dr. Sudha from uh, your hospital only highlighted the uh, very nice cases and how the teamwork was, you know, managed to save uh, several uh, patients. Uh, sir, I'll not take a lot of time because I know that uh, it is quite late. I would uh, just once again thank all of you for taking out time. It has really been a very, very amazing talk. And sir, thank you so much. Thank you. रिचा जी एक एक रिकॉर्ड करके भेज दीजिए कि इसको अलग से सर सर सारा लिख लिया हाँ कर देती हूँ सर कर दूँ सारा समराइज कर दूँ हाँ रिकॉर्डेड आई विल आस्क राजी दिस रोहित जी ही विल बी इन टच विद यू सो दे कैन रिकॉर्ड योर दिस लास्ट वन हाँ शो सर इफ यू वांट मी टू गो इनटू द डिटेल सर आई so yes, they sir. will they will coordinate with you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Richa. Thanks sir, a lot, thank sir. You so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Uchi Abram and uh, Dr. Sumi, yes, um, yes, Dr. Mayer, uh, Sister Manju, Dr. Jatin, uh, Dr. Um, Vini. I I see you back again, uh, Dr. Hannah, and uh, everyone. In fact, the faculty was excellent as usual. They 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 get into the crux of what is required and um, you know deliver it much more than uh, what is anticipated uh, every time so thank you everyone and uh, you actually easy is what because of the faculty which supports it uh, in its uh, academic programs thank you so much thank you and we had some good this thing from if you look at up north from um, Srinagar uh, to Valor. So uh, you can say the country was well represented and we had somebody from Kolkata and somebody from Mumbai. So covered up. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Roman. Thank you very much. Namaste. Have a great day. Namaste. Namaste. We'll meet again. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, and good evening to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Richa, good to see you there. Ah, thank you, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> How are you? It's a pleasure. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm so good, ma'am. I'm good. Well. So take care of yourself, all the family. Oh, oh, ma'am, very nice. The girls have grown up. I've got two daughters. I think same as okay. you. Okay. Okay. No, no. I have a son and a daughter. 